So um, I think we'll go ahead and uh, uh, begin the Fairfax Town Council meeting. This is a regular Fairfax Town Council meeting on August 5th. 2020 and it's also um, the special meeting for the Fairfax Financing Authority. Um, as you all know we are convening via video conference so we're all still remote um, and uh, there are multiple 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 ways that you can connect with us tonight. Um, if you go to our website it will um, inform you of the different ways that this meeting is being broadcast um, and if you are screening on um, CMCM, which is Community Media Center of Marin, channel 27, or AT&T channel 99, um, you can go ahead and use the call-in option. And that call-in option, I'm just going to call out that phone number. We'll post it again a little bit later in case you don't get to write it down. Uh, the call-in number is one 669 9128. Um, and then you go ahead and you press mm -hmm. star 67 before dialing and that will hide your phone number. Um, if you're using Zoom, you're going to select the raise hand icon during the public comment time and you'll be added to the queue and you'll be unmuted when it's your turn. Um, if you're calling in, press star nine during the public comment time and you'll be added to the queue in the same way. Um, so I would like to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. Um, tonight, we are going to uh, begin the meeting uh, with a protocol that council member Hellman brought forward. And I believe it's a culturally sensitive and very important thing to do. Um, and it is a land acknowledgement. Um, I would like to welcome, if, if you are here, I'd like to welcome Lucina Vidari from the Coast Miwok tribe. And um, we send you a, a welcome. We're glad you're here as we initiate this new protocol. And the protocol goes like this. This is our land acknowledgement. The Fairfax Town Council acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors past, present and emerging. And with that, um, I'd like to ask uh, the town clerk if you'll go ahead and uh, do a roll call for us. Certainly, Madam Mayor. Council Member Kohler? Here. Council Member Reed? Here. Council Member Hellman? Here. Vice Mayor Ackerman? Here. And Mayor Goddard? I am indeed here. Thank you and very much. Would, would um, you like me to, to say who's here from staff too? And oh, would you please? Yes, thanks. Um, Town Manager Garrett Toy is here. Finance Director Michael Vivret. And we also have uh, two uh, members from, I guess it's Fire Safe Marin, Todd Lando and Michael St. John. Welcome. And yeah. Chief of Police Morin. Thank you. And our town attorney, Janet Colson. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So we have a, a big field here tonight. Um, I would like to start the meeting. Um, with the words of John Lewis. Um, John Lewis passed away on July 17th, as most of us know. Um, and these are his words. Freedom is not a state. It is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. In Obama's eulogy, he recounted telling John Lewis the last time he saw him that he could see men and women, young and old, straight Americans and LGBTQ Americans, blacks who long for equal treatment and whites who can no longer accept freedom for themselves while witnessing the subjugation of their fellow Americans. He said, 
that he sees in people that they are trying to be better, truer versions of themselves. And that's what John Lewis taught us. That's where real courage comes from, not from turning on each other, but by turning towards one another, not by sowing hate and division, but by spreading love and truth, not by avoiding our responsibilities to create a better America and a better world, but by embracing those responsibilities with joy and perseverance. And I just wanted to uh, dedicate and frame our meeting tonight to those words and those concepts. And I ask that we all bring our very best and truest selves to the meeting tonight. We have a lot to cover. So I look forward to a very active and interactive meeting tonight. And uh, with no further ado, the meeting protocol states that the mayor shall maintain order at the oh, meetings. Uh, Madam Mayor. Oops. Um, I, 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 proof I, will... forgot. I forgot it. Uh, so yeah. Rewind. Uh, we need to do the approval of the agenda and the affidavit of posting. Uh, so Garrett, could you give us a brief uh, recount of what's happening with two of the items on tonight's agenda? So Madam Mayor, members of the council, we are, oh, sorry. If you could hear the vacuum, it's because the janitor's here. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, yes, so for the agenda, we're actually recommending that the Fairfax Financing Authority special meeting, that's item 14 on your agenda, and the town council item, item 15, both dealing with the refinancing of our pension obligations, that those items actually be continued to a special council and Fairfax financing authority meeting on August 19th. So we're proposing pull it from the agenda, and then we'll reschedule it for special meetings on August 19th. And so I do apologize, uh, each individual body, the financing authority and the council, each needs to agree to that. Okay. Um, so did anyone else want to rearrange the agenda in any way tonight? Okay, seeing no one, let's go ahead and we'll first take a roll call vote of uh, the finance authority um, around the continuation of item 14. Uh, can we have that roll call? Would you need a motion for that? I don't think Garrett makes the motion. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Would anyone like to make a motion? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we remove item 15. Okay, this is for the Fairfax Finance Authority. I it's believe 14. it's, it's uh, item 14. 14, okay. So for item 14, the Fairfax Financing Authority special meeting, I'd like to make a motion that we continue that until August 19th. Okay, is there a second? I, whoops. I need, I was just checking my calendar, honestly. Can we just, <laughs> are we saying that would be like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. on the 19th? So I'm gonna, is that what we're saying? Uh, yes. I think at this point we're still at 7 p.m., but we could decide to do six. There would work for me. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Okay, so um, would we like to propose that it uh, be a six o'clock meeting? So I'll take that friendly amendment, and I think we'll need a second of that motion, please. I will second that. Okay, are we including the 6 p.m. convening? I took the friendly amendment, so yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so we have a motion, Kohler, and second read. I'll go ahead and do the roll call. Council Member Hellman? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Is this the finance Fairfax Financing yes, Authority? Yes, Michelle, yeah. it's the Fairfax Financing Authority so, item 14 yes. to move it to the 19th and starting at 6 p.m. I understand, but if you're voting as fi Fairfax Financing Committee members, that's my question. Yeah, I think they are. So it would be the mayor's okay. chair, yes. the vice yes. mayor's, that's the vice chair. Going. So yes, so it would be you're the board of directors. So it'd be when you do the roll call, like director or board member, Cole or that kind of stuff. Okay. So, so Michelle, you like you, me to you do, it? do it. 
Would you like me to do it? Yes, please. Okay, I will take a roll call vote of the Fairfax Financing Authority to schedule a special meeting on the 19th to, to, with item number 14, continue to that time. Uh, board member Hellman. Aye. Board member Reed. Yes. Board member Kohler. Yes, just with remember we're starting at six. Thank you. At 6 p.m., yes, I have that. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Ackerman. Yes. And Chair Goddard. Yes, aye. That's all ayes. Thank you. Okay, so we would need a motion for the uh, continuation of item number 15. Uh, this is of the town council as the town council. I will move continuation of item number 15 to also that uh, special meeting right on the 19th, correct? Beginning at 6 p.m. I second the motion. Okay, so we have uh, a motion. Okay, uh, Michelle, would you do this one also? Yes, Madam Mayor. So we have a Motion read, second Hellman, and uh, Council Member Kohler. Aye. Council Member Hellman. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Vice Mayor Ackerman. Aye. And Mayor Goddard. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And I do apologize for uh, the complicated <laughs> nature of that transaction. Um, I'll go ahead and read the meeting protocol, which is that the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Uh, mayor, just with your um, permission, I. I think we made those motions, but I'm not sure that we made a motion to approve the agenda and affidavit of posting. Just with your permission, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, absolutely. Um, I think that's true. Let me go ahead and finish the protocol and then let's go ahead and make sure we're on track. I appreciate all the help. So the town council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Uh, any matter that we haven't started by 1130 will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend the rule. Um, and let's go back and I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda and affidavit of posting. Anyone? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, so we have a motion, uh, Beckerman and a second read. Um, and uh, let's do the roll call. Council Member Hellman. Aye. Council Member Kohler. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Uh, Vice Mayor Ackerman. Aye. And myself. Aye. Uh, thank you very much. So um, a couple of announcements and I'll move this forward because I know we have a lot to do. The town website is now available um, in 108 languages. And I checked them out. I know a couple of languages and it's pretty darn good. So thank you, Michelle, for getting that going. Um, to select your preferred language, you simply click on the globe icon in the green bar found on uh, every uh, page of the website. Uh, we have some vacancies on boards and commissions. Applications are available at Town Hall and on the town website. Uh, you can always contact our town clerk. Um, at or you know or visit the website uh, to get those forms. Uh, we do have three vacancies on the Climate Action Committee, uh, one vacancy on Park and Rec, one vacancy on the Open Space Committee, uh, one vacancy on the Tree Advisory Committee, and uh, we have just closed the application period for the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee but we're accepting, we were accepting applications until 5 p.m. this um, afternoon. Uh, to remind everyone, the Fairfax Food Pantry continues to operate. 
uh, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. every Saturday morning at the Fairfax Community Church, 2398 Sir Francis Drake. Um, and I would like to remind everyone actually to let everybody know that we still have the mobile shower, uh, which is uh, located also at the Fairfax Community Church every Saturday morning between nine and noon. Uh, please uh, avail yourself of a shower should you uh, need or want to have a shower. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone that you should uh, go ahead and sign up for our newsletters and updates uh, so that you'll receive those things and agendas for the Planning Commission and the Town Council by uh, going to the Town of Fairfax website and clicking subscribe. Okay, so we're moving on to open time for public expression. Um, just so that you all know, uh, we're using the same protocols, three minutes for uh, individuals, and you can have five if you're representing a group. Please be mindful that there are a lot of new groups forming, so uh, we, we, we would love to have you be expeditious in your, in your statements. Um, and you may speak of anything that is not on uh, the agenda for this evening. Uh, and yes, let's go ahead and, uh, and open it to public comment, to open time. Okay. I, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll read the names of the first three people. Okay. So that you know when your time is coming up, if that's okay. So first will be JR, followed by Jody Timms, and then Tuna Fish Salen. So JR. Go. Good evening. Thank you for uh, taking me on see this. Can, you. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to speak about the graffiti downtown. Um, I feel very strongly that illegal activity should not be tolerated regardless of who is doing it or how just the cause. It puts the police in a very difficult position. If they were to enforce the law, that would not go down well. And in my opinion, if it's, if it's against the law for somebody, then it's against the law for everybody. If it's not against the law for somebody, then it's nothing, nothing's against the law for anybody, at least that aspect of defacing public property. What I would like to suggest instead is use the art space in the parquet or maybe create another art space and have people be able to express themselves legally in an art form, perhaps even set up a space for a musical performance or a poetry competition or a dance performance, anything, paintings, photography, use the creative spirit that this town has to go after a problem in a, in a, a positive way instead of a destructive negative way, something that everybody could get behind because not everybody is behind graffiti defacing our town, but it's not the graffiti that bothers me so much. It's that it's okay for somebody to do it, but it wouldn't be okay for somebody else to do it just because it's a righteous cause. That is simply not, pardon me, but the American way. I don't think it's, it's not fair. It's not cool. And I really, I really object to the difficult position it puts the police in. They can't in good faith carry out their, their duty. It's like we as a town are being held hostage by whomever is doing this. So perhaps invite them to step forward, erase it, paint it out, get rid of it, and then create something positive as an art form in whatever medium they want. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Jane. Okay, um, next speaker. And Garrett, can I remind you to use the timer, please? Yes. Okay, the next town clerk, <laughs> town clerk already reminded me. Yes. Okay, great. Um, the next speaker is Jody Timms. You're on. Good evening, council members and mayor. Uh, Jody Timms, Cascade Drive, and your town representative to the Commission on Aging. Just a quick report for you. The Commission on Aging itself is on break this month, so no meeting, but the age-friendly Fairfax task force has been busy. Um, working with Age Friendly Marin, we do have a forum coming up on August 26th. I want to be sure folks know about it. it's called Staying Safe in the World of Scams. 
There are a number of really bad scams out there that none of us want to be caught in, but particularly those folks who are more vulnerable or older. Um, that will be held on August 26 at 1030 a.m. And if you're interested in attending, you can check the town's website. But basically, you want to go uh, send an email to agefriendlycordomadera at gmail.com and let them know you'd like to attend and they'll send you a Zoom link for that event. Also, our Breakfast with Friends will happen August 19th, Wednesday morning at 1030. So join us for an hour if you're wanting some social time and wanting to chat and um, we'll be there. Also, the smartphone classes that we held last month are continuing in August and September for both iPhone and Android. So you can take a look at that on the website. I just want to mention that the task force is in a is currently involved with three different processes. We're wrapping up last year. We're getting ready for our next five year cycle. So we hope to have a progress report of what we did accomplish in the last five years and come before you um, in uh, October or November with that report from Age Friendly Fairfax. In the meantime, for this year, we've set a number of goals that we're going to continue while we begin the next five-year cycle of gathering information and feedback on what folks would like to see us do to make Fairfax more age-friendly. And I just want to mention one or two of the goals that we're going to be working on over this next year. Um, first of all, as some, as some of you know, we've been advocating to build um, out the neighborhood response groups and to support that. And again, I want to thank the council for funding the position to put someone in place part time. Looks like that person's almost ready to go. Um, so we're really excited about that. There was a meeting yesterday, too, of all the NRGs in Marin, which was really exciting. Another um, year you spoke tonight or, or we'll be talking further about the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee. One of our goals would be to stay connected closely with that group um, over the next several months so that we can advocate for aging uh, as an equity lens, um, as well as all the other ones that are so very important for us. So I think that's uh, as much as I want to say tonight. Thank you very much for um, all that you're doing for our town and for our older adults. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Jody. Right back at you. Uh, okay. Next speaker, please. Uh, the next three are, will be in this order: Tuna Fish Salen, Stephen Keys, and Naomi Alessandra Schultz. So, Mr. Tuna Fish. <laughs> Good evening, Council. How is everybody? Good. How are you, Sierra? It's been beautiful days lately. The air has been great. Um, you know, I think it's great that the council or the website is now in like, you know, 150 languages or whatever. It's like, I just hope that's not, not just another 99 languages we can misunderstand each other and fight over stuff with, um, as we want to do. I noticed that there's a, there's been a lot of discussion over Sir Francis Drake and a lot of tempers over changing names and taking down statues and such. And, um, there's plenty of room for misunderstandings and whatnot. Um, I just like to say to that, it's like, you know, maybe we can like take a breath and not react. Um, don't dismiss and jump all over whoever we don't agree with in the instance. And also kind of realize that the more mobbish we get, we're just as bad as anything else that we're professing that we don't like. And that underneath all of it, is actually the commons of nature, which we all forget and dismiss with whatever cause we're jumping all over. Um, and just maybe we should put more attention to that because if we don't take care of that, none of the rest of it's gonna matter at all. Um, and I'd also like to say, if, you know, if people could maybe wave a bit more downtown rather than honking, it's like noise is a form of pollution and it is rather jarring as much as you wanna support something it carries for blocks and all the way up into the hills every time a car honks down in front of the roasters. Um, just saying, it's like we can support a cause, but we don't necessarily have to cause other grief. Um, and I also wanted to say that lost an old friend and a community member recently, Joseph Odom, who died a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he was a good guy. He was pretty involved in politics and we're all next. So, 
you know, might be today, might be tomorrow, might be next week, which goes back to, it's like, you know, don't react so much and fight with your neighbors and people that we should be having community with rather than just divide and conquer, or divide and fight. Um, is there a way that we can quit fighting and, you know, be a little careful because we don't always get another chance to make things right or say something again or redo something. Um, so do what we can and try and also take ourselves with a grain of salt because we're all kind of full of it. Um, I know I am. Um, anyway, have a good evening, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it, Sarah. Next speaker, please. The uh, next speaker is Stephen Keyes. Oh, he just disappeared. Ooh. Stephen? Okay. I'm going to move on to um, Naomi Schultz. Hello? We can hear you. Naomi, can you hear us? Hmm. Hmm. I see that you're unmuted on my end. Is your microphone working on your device? Uh, it, you've just muted yourself. Now you should be unmuted. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Hi, so sorry about that. My audio was not working. I had to re-sign in. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Mayor Goddard, for the beautiful land acknowledgement and also for your acknowledgement of the life of John Lewis. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, also, I'm really excited to hear that the website's been translated into 108 languages. That's just such a wonderful step and much appreciated in, in light of um, the racial equity goals that we're working toward. Language is such an important part of that. Um, I also wanted to speak to what uh, Jody mentioned about aging and looking at equity through an aging lens and wanted to um, acknowledge that as well. I think that's a, that's a great idea and a really important um, thing to take account of. So thanks for that. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to um, speak to JR's concerns about um, the chalk art downtown. Um, and just wanted to say a few things about the characterization of it as being graffiti or defacing or somehow holding the town hostage or the police hostage. And uh, I, I just feel like that's an unfair characterization in that it is chalk art from as, as far as I am aware. Um, and chalk art has been, you know, put outside of the police department on occasion and they, they you know, thank you notes to first responders in chalk art on previous occasions and the police department has gone ahead and put those up on their Instagram account. So I don't think the police are should be too troubled or feel like they're being held hostage by chalk art in our town. Um, so that's all I wanted to mention. I, I and, and to the to your point, Jr. about you know building beautiful art downtown. I'm all for that. I think that's a great idea. But it's just important to be aware that one person's graffiti is another person's art. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, next, I see Stephen Keyes is back, so I'm going to go to him next, uh, followed by Jessica Green and then Julia Ledyard. So Stephen. Okay, it's not Stephen, it's <laughs> Pam Mix. Hi, Pam. Hi. Um, I just want to talk about gratitude and feeling really good about the volunteers in town. Um, pretty heartfelt what happened recently with um, uh, Alayla uh, DeMello and her amazing 100 masks and she wants to make more and Chance helped her cut them because she had a disability and 
it's just like the store opened up and how the masks were distributed in other places in town. People were very accepting. And so I just wanted to say it's a really nice feeling to be part of the Fairfax Coronavirus Task Force, which is this is part of our work, but also the really amazing connection and getting people that, you know, that just really want to help out. So that that's sort of it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Jessica Green, followed by Julia Ledger and then Ricky A. Jessica, Hello. you're muted. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I was I was listening to someone talk about you know doing another art area downtown. And I noticed that the people who were put in charge of the last art area have, don't have any art background. You have a carpenter, a uh, piece man, and some woman. Uh, they don't have any art background, and yet they're in charge of uh, art of the town. Um, and there have been some ugly things put out there. And then you have other people who, like myself, have an art credential. There's lots of you know, real artists here. And it seems like if you're going to put art in the town, you need to think more of someone that's going to choose it for the town or have a vote or something, you know, because um, anybody could put anything down there and call it art. And I think that with all the artists in town that, um, that we should be picking a carpenter or somebody that doesn't have, you know, any art background to choose it. That's, that's what I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Mayor, I just want to mention uh, it's the Park Commission which makes the decision, and we have one opening on Park. So it would be wonderful if an artist would participate or apply to participate. Okay. Um, next speaker, please. Next is Julia Ledyard, followed by Richard. Hello. Thank Hi, Julia. You. Hi. Thank you all, council, for being there and here to listen to us all. Um, it sounds like uh, since you're closing the applications for the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee, I hope that means you got a lot of um, fantastic applicants, um, which is very exciting for our town. And I was thinking, um, you know, while we are waiting for that to get together and start, um, perhaps we could reach our hands and hearts out to our neighbors in Marin City, uh, where most of our people of color live or a large portion of them live. Um, their home, Golden Gate Village, is um, in dire straits and in um, could be um, torn down or rebuilt by, um, forgive me if I'm getting all the facts wrong, but you get my gist, <laughs> like, uh, bringing in a private development company. And I think it would be wonderful if our town, um, as part of our trying to dismantle white supremacy, um, to possibly write a resolution in support of the residents of Golden Gate Village, they're our neighbors, um, and in support of their plan to rebuild and repair their home, which they love. Um, so I just wanted to know if that would be a possibility for the town to write a resolution in support of them and also to announce that there is a, a very important press conference tomorrow at 1 p.m. And I urge anyone interested to go and listen. Um, you can find the way to call in on Save Golden Gate Village on Facebook or you can go to Golden Gate it's ggrresidentcouncil.org to read about Golden Gate Village um, and read about the uh, residents there and their council who are trying to save their home. So um, I think that would be a great start um, to our racial work in Fairfax. And um, thank you all again so much. Thank you for the suggestion, Julia. Um, Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Richard Applebaum. Richard here, 61 Woodland. Um, 
I would like to uh, echo some of the comments that um, Naomi made earlier. Um, first of all, thank you to the mayor for the, um, the John Lewis quote. Um, that was very timely and the acknowledgement about the land. Uh, I have similar reaction as Naomi to uh, Jane's comments about what she was characterizing as graffiti. To me, it's not graffiti. It's a, we're in a complex moment in history and it's protest. Um, uh, it's, it's a form of protest and um, here we are forming a racial equity and social justice committee and, um, uh, and Sierra's comments about the horn were also inappropriate. I mean, we're, we're at a key moment now and I'm sorry that it's uncomfortable for some people and maybe everyone is not feeling the same about these issues, but um, it's a time where we have to be a little bit uncomfortable. And, um, and so I think it's absolutely appropriate. And the fact that it's chalk art, not permanent paint, um, I, I don't think it's fair to characterize it as graffiti. This is not gangs or teenagers that are tagging things. Um, and uh, I'm all for public art. I'd love to see more public art near the ball field and all of our parks, uh, the parkade everywhere. Um, I understand Jessica's sensitivity about um, who gets to sort of adjudicate what, what is the appropriate art for the town. And that's, we can have that conversation in some other context another day. We all have subjective opinions, but um, uh, lot, lots of public art, I'm all for it. Uh, but uh, the, the chalk art that's down there now is really about, about protests, it's about this moment. And there are people that are coming out there every night trying to keep this, um, uh, to keep this issue active in people's consciousness, and the the bump, the beeping of the horn is 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 citing that and bring bringing that to prominence. Uh, it's not it's not a noise pollution issue. So um, I just wanted to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, do we have anyone else waiting to speak, Michelle? Uh, yes, we have uh, two more people. One is Dee Lee. Uh, and one is uh, next after that will be Elias Karkabi. Okay. So, um, oh, that's Deborah, I believe. Deborah? Yes. Hi. 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 Deborah Hi. Benson, Cascade Drive. Um, I would like to speak about the, uh, the striping on Cascade Drive. I asked at the last regular council meeting for the issue to be put on this month's agenda. It is not. Um, we were told when this was foisted upon us with no notice um, that we would try it out for three months and then maybe four. We were promised at a neighborhood meeting where uh, council member Hellman, council member Reed and town manager Toy uh, attended that there was going to be a survey and the, we would try this for six months. It's been there for nine months um, the whole project was done without public input, started in September of 2016 uh, by three people, uh, Mayor Goddard, Council Member Reed, and uh, Town Manager Toy. Uh, even the police chief wasn't consulted to, uh, to uh, give his opinion on the project, and he's in, in uh, charge of traffic enforcement and safety in our town. Um, he was consulted after the fact, and he did say, and I quote, um, I suppose, however, with the newly created one lane roadway, even though there is a still the same amount of space, during an evacuation of any sort, people would be driving in the lane and in heavy traffic flow, people would be in each other's way as they drive within the marked lane. Um, it's dangerous, it feels dangerous. People are walking in the fog line section with earbuds. They're not even turning around to see if a car is coming too close to them and, and to get a, you know, away from them safely in this marked uh, right of way around a curve. I'm terrified every day that there is going to be a head on. Um, I also take issue with the fact that in uh, March of 2019, Town Manager Toy hired a former fellow employee uh, from the city of Morgan Hill to be project manager for this project as well as other projects. Uh, Mr. Bjarke uh, hails from Auburn, which is 358 miles away. He charges mileage on his invoices. His rate is $125 an hour for uh, 10 hours on one that I saw. And I'm wondering if um, some of that uh, two to a four hour round trip is being charged to us at $125 an hour. Please listen to the people, 66% of the people in, 
answering the survey, want our street returned to the safe street that it once was. Please listen to us. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment in response, um, Deborah. Uh, just so you know, I appreciate you bringing it. Um, we will be uh, doing some extra promotion of the survey itself as time has passed, as you pointed out, uh, so that we can get people to respond uh, according to their, their current experience of it after time. Uh, we will bring that item back on September 2nd after we've had a chance to re, as I said, promote this survey so we can get more current data. I will come back and thank you for your patience. Um, Does that mean survey responders will be able to take the survey more than once or are you? Um, we need to figure, we, we need to figure that out or whether we do that or we, Garrett, do you have a suggestion on that? I know this isn't an item, but I think it's really important that we get some data, um, more current data. If you registered for the survey and you took it, you can't vote again. Okay. If you didn't register, you theoretically can vote as many times as you like because there's that falls into the other category of your responses. But we could, I don't, I think what we're asking is, I don't know the benefit of redoing the survey for everyone to fill out again. Um, I think asking people to fill out who haven't seems to make sense. Um, but that's really not a topic for discussion this evening. Right. Okay. So something, something will come back on September 2nd. Uh, and we'll see how far we're able to get. And we'll get some public input on that. Okay. But there will be an item on the agenda. Uh, Okay. But I would like that to be captured for the record, please, that we will have it on the agenda for the next council meeting. Thank you. Okay, you got it. Um, next speaker, please. Uh, the next speaker is Elias Karkabi, followed by Elizabeth P. and then Mike, Mike Garingelli. Hi, good evening. Um, first, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Mayor Goddard for her land acknowledgement and the statement regarding the death of John Lewis. Um, I also want to bring up, well, I want to start by bringing up an issue about uh, transparency during these meetings. Um, if we were not in, uh, in a COVID situation, in a pandemic situation, we would be able to see our fellow attendees um, and applaud for them and they would know whether we supported them or not. We would know how many people were joining the session from the public. As it stands right now, I'm looking at the screen. I can see everybody on the board, all the invited speakers, but I can't see my fellow members of the public. Um, this is something that I'm deeply concerned about. Uh, I, I don't think it's an understatement to say that this is uh, a problem that is Orwellian in nature. Um, if we all remember, George Orwell's 1984, um, what was holding people's power was the fact that they felt isolated from one another and could not see each other's support for them. Um, we can hear our fellows, but we don't know who they are. We can't see their faces. We can't applaud for them. This is a serious problem and I think it needs to be taken into account. Um, my next comment regards the so-called graffiti downtown. Um, first of all, the, the term graffiti to describe something that is an absolutely necessary protest that should be going on right now, I, I think is misguided at best. And I hope the people who have made those comments really take the time to reconsider um, what they're saying when they call um, statements for Black Lives Matter graffiti. With regard to it putting the police in an awkward position because it's somebody breaking the law and the police you know, are, are mandated to enforce the law. That statement just doesn't take into account the full picture of the policeman's job or policewoman's job. The police are constantly having to choose whether to enforce one law or not. I mean, the way that uh, the traffic laws are written, almost anybody can be pulled over at any time. 
you know, almost everybody is in violation of one or more infractions at all times. The police constantly use their discretion on whether to arrest or whether to cite. I don't see why this should be any different. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Elias. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Elizabeth P, followed by Mike Garangelli and then Mark Bell. Hello, Mayor. Elizabeth. Hello, good evening. Hello. Hi, members. Um, this is a gentle reminder about the intersection at Sir Francis Drake and Pastore slash Willow. Um, it was suggested at two meetings ago that the police car with the automatic feedback uh, speed sign would be put in place to um, reduce some of the excessive speed that's going through there. And I just would urge, we need the 25 hour a mile, 25 hour mile per hour signs on the two blocks uh, north and south of that intersection desperately because people are blazing through there. I almost got nipped somebody the other day. I mean, it is just scary. And usually they're um, gesticulating um, rudely when I'm gesturing that they please slow down. It's really scary. And I know a lot of people in this neighborhood are scared to walk across that intersection. Um, so anything that you can do to mitigate that, I would really be grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Garrett, can we please make that happen? I, I, I don't often do this, but that, that, that is needs to happen. So I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Mike Garangelli. Yes. Hi there, council and mayor. How are you? Good. Thanks. Good. Um, you know, I wanted to reiterate my concern for the idea of defunding our police department. Um, as you know, it's on a uh, skeleton crew to begin with. Um, and I think it's uh, a, a misguided idea to defund the police department. Also, I think that the um, people who spoke about a year ago on um, taxing ourselves to support the fire, the police, and public works I think if you plan on, as a council, plan on changing anything with the police department, I think we need to go to um, some sort of a ballot, some sort of a, a vote of our, our, our people in the town and to see what they think as a whole and not leave it up to um, strictly the council. So what is your intention, Mayor, on the idea of defunding our police? Uh, Mike, so this isn't agendized, so... Um, okay, well, let me just uh, finish, off, finish off. Time. I'll finish off by saying that we have an exceptional police department, an exceptional chief, and an exceptional town. And once again, I will say that if, if there's any idea to defund our police department, that I think that it needs to be put on the ballot and it needs to be debated, not during the COVID time. I like that one gentleman, I agree with him. We're doing this uh, at the weakest moment of our history in a long time. We're all concerned about, and, and rightfully so, COVID, and we have a lot of other things that are coming at us. We need to slow it down and bring it to the people. I would almost suggest that this reconvenes when you're able to actually have meetings at the women's club again, because this is no way to conduct um, public meetings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Appreciate your input. Um, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Mark Bell. Good evening, can you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I want to go back to the July 1st meeting uh, on the wall property. There's a lot of uh, really interesting things that came out, especially when I rewatched that segment of it. Uh, for example, Renee, at four hours and 40 minutes into the meeting, 
you said that you don't feel that you need to be part of uh, the reviewing and analyzing of the firms, of the three firms that uh, apply to do the EIR. Uh, it's part of due diligence. And everyone on that council, supposedly, when they run, or, or in their speeches to run, talk about how they're there to protect uh, the ridge lines, to protect the integrity, to attract, uh, protect the hillsides. Uh, and so one would think that if you're doing due diligence, that you would be spending some time reviewing and analyzing who's going to do the EIR. My understanding is that the firm that got chosen is one of the largest in the state who does huge projects. It's kind of interesting that they're here in this little town of Fairfax. Uh, and then you go on about, well, you know, we have to trust our staff. Well, I mean, go back to Victory Village. There are supposed to be 18 acres of open space that were promised to the town in the meeting. What happened? Where's our 18 acres? They're gone. So you want to talk about trusting staff? Okay, well, how about our town attorney who uh, Garrett at uh, 308 into the meeting and our town attorney at 310 talk about how she's worked with uh, the person who's going to be overseeing the EIR for us. However, people raised comments after that that made it seem like it might be a conflict of interest. So there we are at, um, let's see, what was that time? At 4.21, uh, where Janet uh, Colson is swearing that she's never worked with these people after uh, about an hour before talking about how she's worked continuously or numerous times, excuse me, with the person who's going to be overseeing the EIR. You can't have both statements. One's true or the other's true. This is coming from the person who's supposed to be our town attorney. We pay her to be our town attorney. Wow, doesn't it make you wonder who actually is paying for what? I think that this needs to be re-voted on. You need to re re pull that back, bring it back out at another council meeting, and we need a new attorney who's not going to be double-talking within an hour plus of each other. If we're going to have an attorney, attorney should be have some integrity, and this is what this town deserves. I hear about transparency. Well, then where is the transparency in that? Yeah, you're going to tell me my time is over. Well, you know... My time is over, but I think it's time for a lot of people's time to be over. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, do we have any other public comment? Um, we do have one more. Okay. And that is Michael. Hello, Council. I hope Hi, you Michael. Have a nice evening. Um, the reason I want to chime in, again, this is on defunding the police department, which I think is a bad idea. I think that our department is probably close to be an example that maybe we could convince other communities to follow. But specifically something that Michael said, I understand that our police and public works and safety and fire are funded out of the general funds. Those are allocations set with whatever agreements you guys make. But if the general community votes to tax themselves additional money for a specific purpose, the council does not have the authority to redirect those funds. That would actually be a misappropriation of funds. So I hope that the council does want to act as this council and take that direction that they seek counsel from your council prior to. I mean, I truly encourage you to look at that because you can't misappropriate funds that are specific for a specific purpose. That's how they were advertised. That's how they were collected. That's how they're requested. They must be spent on that purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and next speaker, please. Um, we have the next three speakers are uh, West Asians for BIPOC Safety, Joe McGarry, and oh, that's it. 
Okay, so um, the West Asians for BIPOC safety, I can't see the rest of your name. Hi, good evening. Um, this is Elias Karkabi and I represent West Asians for BIPOC safety in Marin. Um, I would like to talk about the present need and um, for defunding the police and, and the historical legitimacy of that in Marin County. And I'd like to talk about that as a Fairfax resident. Um, at the age of 12, when I was uh, living in Fairfax on a, on a nice sunny Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, me and a, a friend of mine decided to go for a, for a walk in the Fairfax Creek um, off Pinoche Boulevard behind the movie theater. And we walked across the creek and um, we walked into what we thought was a field and we did a little exploring as, you know, 12 year olds like to do. Uh, we had our skateboards with us. And um, as it turned out, we were in the Marin Town and Country Club. We didn't know because there weren't any signs. There were no uh, keep out signs or no trespassing signs. There were no, uh, you know, working fences or barriers. Um, so we decided to look around and we looked around for about half an hour. And then all of a sudden we heard screaming and we couldn't understand what it was, except there was a man screaming at us. Well, that man turned out to be the owner of the Marin Town and Country Club. And he was screaming at us, calling us criminals, saying that he was going to call the police. He then took advantage of the amount of surprise that my friend and I were feeling to forcibly detain us, grab us, take us back to a empty house in the Marin Town and Country Club and keep us against our will. That's something I would call kidnapping, okay? Now, within about five minutes, a police officer showed up. Didn't say anything about his behavior. Didn't say anything about what he was doing that was illegal. Didn't say anything about the way he was traumatizing two 12 year olds, okay? And then the police officer went on to tell my friend and I that if we were ever found on this property again, we would be taken to juvenile hall. The owner of the town and country club at the time threatened us with $60,000 in fines for each of us, which he said would be the amount of money he was going to be forced to pay by his insurance because his insurance was gonna go up. Now, the policewoman stood there and allowed all of this to take place and then escorted us off the property. Um, excuse me, uh, you're at three minutes at this point. And so I, I, am, I am representing a group, so I do ask for the full time allotted for a group. Okay, go ahead and take two more minutes. Thank you. Okay, this is the kind of behavior that is sanctioned by the police department in Fairfax. The terrorism of our young children. And it's absolutely unacceptable. Now, I'm a person of mixed race, but I'm passing as white. And I know that if I had been visibly a person of color, I might not be here talking to you today. I might either, you know, have received not just a warning from the police, but actually, you know, some kind of misdemeanor or even a felony. And don't think because somebody is 12 years old, they can't get a felony. Okay, and those convictions go on people's records. They keep them from getting jobs. They destroy lives. And no one who I grew up with batted an eye when I told them that happened because it was, it was things that they were all familiar with. You know, this is, this is the state of policing in Fairfax. 
and it's not affecting everybody. So it is absolutely imperative that we call to defund the police. It's absolutely imperative. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any more speakers, Michelle? Yes, we have one more speaker. It is Ling Shin Bell. I, I've unmuted you. Yeah, hi. Um, um, okay, so um, first I wanted to echo what um, what Sierra was saying about the, the people honking in support of the Black Lives Matter, which of, of course is Black Lives Matter. But by doing that, I think they also need to think of the people who are hearing that, that honking. I mean, for, for like half an hour or, or more, you just hear all these cars honkings and it's just bad for everybody's nervous system. It's just not, it's also accomplishing that. So I think they need to think about that too. Because really, it, it's not helping that much the, the cause by honking your, your, your horn. It's just um, doing more dam damage than help. And another thing is um, the sirens of the police. It seems like there's been more and more sirens. Like s s there's a lot of sirens and I'm not sure if that's really needed or if there would be a way to have less sirens a little bit because that's another thing that's really bad for our nervous system as a whole for humans and dogs don't like it that much either, I don't think. So if there was any way to, to be a little considerate about the amount of sirens, that would be great. And the, the last thing is um, about the, the art, the public art in the town. Of course, it's, it's really nice, you know, and, and uh, the problem that it's very subjective as far as the art quality, like somebody might think it's very good, some other don't. But I think there's something that we could, like a criteria that we could use, and that is, does it clash with the background, the real trees, like the green that they choose, is it, going, is it clashing with the trees that you look at, the real trees? Because I find like a lot of times the murals are using colors that totally clash with the natural colors behind. And so the criteria could be, if it clashes, then don't use it. Find colors that are in harmony with the colors around, the real colors. And then you're more likely to have something that more people will like. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ling Shen. Sorry, my neighbor is howling. Um, so is that the last of our speakers? Yes, Madam Mayor, I do not see any more speakers. Okay, uh, so we're moving on to a very exciting moment in time. And I see the two gentlemen uh, waiting to deliver a presentation. Um, and I'm very excited to, uh, that we will be having a presentation from FireSafe Marin on the community-friendly evacuation maps. I think uh, Todd Lando and Michael St. John for being here. And I thank uh, Council Member Barbara Kohler and Council Member Reed for all the hard work that you both have done to make sure these happen. And it's come a little bit later, but Barbara pushed hard during her mayoral time to get these done. And I'm excited that we're gonna get to share them tonight. So, uh, gentlemen. Mayor, could I just say something? Absolutely. Um, briefly, uh, first of all, I wanna say, um, Thank you to Todd and Michael St. John. And Michael runs search and rescue for the county. As far as I know, he's not part of Fire Safe Marin. But Michael oh, yeah. is um, a retired firefighter that lived in Fairfax. And I recruited him last year to start helping us on emergency response and things like that. So it was my dream last year for community-friendly evacuation maps, and you as vice mayor at that time participated. Um, and first everybody said, no, we can't do that. And Todd found a way and worked with Michael and a contractor uh, to make this happen. And we will be kind of the standard for the rest of most of Marin. So with that, I'd like to thank both gentlemen for working so hard on this and also Council Member Reed, who seems to know every street in Paper Street in this town better than anyone, 
really helped us make sure that these maps really depict things correctly. So thank you and uh, um, thank you, Mayor, for your permission to speak. <laughs> sure. So we just have a short presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor uh, um, Barbara Kohler, for your leadership in that. Council Member Kohler. Um, you know, this is a collaborative effort. Uh, beyond Todd and I, the fire department was involved in it. Uh, the poli uh, Fairfax Police Chief was involved in it, along with uh, the council members already mentioned. Um, there's a lot of, you know, small details, uh, particularly uh, looking at community paths in Fairfax to make sure uh, which ones were going to be uh, best to support evacuation. Um, and then Todd Lando put a huge amount of effort into that. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Todd to just give the quick details about where these maps can be located and, and how people can access them. Great. Thanks, Mike. And, and thanks again to everybody else. Um, I'm going to try to keep this to just a few minutes because I, I know you have a full agenda tonight, but I, I'll, we'll, I'll show you the maps. And I'll just recap that the, these maps are based on uh, a set of evacuation maps that were first developed by FEMA for tsunami uh, evacuation. Um, we recognized when we first saw those maps that tsunami evacuation was essentially a wildfire evacuation in reverse. Um, we saw that the potential value for those, those maps to be adapted to wildfire evacuations and, and uh, Councilmember Kohler's right, this, this has now become a model for the entire county of Marin. Uh, the city of Nevada and San Rafael are, are about to launch their maps. Fairfax is first. Uh, you know, uh, Ross Valley, Kent, Kent Field, Central Marin Fire Department, and Southern Marin Fire will follow later this summer and fall. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here so you guys can see them, and I'll discuss wh where you can find the maps, what the rollout process might look like, and uh, how this works. And I just clicked on share screen, and it says the host needs to enable my ability to share a screen. Okay, this is Michelle, your host, <laughs> and I, I will say M Michelle asked me to come on uh, online early to practice this, and and I couldn't make it early, so it's my fault, not Michelle's. <laughs> I'm just not seeing that I uh, I don't know how I do that. It should just, be a little little blue box near my name. That, that there should be, and it says more. I'm. I think I'm just going to see about. It doesn't say anything about shared screen. That's the problem. So I'm going to make you a co-host. I'm going to try. I think we just did it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. All right. So I hope everybody right now sees sees an overview map. Uh, this, this, the mapping uh, uh, um, design process uh, based on those FEMA maps uh, has, has been named by the developer the Fire Clear Evacuation Map. It, it will use a, a process that's very similar to the, the uh, tsunami maps to help residents find the appropriate map for their neighborhood and, and uh, download the map to their electronic devices. The maps are designed primarily to be distributed electronically. We want people who have mobile devices, mobile phones, tablets, to try to use these maps um, on their mobile device. They're, each map is designed to be viewed electronically. They're also designed to be printed on paper, so they, they can be printed on paper for people who don't have access or, or who prefer paper. And uh, as I scroll through some some of the different maps, I'll, I'll explain to you how that process might look. This is what we're calling the citywide overview map. It's a map showing the entirety of the town of Fairfax, a little bit of the surrounding neighborhoods like Sleepy Hollow, San Anselmo, and Woodacre. Um, I, you can see the, the general color coding here. The orange areas are what we've identified as the, the highest fire hazard areas. It's really the, the wildland urban interface that the fire departments in the town has recognized for the last 20 years. Um, the, the white area down the center is the valley floor and that's where we want people to evacuate to initially during any type of wildfire. We want to see residents leave the wildland urban interface and get to the valley floor. It's the safest place for people to be. 
This overview map is intended to be printed in a, a large scale poster size. Uh, we envision that the city hall, the fire stations, uh, potentially other locations, community gathering locations in town might have a poster size copy of this available for people to look at. Alongside the citywide overview map will be a city citywide zone map. This is that map. This is a, a, a consolidated version of that overview map. It doesn't have all the detail. What this is intended to do is help you identify your neighborhood and the inset uh, high resolution zone map for your individual neighborhood. Fairfax is divided into nine zones. Um, these zones coincide with the fire department's uh, maps that have been in existence for about 15 years. They're called the, the fire agencies have called these the mutual threat zone maps. Since 2017, the fire departments have published uh, maps of each of these nine zones. For Fairfax, there, there are about uh, almost 100 zones in Marin County. Um, each of these nine zones published in a map that was, uh, I, I think I can apologize for the fire service, virtually unreadable. Um, uh, far too much detail. It was never intended to be used by residents to find an evacuation route out of their neighborhood. And that, that was one of the pieces that really spurred this, de this development process. Um, you'll notice that there are Q QR codes associated with each one of these pages. These are functional and live right now. In fact, if you, if you were to hold your uh, um, phones, your cellular phones camera up to the screen right now, pointed at one of these QR codes, your phone will likely prompt you to download the individual zone map that you're pointing at. Um, we've tested it. It functions uh, essentially flawlessly. It's a fast, easy way to get these, these individual zone maps onto your phone. Um, I'm going to quickly scroll through a few of the nine zones, but I want you to see what the individual zone map might look for your neighborhood. Now let's, uh, let's pick the Fairfax Glen area. This, this happens to be, uh, I think, where Councilmember Kohler might live. Um, this is at the far western end of the town. We've got an inset map on the, the, uh, the front page here with detail showing the primary and secondary evacuation routes that the fire department has identified. Instructions on, uh, helpful instructions, I hope, um, uh, to help residents make decisions while they're under stress about which way they might turn when they leave their straight. Street, for example, at, at uh, the far west end of Fairfax near White's Hill, uh, the fire service believes that traveling west towards Woodacre in the San Geronimo Valley should be a last resort. It should be a decision, that, uh, direction that you head only if you're directed to go that way by law enforcement or firefighters. Um, in almost all cases, we expect that an evacuation from any part of Fairfax is going to move east on Sir Francis Drake towards Highway 101. We rarely, if ever, say never, so, so there are some instructions on how to make that decision here. This, uh, this inset also focuses on what we're calling temporary refuge areas. Places, these are places, uh, primarily ball fields, parking lots, other large areas that are open at a valley floor, typically in a place where uh, residents can gather far from vegetation or anything else that's combustible that might expose them to heat during a wildfire. Um, and in this case, Lefty Gomez Field and White Hills School, the blacktop at the school, are potential temporary refuge areas where people might take refuge while evacuating if the roads were blocked or if there were other reasons that they weren't able to move uh, towards Highway 101. Um, on each of these maps, if I can get it zoomed in just right so you can see it, you'll see that there are evacuation safety tips, information on how to receive emergency alerts and fire information while you're evacuating, um, which radio stations we recommend you tuning to to find evacuation information, um, and some discussion you might, might hear on, um, on Nixle, what you, how to get those messages. On the back side of each one of these maps, is is that list and a check assemble and ensure that you have the right items in a wildfire and emergency go kit. Um, as you, we scroll through, we've got the inset maps for Oak Manor, the Bothine Zone, Ridgeway, 
Tamil Pius Forest with two R's for Fairfax. The San Anselmo map is going to have one R in Forest. Fairfax Cascade, Deer Park. Um, Todd, maybe you could go back to the Cascades, just skates, to just probably the highest fire area. Yeah, and the Bolinas Road, which is essentially Fairfax Bolinas, which much of which falls outside of the town limits, but because those residents need to evacuate into the town of Fairfax, we're including it here. Um, the Fairfax Cascade, this is uh, 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 certainly an important one. It probably is one of the areas we're most concerned about in the fire service. Uh, it's an area where there have been a number of questions over the years about potential evacuation routes um, other than Cascade Drive. Um, a discussion among community members about the potential to evacuate out fire roads, to evacuate uphill over the Toyon Fire Road or out Elliott's Nature Preserve. Uh, we've discussed this extensively in the fire service with some of the uh, truly the, the leading experts in the world on how to manage fires, how to fight fires, and how to evacuate from wildfires. Uh, your Deputy Chief Mark Brown, I don't think there's anybody who's more experienced, quite literally, um, uh, uh, managing wildfires uh, in the world right now. Uh, he is in complete agreement that in no case are residents to make a decision to evacuate out fire roads. We've tried to make this as clear as we can. The fire roads are a big red X toy on and uh, uh, Elliott Nature Preserve should not be a choice for you while evacuating. I said, we rarely say never, we're comfortable saying never here. Um, uh, the valley floor along Cascade Drive is your evacuation route. I think one of the pieces that we need to remind people when they look at these maps, if you're a resident of the Cascade uh, Canyon neighborhood and you've lived there a long time and you pick up this map, you're not going to learn anything new about your neighborhood. There's no secret way out of Cascade Canyon. Frankly, there's no secret way out of any neighborhood in Fairfax. Um, what these maps are doing are emphasizing the, the safest, widest sections of road, emphasizing the importance of staying in your car on pavement if it's possible, helping you uh, understand what the decision-making process might be to go on foot or by bicycle. Um, again, we, we don't say never, but it, it's a, a, a tough decision and you need to calculate, uh, you know, things while you're under stress about what your evacuation might look like if you were to go on foot. Um, all that information is on these uh, feed. Designer Adin Janikin is a professor at Chapman University who, who uh, develops readable maps, maps designed for people who are under stress. We think that this is the best products out there, and we're really hopeful that, that this helps residents during an emergency. Did I go over my time? <laughs> no, you did excellent. Thank you, Todd. Um, thank you, thank you Todd, for, for all of the support in making this happen. So this is available. The maps are available right now on FireSafe Marin's website firesafemarin.org slash evacuation slash maps. Um, we're not publishing it widely just yet. You'll see communication from FireSafe Marin about this in the near future. We want the town to take the lead on publishing these and publicizing them. Uh, Christy Neal from Marin County Fire Department did secure a grant from Cal Fire to fund the development of uh, most of the maps. The, town, the town's cost is really minimal, minimal in this process. And uh, the CAL FIRE will be funding at least part of the, the printing cost for the town to get uh, paper copies, copies of these printed and hopefully mailed to the residents in each individual zone. So Todd, just one thing, um, a couple things. We wanted to present this, but the um, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority has told us they have the funding. So the plan is to print these, mail them to all residents in Fairfax, get them on our website, and that would probably happen over the next month or so. Um, but we just wanted to present them. And I think one story you might want to talk about is what you told us about Paradise, where um, people should stay in their cars. What happened in Paradise is um, 
people who died tried to get out of their cars. Is that correct? Well, I, I, yeah, I think it's a variation on that. We definitely think that the cars, especially in the terrain we have here, provide protection from heat and smoke and embers. During the North Bay fires and the Paradise fires, residents who were able to get into their car and keep their car on pavement survived universally. There were a number of people who died in their cars. Almost everybody who died in their cars were on uh, 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 unpaved roads in rural areas. There, there were residents in rural Sonoma, Mendocino County, and in Paradise uh, 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 in Concow who died in their cars. We know that. There were residents who died in their cars uh, during the Oakland Hills fire. But by and large, of the, of the 70 or 88 people who died during the campfire, seven of them of their car, most of them at home. They never even attempted to evacuate. Um, we, what we're concerned about is that people, having seen video footage of cars burned up on the side of the road, um, we've heard this from community members. People are making a decision before a fire even starts that they're going to choose to evacuate on foot first. Um, we're not saying that you should never evacuate on foot. We're saying that your first choice in almost all cases should be to evacuate in a car. Uh, if, if you are in a situation where you cannot survive inside your car because of the amount of heat and flame that your car is being exposed to, you can't survive outside the car. Um, so so uh, it, it's a tough decision-making process. We think most of the information that you'll need to make the best judgment possible is printed on these maps. Uh, I would really encourage people to attend the September 28th uh, webinar, Fire Safe Marin. We'll, we're hosting monthly webinars. Uh, September 28th, we'll be talking about wildfire evacuation. We will have uh, a, a professor from Chico State University who lost her home um, and had to evacuate at the last minute in paradise. She's going to tell her story. It's a harrowing story but a lot of important lessons, I think, that will apply to residents in Marin. Great. Uh, thank you, Todd. We could listen to you all night long, but uh, we'll yeah, be let's here Let's get your meeting over with so in the morning. Go home. <laughs> yeah, thank you, both of you. Um, and people should definitely visit FireSafe Marin's website to find out about all the upcoming workshops and seminars and webinars. Great, um, thanks, Renee. Yes, take good care, you guys. You too. Um, so we're gonna move right along uh, to the consent calendar. Uh, and I would like to start by asking if any council members have anything on consent that you'd like to have make a brief comment about or anything that you would like to pull off uh, to discuss further. Uh, I'd like to pull number nine, please. Okay. Anybody else, anything? Uh, seeing none. Um, before we make any decisions, we're just going to go out to the public on consent. Um, so if there are any members of the public that would like to speak on any of the items on consent, um, could you uh, go ahead and do that at this time? Uh, Would you like me to call on people? Yes, Madam let's, go, let's yeah. go ahead and call on people, realizing that uh, Council Member Hellman has, um, has proposed that we pull item number nine, uh, just so the okay. public knows that. Okay, but if there's anyone waiting, let's go ahead and call on them. Okay, the, uh, right now we have one hand raised and it is Joe McGarry. I've unmuted you. Okay. Good evening, Council. Hi, Joe. Hi, um, so I just like some clarity on what pulling item nine, what does that entail now? Is that, does it move to the regular agenda or? Um, we, we will discuss where it would be moved to if the council um, agrees that we'd like to pull it. It means that we're pulling it and placing it on the agenda at some in, in some spot. Okay, so can I speak to it right now? Uh, yes, you actually can. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of Rethink Police. Oh wait, I'm sorry, Joe. I'm getting I'm getting signaled by the town manager. Just yes, I, I think a little that. confusion is maybe if people plan to comment on item nine, that perhaps the council should consider is there going to be a majority to move item nine from the calendar, and then that'd be the opportunity to talk. Because otherwise, okay. person reference comments now, they'll need to offer it again when you move that item. So okay. that's, unless there's only one going to comment, then probably okay. that'd be fine. No, no, that makes sense. So Joe, what we'll do is see if there's uh, anything else that the public has to say about consent, and then we'll go back. Um, and if we are going to pull, then uh, we will go ahead and wait, and you can comment at that time. If we're not going to pull, then you can make your comment. Okay, so- I hope that's clear. No, so if it if it's polled and and it would be moved to tonight's agenda somewhere or at yeah. a later meeting. No, tonight's. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, anyone else from the public want to speak on consent? All righty, Michelle. Anyone? Oh, sorry. I know there is no one. I was looking. Okay. Uh, great. So we're going to bring it back to council. And uh, would anyone like to um, make any comments on consent? And we then can consider council member Hellman's um, uh, request. Anyone? No? Okay. So um, would someone like to go ahead and make a motion on consent? Council member Hellman? You can make a, a motion to um, approve consent and pull item number nine. I would like to make a motion um, to approve the consent with the removal of number nine. Okay, um, and I'd like to add a friendly amendment that we would move um, that we would move item number nine to uh, to consider. Uh, immediately after, uh, as the, actually as the first item on the regular agenda. So it'd be right before item 11. So that would be the motion. Is that, there a would be, that would be next. Okay, just one second, I'm sorry. Garrett? Uh, I thought maybe, depending on the comments on item nine regarding measure F, if it pertains to the budget, it might be better putting it right before the budget. So I would be right after the R, the Res J. Okay, I actually, yes, I, I concur. So I'll, re I'll, I'll amend that and uh, say that we would move it to uh, immediately after number 11. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion, uh, Hellman, and a second, Kohler, um, and uh, Council Member Reed. Okay. Yes. Aye. Council Member Hellman, aye. Uh, Council Member Kohler? Aye. Vice Mayor Ackerman? Aye. Okay, and myself, aye. So the motion carries, um, and we'll move right on to the um, regular agenda this evening, uh, beginning with item number 11. So item number, of 11, number 11 is to receive a um, summary of council actions to form the racial equity and social justice Reg, Res J and provide additional policy direction on any outstanding issues such as number and composition of members. Um, and I'd like to ask Garrett if you would please uh, give us a staff report. Sure. So you may call us background back at your special July 15th meeting. The council convened the community listening session, received comments from 48 of the attendees regarding proposed committee, the Res Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee, Police Services Budget and other related issues. And after the community listening session, council took the filing, following actions, which is you approve the formation of the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee, the Res J. You approve the concept of the Res J having a subcommittee to discuss police practices, public safety budget, service alternatives. You assign Vice Mayor Ackerman and Council Member Hellman to be members of this committee. 
And then you direct the staff to move forward with the application process. And at that time, we made applications available on July 17th. It actually closed this evening, Mayor, as you'd indicated, at 5 p.m. And so what we have is we've actually received 23 applications, of which one was from a non-resident who I believe will make a request that the council will be willing to change that qualification of either having to be a resident or business or own a business in town. Now, of the 23 applications, we had some boxes of people wanted to state what categories they wanted to represent. I should probably note that when I, this is a cursory review, but it looks like five people checked more than one box. So the numbers aren't going to add to 23, it'll be more. But in essence, you had two youth, three seniors, 12 people who checked the Black, Indigenous, people of color box, and 14 selected the at-large or no preference. So what that means, you have quite a few people. And as the staff report indicates, for the meeting on August 12th, there are some things tonight that we'll need some confirmation on, being that we believe with 22 applicants, it would probably be best to just reserve 10 minutes per applicant. At 22, well, we could say 23. At 23, that's 10 minutes per, it's 230 minutes. Uh, I mean, it's almost four hours because what we would suggest is the council take a break every hour for five minutes just to take a little break before you go. So you're talking at least four hours for this interview process, assuming everybody takes at least 10 minutes. It's also remote and virtual, so that makes it so it's a little longer to do things. Uh, some things to think about. We talked about the special meeting on the 12th. You're going to need to decide if you like it early like even 5 p.m., just because it's going to take a while. Uh, but based on that, what the staff recommendation would be is you conduct all your interviews on the 12th, and then you don't do the appointments till September 2nd, your September meeting, because that's going to give you some time to contemplate how this would all work. And then another subset of that that we'll probably need to talk about is typically when you do the interviews at the end, you allow for public comment on the applicants. And I think maybe something to think about is for those people wishing to support certain applicants for the council is maybe we do it whereby people submit an email to the town, we compile all those by a certain date, and then we include that in your packet in September, just because otherwise, if you have 22 applicants, you get 22 people to speak for each person, a three minutes person, that, that you know that's another hour. And really, if they're just voiding their support for someone, having them do it electronically might actually be a better way because then we can actually just include that in the packet for September and then you can figure out at that time. So these are some things to think about as we get go, go through this, but we definitely tonight are going to need a little direction on the interview interview uh, process for August, for August 12th. Part of that is, before I forget, is your two um, appointees to the uh, Vice Mayor Ackerman and Council Mayor Hellman are also meeting to try to come up with a list of questions to ask each applicant for consistency purposes, to give you a basis to compare the applicants. Uh, what we suggest is if they come up with a list, we give that to all the applicants ahead of time so they know what the questions are. And the reason for that is typically in our process, when you met in person, you would normally ask, you would ask people to volunteer to leave the room while you interviewed someone, and then you'd call in the next person so that they wouldn't hear what the questions were in advance. Remotely, that would be much more difficult. So we're thinking, let's just make it a little more even field, give everybody the questions ahead of time. Obviously, council members, if there's time permitting, could ask follow-up questions, but at least there's a core list for that 10 minutes that people would be able to see. And then uh, it's a little more, probably a, perhaps a little more fair in terms of that process. Now, one of the things the council members also decided at the meeting is that you could apply if you're a resident, business owner, employee, or if you own a business in town with a commercial location and you agree that we should have a professional facilitator to help the discussions of the ResJ. Uh, staff had indicated at the meeting it all be subject to the Brown Act, meaning that um, meetings would be open and properly noticed to the public. Now, at the July 15th meeting, staff did indicate we'd come back to you with a resolution. However, we think there's a couple items outstanding before we prepare a resolution. So really we're thinking now September is when we come back with the resolution officially forming the committee. Some items, as you know, is you probably need to decide a number of committee members. At your meeting on the 15th, um, you talked about a range of eight to 12, but you didn't really settle 
on a number. So I'm guessing you're going to need to settle on a number because obviously prior to your appointment, you're going to need to know how many people you'd like to appoint. You also might think about if you think off the applicant pool, which I would assume looks pretty good, but if you thought you wanted to save some extra spaces just in case more people applied, that's something you could talk about. Uh, one thing we also talked about from the council is the composition of the committee. We talked about youth, senior, at large, business members, uh, black, indigenous, persons of color, people of color, that's BIPOC. Um, if you wanna establish a minimum number per category, maybe that helps also with your selection process. Uh, that's something to think about. We also clarified, the town attorney clarified that the, oops, sorry, that youth members under 18 actually can't vote, but they can be members of the committee. They just would be non-voting members. And so these are things for the council, you may need to decide uh, just to help your process when you actually come to the appointment. And the other thing is typically when you form a committee, you have some type of mission statement, goals and objectives and so on. However, this might be one where you're better served where you leave that up to the committee to recommend to the council what is person, purpose, mission statement should be, what his goals objectives should be, maybe even what his work plan should be after it's had a chance to have a few facilitated discussions. So really at, at this point, what we're looking at is council direction on a few things, meaning number of members, perhaps a composition, how you want to handle the meeting statement, um, and then having our special meeting on the 12th, how you want to handle those, those interviews um, and assuming confirming you want a special meeting on 12th, which I assume you do, and what time you would like to start. Our goal here would be that if we know all that, then what we would do is on Friday, we'd package up all the applications, have a staff report, and we'd send that all out to you on Friday. At that point, everyone would see all the applications of all, of all the applicants. Obviously, we redact their confidential information, but that's our intent to go out this Friday. But with that, that's the report um, available for any questions. Okay, Council, um, what we're going to do is just keep it to questions. So no comments, and then we'll go out to the and come back. And so I saw Ruth's hand, and then Barbara's. Um, um, Madam Mayor, if I may, this is Janet. Oh, hi, Janet. Hi. Another thing to think about is whether or not you want to set a schedule of meetings. Okay. If you don't, the meetings will default to be special meetings and they will have required 24 hour notice with agendas. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for that. We'll keep that and consider it. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Garrett, I just wanted to ask, since we're staying with questions right now, I'll just ask this one question. You had suggested, I think at one point, that with regard to the interview process, assuming we do interviews on the 12th, that we might offer the applicants the courtesy of making an appointment for them so that we maybe, I, I think you had said, maybe just randomly select uh, put put the applicants in a, in a random order and assign them appointments. I'm wondering if you're still suggesting that or or possibly another way might be to ask the applicants uh, whether a certain appointment time is going to work for them. And if not, then uh, try to arrange it to where it would. But uh, just so that the applicants don't all have to sit through the entire rather long interview process in order to wait their turn. Yes, actually, it's. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. We missed that bullet point. Yes, our thought pattern is typically what we would do is we would randomly draw the names ahead of time and set a slot for every applicant. Then what we would do is typically if an applicant says they can't meet that time, we would mm -hmm. come to other applicants and see if someone wanted to switch. So we would have a set time for everyone, and the town clerk would work to try to resolve any conflicts of time. Good, okay, thanks. Okay, Barbara? That was a similar question to I had. I, I was gonna ask if, um, I think that's a great idea. One thought is maybe to give a range of a half an hour or something when you set those appointments, just in case, so everybody are at least back, so they know that 
They might be at this time, but it could be within a half an hour or so, so that they don't have to sit there if they don't want to. Yeah, they're all time time approximate. It, it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky because you'll stay on time for the first one. After that, if everything goes a minute longer, then at the end you're gonna be really behind. But every five minutes, if you take a break every hour, then we can kind of reset where we're at. Okay. Did anyone else have any questions? Thank you. All right. Um, let me, I, I had one. Oh, I, have we got any contingent for, uh, or contingency if someone is unavailable on the 12th? as that was not on the application. Typically, well, that's strictly up to the council. Typically, we haven't really done that, but then again, we've never had a situation where the council interviewed 20 plus, plus people. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, Michelle, I think the town clerk indicates she thought maybe some type of question like that was on the application, but she's going to check. I think what we would do is we would move times around to try to accommodate the applicants to the extent we could. It would seem to me that somewhere within a four hour slot, someone can fit in 10 minutes. Why don't we, just a consideration to follow on Renee's question is in the unlikely event that someone can't make something within that four hours, could they potentially just submit a written, it won't be as effective, but just so that they could submit their written questions and we could go by that potentially. Sure, that's a good idea. Okay, um, so if we have no more questions, then I would like to go right out to the public um, and hear what people have to say. I know there's many, many issues that we're considering as part of this item, but um, any comments that you might have before we bring it back up would be very useful. Uh, Michelle? Sorry, I was muted. Yes. Okay. Okay, you ready for the members of the public? We are ready. All right, uh, the f we have two hands up right now and oh, three. The first speaker is Richard Applebaum. After that comes Naomi and then Jess L. So okay. Richard, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think it's fantastic that there'll be a notion of a mission statement or vision and work plan, but since it's likely and possibly appropriate that that will actually happen once the committee is formed, I think it's important for the council to, because if you had that going into things, you could use that as a, a little bit of a barometer in your interview process, but if that's gonna be something that actually grows out of the committee's work, I think it's important that you establish some type of criteria um, I think we that we can all generally say that you want some diversity and people that you feel that are appropriate and have the time and availability and but um, it it would be nice for all the 22 or 23 people that have applied if they had some sense that there was some kind of general criteria that you were all shooting for and so that it doesn't just seem kind of random and arbitrary uh, in terms of how you're making your determination and while I think it's fine for people to get support from their neighbors or their community, that can also be a distortion at times if somebody is really, really anxious and has an agenda and goes and gets 25 supporters and somebody else is absolutely appropriate, doesn't have necessarily public support, that's a little unfair as a way to weight it um, one way or another. The other thing I wanted to remark on is that there was, a, and this may be absolutely incorrect, and I'm sorry if I have wrong information, I heard a bad rumor, but I heard that there was some discussion that at least the subcommittee that's going to look at some of the things around um, police and those issues, um, that there was some suggestion that there needed to be an actual uh, member of police on that committee or subcommittee. And I hope that's not true. Um, while I think they absolutely should be an interfacing with police and get all kinds of information that that committee will need, data and, and, uh, and, and dialogue there, I don't think it would be appropriate at all to have an actual member of police um, uh, on the committee or the subcommittee uh, for many reasons. And by analogy, I would just say that you know you wouldn't have um, um, a lobbyist for a commercial real estate developer on the uh, open space committee. It's uh, in the same vein. So 
Um, I, I think that um, diversity is good um, and objective, um, you know, people that have an open mind and objectiveness, but I think that it would be really good for you all to form at least some kind of bare minimum criteria so we, that the, pub, the rest of us in the public can have some kind of sense of how you're gonna determine who is appropriate for this committee and it's consistent with what sort of the vision for creating this in the first place actually is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Just for clarification, um, the police will not be a permanent uh, member of this committee or subcommittee, but be available to interface just as you said. Next speaker, please. Next is Naomi Schultz, followed by Jess L. and then Veronica Goretz. Hi all, can you hear me? Yep, hi Naomi. Hi everyone. Um, I'll be speaking as Rethink Police Fairfax on this agenda item. Um, I wanna thank all of you so much. Um, some of these comments were sent to the council this morning, so some of them may sound a little bit familiar. Um, a lot has happened this summer and we really wanna thank um, the mayor and our council for acting so swiftly and decisively in taking the first steps to create a more anti-racist Fairfax. Postponing the initial budget passage in June and approving the formation of this committee and the Police Practices and Public Safety Alternative Subcommittee demonstrate a measure of commitment to racial justice. We thank you for supporting these actions. We also know that this is just the beginning. As we move forward into this interview process for ResJ, it is critical that we do not allow classism to steer the formation of the committee membership. We've previously noted to council members the classist nature of a number of questions on the committee application, which have been so off-putting to a few black people that we have spoken to that they have opted not to apply or have seriously questioned the intentions of the committee. We must keep in mind that many of our culture's meritocratic standards must be called into question in light of the ways that black, indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color have historically been denied access to power based on those measures. Expertise on racial equity and social justice can take many forms, an education level, employment history, and club affiliation, which constitute the first three questions on the application, are certainly not the most important of these. We are heartened by the council's assertion that each applicant will receive, that every applicant will receive an interview. And we truly hope that the council considers their interview questions carefully and through an anti-racist lens in advance of the interview. We also suggest that it may be appropriate to offer a stipend to committee members for their meeting time as unpaid labor puts an undue burden on low income and working folks making this kind of community participation much more difficult for the less financially privileged. Further, we once again strongly state, well, this is, <laughs> you just talked about the, um, the, uh, the uh, lack of poli permanent police presence on the committee and subcommittee. And we just wanted to mention that that's really important to um, uphold as constant police presence at committee and subcommittee meetings could have a dampening effect on the ability of committee members to speak openly and safely about their experiences and ideas. That said, we really appreciate the willingness of the police department to make personnel and data available when needed. Um, that will be very much appreciated. Um, we also wanted to strongly state that there must be no attempt to bring so-called balance to this committee with the purposeful inclusion of overtly pro-police members. Certainly a variety of points of view must be welcomed and are desired on a committee such as this, but there must be no attempt to curtail the exploration of true racial equity and anti-racist public safety alternatives to policing by inserting candidates who are not willing to do so with an open mind. We know that at least one council member feels that activists focus on policing in Fairfax is misplaced, but this subjective opinion must not sway the way that the committee is staffed. We look forward to witnessing an action-oriented racial equity and social justice committee and one that truly centers Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, other speakers, please. Yes, the next speaker is Jess, followed by Veronica Goretz. Hello. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Jess. Hi. So first, I want to thank you all for finally including a land acknowledgement 
at the beginning of this meeting to the Coast Miwok people on whose land we're living and meeting right now. I thought about that a lot before at many meetings and was intimidated, didn't bring it up. And I'm just so glad it's now part of the council meeting process. And also thank you for acknowledging John Lewis and honoring him. Thank you also for your efforts towards forming this much needed RESJ committee and the PPPSA subcommittee. And I just wanna start by saying I agree with Naomi's comments on the classist nature of the questions on the application. I found myself somewhat disturbed upon reading some of these questions. That includes the questions on education, employment, and the one about societies and clubs. They are clearly problematic because they emerge from a classist system. And in the case of the clubs and societies sound definitively exclusive and discriminatory to me, as well as really outdated. I'm not sure what this application was drawn from, but I wonder if it was used for something else and is a form. I'm sure it wasn't intentional to sound that way, but the questions do not feel appropriate as is for this committee and probably for most others. Instead, I wanna suggest that there could be questions about social justice work, for example, learning or experience with racial justice work, personal and cultural backgrounds or experiences, or even facilitation and organizational work, or anything that's more relevant and valuable for this committee and less exclusive. And I'm sure the council is just trying to get things done quickly, but for this situation and for the future, these applications do need to be edited, even if imperfectly, to change those questions. It's worth taking the time. And like Naomi said, I, I'm aware that there may be people who felt so uncomfortable with those questions that they didn't apply. And I would hate to see that happen. So that should be taken into account. Um, I also wanna suggest again, that there be racial justice training for this whole committee and the committee chairs and the entire town council and staff. This seems like an obvious starting point is essential if we're truly gonna do the work of racial justice. So that would include reading key materials, doing facilitated workshops and trainings, and I hope the council can look into this further as it will be a critical piece of creating awareness, education and real justice in town going forward, something we all need to be doing ongoingly. Also, I wanna mention that I agree with Naomi's comments that there should not be a focus on having a pro-police members on the committee that seems inappropriate. And I believe there needs to be an unbiased and open approach to selecting members for the committee rather than having an agenda to select people based on their views for any reason. And all members should really be equally open to exploring anti-racist alternatives to public safety. Finally, um, as Richard mentioned about the mission statement, I agree. I think there needs to be a mission statement or a statement of organization and also about public support not being the key reason to consider applicants. Some people may be private about applying or not publicizing themselves or seeking support, for example, especially those who might've felt oppressed before in this community. And the criteria should be if they would be a good member of the committee representing the goals and values of the RESJ rather than based on public support. So therefore having that mission statement together will really help to evaluate applicants and their fit for the committee. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanna lastly say that on a slightly separate note, I agree with Julia, um, who spoke in a public comment about Golden Gate Village and Marin City. We need to use our privilege to help empower our neighbors to protect and rebuild their home. Thank you so much. And um, I will be sharing more with you guys about the mural project as well that is along these lines. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jess. Uh, the next speaker, please. The next speaker is Veronica. I've unmuted you. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, council members. Hi, Veronica. Good evening. I too want to thank you immensely for pushing for the formation of this committee. I know the week after George Floyd's murder, um, I spoke with a couple of you about the bubbling idea that many folks were having around this committee. And it's just really a testament to how committed you are to racial equity, that you've prioritized this even in the time of a pandemic, realizing that the pandemic of racism has been here for far longer than coronavirus and will unfortunately be here for longer uh, into the future. Um, so thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. And I certainly know that I, I speak for many people who feel passionate about making Fairfax as anti-racist as we can get. And in that vein, I um, want to 
let you know that I've gotten reached out to by uh, folks both in San Anselmo and in San Rafael who are inspired around what Fairfax is doing. And in uh, the meeting a couple of months ago, the town council meeting, there was this invitation to imagine what if Fairfax became a beacon in Marin for how a town that is largely white really takes the opportunity of this movement in our world that we're getting to be a part of and steps fully forward bravely, courageously, and just want to point out that people are seeing that we're doing that and they're reaching out to us to say, how are you doing this? What lessons have you learned and what can we do um, to follow suit? So bravo. Um, and certainly I, I too want to echo that I noticed some of the questions um, on the application feeling potentially intimidating and, and spoke with a, a woman of color who wanted to apply, opted not to apply for various reasons, but spoke to a couple of her friends, um, black folks of hers, friends of hers, that did not apply because they felt worried about the way that they might not um, be as sought after because they didn't fit the educate higher education or being involved in societies or organizations, specifically having been involved actually with societies or organizations that have been targeted by the police in the past. Um, so that was just an important thing to note as we move forward. And lastly, really invite the opportunity to let new members come in as we move forward. I love the idea. Um, I forget who suggested that, but that we don't pick the committee um, this month and then stick with that uh, solidly that there's maybe a couple of the positions that are transient. Uh, I don't know how it would look. I'm sure you'll figure that out wisely, but so that we make room for folks, uh, perhaps as more people of color feel comfortable to step in. Thank you very much for my time. Okay. Thank you, Veronica. Mm -hmm. um, next speaker, please. Yes. The next speaker is Ryland Morgan. Hey guys. Hi, Roland. So I just wanted to let, I just wanted to thank you guys. I'm super proud of Fairfax for forming this committee. I think that it's awesome for all of us to take a step back and look at what's really going on here and how we can adjust ourselves to be better in line with our ideals. You know, the stuff that we sit around in coffee shops and talk about, but we never do. So very proud of Fairfax for actually taking steps towards doing that. I echo what some other people have said about some of the questions on the thing. I felt like as I was typing that my highest education level is a high school diploma, the thought ran through my head, you know, they're never going to choose me because that's how it's been for so many jobs, for so many things, you know, uh, you, ch you check a certain box and your application gets thrown in the garbage immediately. So, uh, yeah, I would like that looked at. Also, there's somebody from outside of the town and in a town with an 88% white population that we're trying to get a, a grasp on how to be, how to be better racially with, you know, and be anti-racist, I think to disclude a BIPOC member from a neighboring town would not, would not do right by what we're trying to accomplish and by having police members be on this thing. I know you guys said that they would work be permanent, but you know, police should not have any, anything to do that. I would, that would, I would close my mouth if I was, I would really close my mouth. And I think that that would close a lot of mouths too. You know, it can affect a lot of things just by having them stand there. So that's all I had to say. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you, Ryland. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is, and I, I pronounced his name wrong earlier, Elias Karkabi. Is that how you say it? Oh, I guess I have to. Hi, yeah, you got my name right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so um, I'd like to echo some of the comments that uh, the people before me have made. Um, I am pretty concerned about police presence on the Res J committee or um, just during meetings. I find it to be uh, 
uh, to pose a, a potential for intimidation that might scare people away who would otherwise feel comfortable um, joining the committee and coming to meetings. Um, I know it's been said that the police will only be there um, for the service of the committee members and to provide um, support like uh, with data and things like that. Uh, but I think it just, it leaves, it leaves the door open for people to feel uncomfortable if they think that it's possible that a police officer might be present. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that the criteria for hiring people for the Res J Committee, the, um, uh, the hiring process and the interview process, um, the criteria for that needs to be very clear and made public so that people who um, are appointed to the committee know exactly why or um, why not they didn't, they didn't get on. Uh, the questions on the application were, you know, problematic at best. Uh, they, they certainly seem classist. Um, when the first thing you see is a question about your education and if you only have a high school education or perhaps not even that, you know, perhaps not even a GED, but you're affected by racism and you live in Fairfax, well, you're not going to feel comfortable applying. Um, and I understand that, you know, you guys have a lot of work to do and this was probably something that was boilerplate, but that's exactly why we need the Res J committee because we don't want people to feel like they can't participate in Fairfax because they don't have a high school diploma or they don't have a college degree. We want to, you know, maintain the spirit of Fairfax's inclusivity, which I think we all love. Um, and we want to, as best we can, um, augment our diversity in the town, you know, our racial diversity. So uh, with that said, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the fact that I heard some people talking about public support being part of the criteria for, for hiring individuals. I think that's absolutely unacceptable. I think a lot of people um, don't want to publicize the fact that they're going on this committee, especially if they work in Fairfax and you know, maybe their boss supports the police. Um, you know, that, that sets people up for uh, harassment. It's intimidatory. And I think it'll keep people who we would want applying from applying. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, point of clarification, there's no criteria uh, that people need to bring forward public support. It's just in case people would like to. It's the only reason it's out there. It's uh, it's it's not it, it's not something that's favored or disfavored. It's just an opportunity. Should a member of the public care to, because that's their right. Um, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Chance Cutrano, followed by Ananda. Okay. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, hi, Chance. Hi. Um, first, I, I would like to uh, congratulate the council on, on moving forward with this, in particular, uh, Mayor Goddard and Councilmember Hellman for really uh, spearheading this initiative uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the others that followed. Um, I think that it's just a good example of how the public can come to our representatives with an issue that we really care about and uh, how council can take that in and work with staff on these, you know, on this iterative, iterative process to improve upon the ideas of the community and to try to come up with something that everybody can be proud of and excited about. Because I think this council really does provide the space to explore and have the dialogue that we need to have around this really important issue. Um, I don't think the three minutes gives gives us, you know, does this issue justice, uh, even if we, we do have dozens of people that come on these council meetings. The other reason I really am excited about this committee is because I think that the Res J committee, as well as any subcommittee that's formed underneath it, uh, they really help to provide that leadership ladder that I envision will increase the number of black, indigenous, and other people of color that, are, that could eventually become council members. 
or go on the planning commission and make other effective change in our community. So I'm really excited about that as another way to be more inclusive. Uh, I, I totally agree with other folks on this call about the template and the fact that we need to approach these applications with more intention. Uh, I think as the last speaker eloquently stated, this is just another example of why this committee is so needed and, and why we can rethink and reimagine the different ways that we invite people into our committees and our town council meetings. Um, the other thing, uh, the, the floater police role, uh, I think we can you know, say what we would like um, here, but ultimately my, my gut feeling is that we should empower those committee members who are eventually appointed to you know, have that sort of self-determination as a committee, how they want to use that resource, that public safety resource that's available to them um, because th they might feel that there are appropriate times and there, then there are inappropriate times to have different dialogue. Uh, so those are some of the immediate uh, thoughts that are coming to me right now. But again, I just wanted to thank you all. I hope we continue to move swiftly on this and I look forward to seeing what comes out of this ResJ committee. Thanks. Thank you, Chance. Uh, okay, Michelle, we have one more speaker. Yes, and that is Ananda. I've unmuted you. Hey, this is uh, actually Andy Perry. Um, oh, hi, Andy. Everybody. Hi, um, a couple of uh, brief comments. I first wanted to thank you all uh, for the land acknowledgement. I'm really, really appreciating that a lot, especially in the context of um, the Res J committee and really honoring uh, the people. Uh, who were here before us. Um, and Renee, I also want to express appreciation for the tribute to John Lewis. Um, for those of you that haven't seen one of the several documentaries on his life, I think it would be an extraordinary thing for all of you to do if you haven't done it, uh, because it's not only uh, great to honor his life uh, and or to understand the, uh, what he did in his life, but it's a, a supreme education on uh, issues of race and social justice. Um, I, uh, th this process I'm also extremely heartened by, and I loved when someone said that Fairfax could be a beacon. I always see Fairfax as being a beacon on many issues, and I hope that that comes to pass, and I'm, I'm super confident that it will. Um, I, I also, I'm, I know it's been said many times, but when I saw what societies are you a part of, I, I just like shrugged, like I have, that sounds like something from the Great Gatsby or something, that term. Uh, it's not something that's even used anymore and, and it's, uh, it is classist for sure, no question about it, as has already been said. And the final point I wanted to make is um, in the prior meeting that I attended, um, the question of def this language of defunding the police, I think uh, creates a pretty strong reaction and many people because they think what it means and this could be true for some but i think mostly in the context of the way it's being used in this area in this town uh is not to completely strip away all funding for the police department not have a police department or have uh the central marin come in and take over the Fairfax police department um i think defunding the police in many uh contexts is about allocation of funds or reallocation of some of the funds that goes to policing. And I think I mentioned in the last call, uh, this organization called Cahoots up in, um, I think it's Eugene, Oregon, uh, organization that, uh, that has interventions for many of the things that the police normally intervene on, uh, such as domestic violence cases and things like that with tremendous success. If there was ever an issue of danger, the police are called in. But um, that's one example of how uh, uh, funds could be reallocated. So this is not about completely defunding the police. I think most of you understand that, but I wanted to put that out here for all of us uh, uh, listeners to um, understand. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. Thank you for supporting Res J Committee and looking forward to the blooming of this in, the, in our beautiful little town. Thank you, Andy. The next speaker is Joe McGarry. Hi, good evening, Council. Hi, Joe. Hi. I uh, just wanted to, to um, join in and, and thank you and um, for for the formation of the committee and really look forward to uh, all the great work that's going to be done. Um, but I, I just wanted to call out the the need for translation and interpretation um, uh, I you know I spoke to a lot of 
Spanish speakers about um, the possibility of applying for the committee. And there was some reluctance. Um, and I think that um, it, it just isn't, doesn't feel like a safe place yet, but I think by providing you know, full translation interpretation of all functions of the Res J, it could become a, a safe place for Spanish speakers and we might get some participation um, and a stronger voice from the Latinx community moving forward. So I just wanted to throw that out there that maybe we start right away with that, with the interview process next week and we uh, start putting some, some energy towards um, making sure that it is a safe place for all Spanish speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, do we have any more speakers, Michelle? I do not see any more, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I'm still not used to being a madam. But um, anyway, we are going to now bring it back. Oh, up. I'm sorry, a hand just went up. Okay. It, may I yes. call on that hand? <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, that is Brian Poindexter. Y'all are so kind. Thank you for uh, including me in the comments, even though I'm a little bit tardy to raise my hand. No problem. I just want to say, I think um, we've heard some comments so far about having a police presence on a committee or a subcommittee, uh, or having a representation of pro-police ideas. And uh, I just want to call attention to the history in this country of activism by people of color uh, that has been persecuted, frankly. Uh, it, it's a history that's played out close to home. Uh, in the East Bay, there was concentration of Black Panther Party, and many of those activists were jailed uh, purely for political participation. I think that fear still lingers for a lot of folks that are people of color and considering getting involved. And so when they hear about either a quota that ensures pro-police representation on a committee like this, or an explicitly police presence, I think it smacks of the familiar fear that they're not really invited, and in fact, that there is danger to their participation. Start it off. So my comment is just to share uh, that we really should be doing everything we can to invite full participation from across our community. And sometimes that includes looking back to our history to understand how those kinds of voices have been uh, systematically persecuted and how our actions might uh, represent that that trend will continue. Uh, so I appreciate your attention and yield the rest of my time. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, do we have another speaker? Yes, we do. It is Kathleen. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, and I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, the first thing is I just want to echo um, all of the statements that have been made about the classist nature of the initial application um, and the difficulty of maneuvering that. And that at some place, I can't find it now, but at some place I had seen either on the application or the information about it, that the application could potentially become a matter of public record which um, made me feel as if that were the case, and I, maybe I misunderstood something or because I, I can't find it now, but if that were the case, I would feel very, very hesitant to put my education, my employment history, and my membership in organizations in a document that was readily accessible to the public. Because then I would also feel very much like I needed to sort of manage my image and um, put things on there that might be palatable to people that might be making selections for this Res J committee. Um, the second thing that I would like to say is in terms of a mission statement for the Res J committee, I understand that the, there's an idea that the mission statement might be something that wants to be in existence before the committee comes about. But um, a statement that I'm just, that I kind of live with all the time is nothing about us without us. 
So if the idea is that there needs to be a lot of, uh, that there needs to be a strong presence of BIPOC people on there, uh, um, a council of, of white presenting people making a mission statement for an organization that is deliberately placed in order to um, put the focus more on and amplify the voices of black and indigenous people of color really needs to wait until the committee is actually formed for that mission statement to be formed rather than having a mission statement laid upon something that is, is being developed. And um, the, oh, uh, the third thing that I want to say is that I just want, I, I'm hoping that you, I don't know exactly how to say this, I'm just hoping that you appreciate sort of the difficult situation of a person of color being present in an interview with all white appearing people that in some ways that in and of itself is an intimidating presence and feeling that we need to code switch and um, present ourselves in a way that is palatable to black, to white people or white presenting people rather than to speak that maybe, maybe I was a charter member of the Black Panthers and of Black Lives Matter and of burn this place down. No, no not really burn this place down, but you know what I'm saying? My whole point, my point behind this is just that um, just to be aware of that your presentation will impact the presentation of the person you are interviewing, especially if they are BIPOC community. And that's something that I think is important to be aware of in this process so that people are really being honored in a, in a place where they feel comfortable and safe presenting who they fully are. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks for that. Um, all right. Any other speakers, Michelle? Um, yes, we have Mike Garangelli. Okay. Hello, Mayor. How you doing? Hi, Mike. Again. Um, look, the comment I want to make is, I think that um, a lot of times actions speak louder than words, and. Um, I think that as a white person, I've looked at a lot of different situations as much as can be, you might expect in the Bay Area. Um, for instance, one time I went to be a big brother, big brother of Marin in the action. I want to go help a young person. And the first question they asked was, would you be willing to accept an African American boy? And I said, I didn't even realize that was a question that you would be asking me. Anyway, so I was a big brother for two years to a nice young man. Um, also, I'm a host or almost like an adopted two, two really nice girls from, um, they're not girls really, they're young ladies, but they needed a place to stay. And um, we, took it, we took the opportunity to invite them into our house. One has been with us for 10 years. She's a wonderful Haitian girl and her cousin who's been with us about four years. And so my point is, gr let's have a committee, but everyone in this town, everyone in this world can take some actions. You don't need a committee to make a difference. So my point is, don't wait for the committee. Anyone in this town, anyone who's spoken today can take a step and go help whoever they want. Go help somebody as much as you can. And that's what I want the, my message to be. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike, for the reminder. Uh, do we have anyone else that would like to speak? I do not see anyone else okay. at this moment. All right. So uh, we have some work to do. We're gonna bring it back up to council. Um, I'd like to see if we can organize it in a way that we get through the policy questions that Garrett needs so that we can go forward. Um, and so 
uh, let me go ahead and put it out there and maybe we'll take those three points and whoever would like to take it on, we'll just go one by one. So the three points are the number of members of the committee, uh, the composition of the committee with some of the suggestions that Garrett gave us or the uh, options. And the other, uh, the third would be how we deal with the mission and the purpose of the committee. Uh, and then a brief discussion about the interview process. Uh, there's a lot, but would anyone like to tackle that and give us your thoughts? Um, did we also want to address Janet's question was regular meetings versus special meetings? Uh, sure. If you have something to, to, to propose about that, that would be great. Um, I don't, I'm not ready to go first, but I just wanted to remind you that she had brought that up. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone? It, it may not come out quite as organized as that because this is a lot, but I'm trying to trying to get it so that we can get through. Okay, I'll go first. Oh, Bruce raised his hand, Barbara. Yay. Well, okay. <laughs> um, so sorry, Renee, it, it may not be as organized, but it's okay. this is, uh, is going to be a, a disorganized process. So we have a lot before us. Um, I just wanted to start out by by acknowledging some of the comments that were made. Um, the we've heard a lot about the questions on the application, and uh, what I think I think we all collectively dismissed that in that we, in our haste, frankly, in order to try to get this moving because <clears throat> people want to get going. We all want to get going and get, get started on this and not not wait until the, uh, not wait and not lose the energy of the time that we're in right now. But in our, in our haste to get it going, we just use an existing, their existing application form for town, town committees. Maybe we all want to look at that application form and, and ask why we have clubs and affiliations on it. I don't know. But um, I think it's it's a very good point, and I'm sorry that we made that mistake. I think it was a mistake on on our part. Um, I don't see what we can do about it now because to extend the application period longer would really slow things down and and just wouldn't be fair to the people who have tried to apply now. I think the the notion that we at some point might want to rotate through some committee members, maybe the committee can address that. I don't know, but that does sound like uh, this. This is just all very uncertain right now. How this will, how this will look, and what I'm hearing is uh, that for the applicants, it was very uncertain. Um, I liked the the idea that um, the chance brought up that this process could bring more people more diverse people into uh, civic life in Fairfax. And I really welcome that. I think that would be one really good outcome of this committee that I hadn't thought about. Um, but I hope we haven't lost the opportunity already just by people not feeling like they were really worthy of applying. Um, for, for anybody who did apply, um, it's, it's, it's a strange thing to sit before the council. It it, uh, it used to be that we did this in person and you had to sit on a chair. And the first thing we always do is caution you not to lean back because you might fall off the edge. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange position to be interviewed. It's a strange position to be on a committee, pretty strange position to be on this council or on the planning commission where you're on uh, on live TV while you're deliberating things that are puzzling at best. So, um, but I really welcome you to, uh, the, whoever you are, we don't, we haven't seen who applied, but I really am glad that we've got a lot of applicants and I really look forward to meeting you all. And I just wanna to try to put your minds at ease that this is not a competition and that regardless of what questions were on the application, um, that 
I, for myself, what I will be looking for is just people who have a good heart and are looking to listen and have a passion to try to solve some problems in our town. So um, I, I hope that um, no one didn't apply because, because of something that we did. Um, so I'll leave it at that right now, but I, I know I haven't gotten to the specifics of what Renee was asking. I wanted to get those. Uh, I, mean, I was are we going to go around and address the specific topics, or what are, what are we doing here? I, I, I laid out the, uh, well, we go one by so, one. I, I thought that we could just get through them, but uh, why, don't, why don't we talk about the number of committee members? I see a number of members. I, it, 12 sounds, uh, something around the area of 12 sounds right to me. I, I think that's that's about the right number. There's my gut feeling. Including two council members, correct? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And okay. I do like the idea of at least considering possibly, let's just say the committee would consider some possibility of rotating people through. But these will be meetings that can be attended by the public. And so people can come to the to the meetings and they can, you know, this will be virtual. People will be able to listen and and then people can talk to committee members. So it's if you're not on the committee, that doesn't mean you're outside the conversation. Okay, um, great. So anyone else on the number of committee members? Barbara. I could actually go through all the policy things so you don't have to. That would be great. Through. That would uh, be great. My vote would be for 11 members, including the two council members. And that way you don't end up in a tie. Um, just a suggestion. I would also say um, I think we should not necessarily presume how many of what I view as the categories are the youth, senior, and business as large. And BIPOC is not a category, those are people. So what I would say is we should try to have um, some one or two youth, a couple of seniors, a couple of business, a couple of at large. You know, we can, I don't think we need to predict that but I think our goal should be to have as diverse as possible um, to the extent feasible. And if somebody doesn't fit within one of those, what we're calling categories, I mean, I think someone whose business could be working potentially at Good Earth. To me, that's business. They may not own a business, but they work here in town. So um, I don't think we shouldn't, and my vote would be, let's not necessarily presume how many in each of those categories, but our goal should be to have as diverse as possible to the extent we can. Um, I've been on a lot of committees in my work life and other life, and I think very much the committee's kind of first meeting should be to at least do a rough draft of the mission statement. I don't think the council should presuppose what that is. I think that's what the committee's going to be about. And I don't and I don't even think necessarily putting a boundary on it as criteria. I think we should be open. And um, I know sometimes for some people writing a mission statement can be very overwhelming, but maybe just get something out there as a draft to start from and then the committee doesn't necessarily have to spend a bunch of meetings on that, but get something to start from, and then it can evolve over time. As far as I would, I would definitely vote for having a regular meeting because I think um, one of the issues with special meetings is you only have the 24 hour notice. And that doesn't mean that I wouldn't say that you shouldn't necessarily have special meetings, but if you have a regular meeting and then there's a need for a special meeting, you can always do that. But I think with the regular meeting, people know when the time is and to the extent feasible they can participate. And then if the committee wants a special meeting and it works for folks, you can do that too. Um, so those were the policy questions I saw in 
the list, including the one that Janet had added. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Let's see if I can follow suit and kind of, you know, get it down. Uh, who, who would like to share? John. Sure. Why not? Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is interesting and having also served on many committees, um, I think that, that that boilerplate that got used for the interview process existed at least 20 years ago, um, if not more, uh, with the same questions on it. And, and people have pre pretty much like, well, it's worked so far. Um, I know for me, I, uh, you know, just I, I look at what people's interests are and try, just to try to get to know them. Uh, I, you know, and how much education is not really how much education. It's just like, what kind of, what are they interested in? Um, you know, and uh, that it's mostly informational for me. I am, uh, I definitely would never want that to be intimidating to anybody. Um, frankly, it is intimidating just to be interviewed and, you know, try to minimize that. We're friendly folks. Um, let me see in terms of the number of people on the, on the, um, on the, on the committee, I think it's also a good idea to have it odd. Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, I mean, with this many applicants, obviously there's going to be some people that don't get on and I would encourage them to attend these public meetings and, uh, you know, ask the same questions. It just means that you're not voting at the final time. Um, but um, I don't think that there should be more than 13 on there on any committee. Um, you know, it gets kind of unwieldy, but I, I, an odd number does help. Um, so I would um, put forth uh, a, a total of 13, including the council members. That gives 11 for, from the uh, general public. Um, let me see the the mission statement. I think it's it's a good exercise at the first meeting to go through and and think about what are we doing here. I mean, it helps kind of focus the conversation uh, going forward to you know have some draft mission statement there so people can kind of get their heads around what's what's happening and what why they're there. Um, I, I also support regular meetings. People can plan around regular meetings and certainly you can add a special meeting if you need to, for some reason. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be a discussion of, you know, uh, at that first meeting, you know, when those regular meetings should be, because it's obviously got to fit the schedule of the people in the committee. Um, I heard a couple of people mention a stipend, um, there's not really a stipend for, I mean, basically we're paying a moderator for this and we've appropriated some money for that. Um, but um, it's generally when people are contributing things, they care enough to contribute something and it shouldn't be, uh, you know, yeah, stipends are unusual, I'd say. Um, so I would say that's a little, uh, much and I think that's that's the points. Uh, John, the uh, composition of the committee. Oh, the composition of the. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it. Uh, Barbara's right. You know, maybe uh, two. You know, just look to get two from specific groups. Um, you know, I might add uh, differentiating um, working in a business and or owning a business is very different perspective. Uh, so that might add another, you know, working or, or uh, you know, in Fairfax, um, if, if we have that to pick from. Um, so that would, I, I would further parse that business type of relationship into two categories there. But a couple from youth, a couple from older, um, and in that case, four, if it happened to be four, uh, working for a business or, or being a business owner in Fairfax. And then, um, you know, basically the, the people who seem thought, thoughtful and, you know, willing to contribute um, and being able to work together to come to a, a, 
a good conclusion. Um, okay. that, that would be my criteria. So. Great, thank you, John. Uh, um, Stephanie. I can go next. Great. Um, lots of thoughts, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, thank you to everyone who shared on this topic, the public. Um, where do I begin? So I guess I'll start with the number. I My preference would be 12. And as far as composition goes, well, I want to address the form. So I, I feel terrible about this form. I wholeheartedly agree that it, it creates bias. And I wrote to everyone back who wrote to us about this. Um, that we would not disqualify anyone and I encouraged anyone to apply. Um, so I commit that this committee will look at this form and we should look at it for all committees going forward. So I apologize on behalf of the committee and the town because it is um, discriminatory, frankly. Um, as far as the composition, I would prefer two youth and two senior. And I do think we need to offer some criteria. I, I talked to Garrett and Bruce a little bit about this. You know, what if we had the scenario, which we don't, but just hypothetically speaking, what if we had the scenario of, you know, 20 white people we, and we said we wanted it to be predominantly BIPOC. So thankfully we have a healthy candidate pool where that it seems to be the case. But we need to provide some criteria so we're transparent and it's gonna be a live public meeting about how we are making decisions. So I think we're trying to do that right now in saying, you know, business owner, business experience, two youth, two senior, okay, but I think I would like to provide a little bit more than that as, as far as maybe some, um, you know, sector experience, whether it's, you know, if we have somebody, for example, that has housing sector background, that's going to appeal to me, for example. because we want to make headway with affordable housing and build diversity and equity in that realm, right? Um, that's just an example. Um, so I think I'd like to come back if possible. And Garrett, I welcome your comments on this or Janet, how we might do that um, related to some loose criteria so people can kind of understand how we might decision, you know, up on the day of the 12th of August. So that's my comment there. Um, as far as I've, we've, we've said this, at least I've said this more on one than one occasion, the role of the facilitator, and I love what Kathleen shared, nothing about us without us, right? We're not, we're not having, you know, five white people develop the mission and vision and goals of this committee, right? That's the role of a facilitator with a deep equity expertise who does this for a living, right? That's why we're hiring the facilitator, right? So yes, it would happen meeting one, two, three, I don't know how many meetings it's, it would take. So that's my position on that. Um, what am I missing, Renee? Did um, I the regular meeting versus the special meeting. Well, I don't know. I'm confused on that question. Like, what? Since it's a committee, why wouldn't we have regular meetings? Are we talking about just setting up regular meetings so we can get through all of these interview processes? Or, um, yeah, that's a good question, Garrett. Hey, I. 
Garrett, do you want me to take it? Janet, go for it. Yeah. Sure. I could answer. Go ahead, Janet. Okay. Okay. I didn't mean to step in front of you, but okay. So um, my question was because if you have a committee that's being formed by the council, it's a Brown Act committee. And if you have a regular meeting schedule set by the council, then you're going to have to pick a day and time. Um, and that's going to be your regular meeting. It's going to require 72 hour Brown Act notice with agendas. If you don't have a regular set meeting, then it, all the meetings will be special meetings and they'll require only 24 hours notice with an agenda. Um, but I don't, so thank you, Janet, but I don't feel comfortable just arbitrarily setting a date without the formed committee, you know, populated, right? You know, without consulting their calendars and availability I don't think that I don't think that's what you're doing, Stephanie. It's basically you're you're not picking a date tonight. It's the idea of do you want to have a regular meeting just like the climate action committee, like the first whatever of the month? We don't pick that tonight. When the Res J forms, maybe the first meeting is a special meeting, and one of the things you decide is mm -hmm. when will that regular meeting be? Is it the first Thursday of the month or the second Thursday or something like that? And then if you want to have special meetings, you can still have those, but you have a regular meeting day. And, and you guys decide that in the committee. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Actually, let me read to you what I'm talking about, okay? Um, Part of the Brown Act, um, we're talking about the council forming a committee, um, which is a, a meeting schedule fixed by charter, ordinance, resolution, or formal action of a legislative body. So if you don't, you don't have to have a regular set meeting schedule. Well, all I'm trying to let you know about is if you do have a regular set meeting schedule, then you've got a 72 hour noticing period. If you don't, then you only have a 24 hour noticing period. Not that you couldn't give more notice, you can, but I'm just suggesting that if you only have a 24 hour noticing period, it, it could create a situation where you decide to meet, you know, two days from now or tomorrow or something and you you immediately put out a notice and that is gonna create a situation without a, a lot of certainty, without a lot of uh, regular notice to everybody. And so I think you would be better served if you said it's gonna be the you know second Wednesday of the month or it's gonna be the fourth Thursday of the month or whatever. If you pick the date, um, you just create more certainty. That's the only thing. You don't have to, but that's all I'm pointing out. Okay, thank you. Um, did you want to say something, Garrett? Sorry, couldn't uh, get it off me. No, I, I, I was just going to add, yeah, I think the, the goal is ultimately, I'd assume this committee would pick a regular meeting date, and that would be the date by which we would notice. But I think under any scenario, we would always try to notice the meeting well in advance so people would know. It's just more of a yeah. practical matter. It, it'd be good at some point to just set a regular meeting schedule, but you really don't know what that's going to be until this committee is formed. But you can clearly, as a council, say that would be your preference. Uh, the committee figure out what the regular meeting date will be. Okay, thank you. And then I had a question about, um, Garrett, you mentioned we could um, capture public comments of, you know, whether it's supportive comments or opinion comments, what have you, on candidates in email, if we didn't want to do that um, in the Zoom so as to, you know, reduce the meeting times, would those emails be public or what is, is there a requirements around that? Or, I mean, what what's from a transparency standpoint, how does that work? Well, the emails are all public record that you receive from the public. What we would try to do is, and the only reason I offered that was just in the event, 
you had a bunch of public comment after the interviews for people saying, oh, this would be good and bad. This, or this person would be better than that person or so on. To right. try to avoid that, the idea would be, well, if only they wanted to, they could submit an email to the town. They could always submit it to all the council members, copy the clerk, and all we would do is just copy all those and just include it in the packet when you do your appointments so everyone could see what that is. Now, it is true, you could choose whoever you believe to be best qualified, meet your criteria, of diversity and all those other requirements. It's just typically sometimes people say, and you've seen this, is we support someone for something, and that's just their ability to say that. Whether or not that influences the decision, who knows, but it's an opportunity for someone to voice that. Can, if can, can I ask for clarification? Is Garrett, is it required of us to allow for public comment, um, whether in written or verbal form, um, in an interview process? Because well, typically, typically yeah. in the interview process, you always allow for public comment. It's typical, but do we need to do that? Do, do we need to? Yes. Yes. If it's agenda uh, item, an item on an agenda, people can speak to any item on the agenda. Okay. So the interview Just as a whole is on the agenda. Maybe not each individual person, but the interview as a whole is an agendized item. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie, are you finished? Because I'm going to go to Bruce. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I am. Great. Okay, Bruce. So I uh, on the on the interview process on what we were just talking about. So it, I like Garrett's suggestion, and I just wanted to check with Janet that this is okay to do because I do like it. That during the I guess it'll be on the twelfth when we have a rather long process of interviewing the candidates and the candidates or the applicants have scheduled times to be interviewed and we try to get, try to keep on schedule and we get through that, that it is okay if we aren't stopping for public comment throughout that meeting, right? But that we can just get public comment by email after that meeting and that, and we'll all have a chance to read it before the meeting in which we are doing the uh, making the decision. That Actually, as clarification, I wasn't saying you wouldn't allow public comment. I was just saying perhaps if you let people know that's the preferred process, then you would avoid okay. people offering that I support this one versus that person. And okay. it just it just would be, I think, just better. Well, and if we if we did have people who wanted to comment uh, in at that meeting on the twelfth. Could that could those comments be at the end of all the interviews, or are we required to allow comments in between the interviews? Because we aren't going to stay on schedule if we do that. You could do it at the end, or you could do that at the beginning. Yeah, you would do it at the end since. Okay, well, all right. Obviously, That's, that sounds good. Comment in the beginning. There's okay. nothing to comment on. Right. So, you do have to. You you should allow public comment. I mean, it brings up a really interesting question about this format that we're in, this Zoom meeting format, um, there are some cities that are only allowing written comments be submitted. But um, I recommend that you allow people to, do, to call in and to make a comment contemporaneous with the item, but not at the same time, not after each individual interviewee. Okay, that sounds clear. So that's that's one thing. I, it sounds like we've got sorted out about the interview process. Um, I didn't speak to all of these issues going around, but the composition is is uh, I uh, what I've heard people say, and I certainly agree with it. Is we're kind of looking for diversity on all different levels, but it's difficult to write that down right now and say we need this many people who are of a older age group, a younger age group, this demographic, that demographic, business owners, workers, it's its a lot to, uh, to try to pin down when we don't even know who the applicants are. I think we all have a sense that we want to have diversity and that what we're looking for is a group of people who will be able to work well together and come up with, with you know, have really good productive discussions together. And, um, we're humans, and so I think we're going to have a lot more sense of that when we do it. So, so much really comes down to this 
to the process by which we will decide. We'll, we'll do the interviews, that's straightforward. It seems like we just do them one at a time, but then the process by which we'll make our decisions, um, that's gonna be up to the five of us primarily, and it's gonna, with public input, and it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be, uh, I hope we can do a good job of it, but that's uh, that's what I think we're looking for in terms of composition is really a group of people that has some chemistry together that can really do something, come up with something interesting together. And that's going to mean people who represent a lot of different viewpoints and and who are interested in doing this work and, and good listeners. We'll see how that goes. The mission, I think it's it's uh, it's pretty clear that we are not writing the mission. Um, we did put something up on the application that was just a little paragraph about what the committee was intended to be. So there's that to look at, but I don't know what anybody thinks of it. It was something that Stephanie and I needed to come up with um, very quickly, and we did. And I don't know whether what people think of it, but that's all we've got right now as far as what applicants can look at. But again, I don't think the applicants need to think in terms of this being a competition or that there's a standard that anybody's being held to. The only thing we're looking for is to find find a committee that is is going to work together, as I say, have good chemistry to be able to to be productive together. And I think we sorted out about the regular meeting stuff, so that's good. Um, I don't think uh, there's anything no, else to say. Numbers? The numbers, um, yeah, well, I had said that before. I, I am liking 13, um, in, including the two council members. So it's the numbers we've heard tonight range from 11 to 13, including the council members. Any of those would be fine. I don't know whether it matters that much that it's an odd number. I've I've been on a number of town committees and uh, we have never had a close vote on a town committee. In fact, we hardly ever even vote. We just, you know, by the time we discuss something, we all are in consensus. So hopefully this one will be that way, um, that we that we aren't um, voting and, and trying to figure out whether we have enough votes for our idea versus this other person's idea. I, but um, yeah, generally we try to do odd numbers on committees in case that happens, but I'm, I'm not so concerned about it. 13 sounds good because it's uh, just a few more people and we're looking for a lot of different viewpoints. On the other hand, it's going to be really tricky that first meeting, special meeting, where we try to decide when our regular meetings are going to be. We're all going to get out our calendars and that's going to be tricky. So, yeah. 11 to th 11 or 13, either one sounds fine with me. Okay. I, I can go to 13. Huh? I was just going to say we should stay at 11. Okay. So um, I, I can remain flexible um, 11. With, 11. The number, it, with the number. With the number. I agree that I, I do think it should be odd. I think you might, we might be surprised that there will be some strong opinions and things that need to be brought forward to council that we'll have to make some decisions about. And so an odd number will just keep us from having to play the even game if we, if, if we get there. Um, so um, I would say in terms of the composition of the committee, I like what Barbara said and she said, you know, it's it, as diverse as possible. Um, and I'm not sure that we need to choose how many from each category. I think we all understand that we are looking for all of those sectors or categories. I agree with Stephanie that, you know, we want to have people who are thinking about multiple aspects of equity, uh, such as housing, such as what we do when we're dealing with a community where there's ageism and things like that. So that has to come into it. Um, my biggest question concern or something I'm not clear about here is how do we how do we make sure that people coming in to be interviewed and that the public knows what we are what we are basing our decision on because I'm not sure you know I I'm tempted to just say let's invite people in and then we're going to have to have a really robust discussion about how we think 
you know, what's the best blend and are we, you know, are we creating the diverse uh, committee that we, that we want, but I, I'm just, I'm not sure if we're giving people enough preparation for coming into uh, to the interview. I, I think that if we are going to give them the questions beforehand, that that will, that will be a good amount of guidance. So people aren't walking in blind and feeling really intimidated, but um, I, I would, I don't feel comfortable saying we need two, uh, you know, older adults and two kids under 18 who won't be able to vote. I think we're going to have to be fluid about that. So um, I think we're in pretty, sorry, I'm going on and on. I think we're pretty in agreement with um, the composition um, I, I, idea. Um, I, I think the regular meeting is, is all good. And Kathleen, thank you again for saying nothing about us without us. Uh, that was my intuition from the start is that we're not gonna walk in with a mission um, and impose a mission um, on a committee that's going to be very dynamic and fluid and needs a chance to create itself. So um, I think that's, I think that's it. I think we have to, and we have to deal with the question of translation um, in this situation. Mm -hmm. If yeah. we don't have people in the interview process that, that require translation, then just for expediency, I would recommend that we move forward without, if there's any question that there is a need, then we should. But in our future planning protocols, procedures, we need to have a place for translation. Um, as we know, our meetings go on very long. So we have to find a way to do that in the right way. We're not there yet, but it's absolutely in our, in our consciousness. So thank you all in the public for continuing to bring it to us. I think, I think that we're good. Um, may, uh, may I make a quick suggestion about number that maybe we think about 11 plus 11, including the council members, plus possibly up to two youth members who aren't voting. So that gives the opportunity kind of to, because if we're, if we're talking about a certain number of people because of votes, but then we're saying, well, some of those people might be non-voting, then that kind of doesn't make any sense. So just that would be a way to formalize that. 11 I, think one, I think one thing to consider, at least what Garrett said, there was only two youth that applied. So I don't think we should, why don't we stick with 11 and if we need to, I mean, I don't think we should necessarily appoint both youth just because we want to, unless they're incredible. But I think we could be a little flexible when we get there. I was saying up to two youth members, zero, one, or two, depending on how many we have. And But anyway, just a thought, that's all. Okay, John? Yeah, I, th I think it's an important thought actually in terms of translation. I think that we need to have a translator there for the interview process because otherwise it's not a welcoming or even playing field. Okay, so we have to make, you know, those are big decisions. And the reason is that do we do one way or two way translation? And what, what do we do if someone, I, I think it might and, be. You know, I mean, it depends on the applicants too. I mean, if we have an applicant, you know, who, who's, if all the applicants speak English well, for instance, then I think it's not as imperative to have mm -hmm. a translator there. Well, can, we, can we ask Garrett when, because we're going to, I assume it'll be staff that has to talk with the applicants and, and schedule times for the interviews. And so in that process, would it be possible to ask if, if a person would require or really, really need translation? And then right. that way we'll know. Yeah, make the right. decision at that point. We'll, we'll, we'll ask people if, if they need a translator for their primary language, and then we'll get a translator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that way we can schedule the translator as well. So it, Right, for that individual. Yeah, be correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Madam Mayor, this is Janet. Hi, Janet. Hi, may I ask a question? Are the two council members who are 
appointed to this, and I forgive me, I wasn't at your last meeting where you discussed this, but are the two council members um, voting members on this committee? Uh, we have not discussed that per se. So um, Garrett, did you have a recommendation about that or does anyone on council have something they'd like to? I'm just, a, I'm just wondering because if items come to the council from the committee to be voted on by the council, um, two people will be voting twice on the same item. And I'm wondering if you're thinking of the liaison concept as opposed to an actual voting member. Um, so to add, you have it various ways. You, you have a council finance committee and a zero waste committee. When you hold your meetings, then you actually are voting to move forward things to the council and then you vote as council members. So in that sense, you perhaps vote twice. For Are those council subcommittees? Yeah. Are those finance. council subcommittees? Yes. Finance. Well, that, and that's finance. different than what we're talking about here. And zero waste. But I'm thinking here they may want the same thing where they vote on the recommendation to move it forward to the council. Mm -hmm. CAC does somewhat of the same thing with the council members. However, you don't have to. The two council members could just be the liaisons who could figure out. Mm -hmm. And then you can move forward it, yeah. that way. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So yes, you could have it. The two council members don't actually vote on the recommendations um, and wait till they come to the full council in order, order to vote. Although I got to believe the recommendations going to council would seem very uncommon to me that the two council members wouldn't necessarily be in favor at, at some level with the recommendation, but I could be wrong. That could, that can happen periodically. Janet, is there a conflict of sorts if they vote, if they're voting members of the committee and then come and vote as council members? I think it's more a perception. Um, it's an appearance issue as opposed to an actual conflict. Um, Okay. It's an apparent, well. I mean, it's, it's, it's something to think about because um, usually council members are liaisons with committees. They're not actually voting members uh, because it, it has an appearance issue to it when the item that you voted on before comes before you again for another vote and you vote again. Like you've already decided and made up your mind, but yes, yes. Okay. Well, the reason that this needs to be to be nailed down is that if we're talking about four members who potentially would not be voting out of an 11 member committee, then you've only got seven voting members, meaning two youth, so, two council yes. members. And so maybe, you know, we, we need to decide on this. So if you're a liaison, are you, are you still on the committee? You're just not a voting committee member? That's usually the structure, yes. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way the CAC works, for example. Okay, well, then but I again, would... We've never been into a thing so, where we're for example, to can I just interrupt? So I'm a liaison to the Fairfax Open Space Committee. I'm not a voting member. Uh, I don't go to every meeting, but that's been... It's a little different. But when I go there, I hear what they're working on. I may, you know, I may participate. And where there's things that I feel need to be brought for the council, then I can kind of advocate for those or talk to staff about them. So I think, that, you know, I'm not going to be a member of this committee, but I think the liaison role is probably better, particularly because this group will be um, bringing up a lot of issues. And I think as council members, you guys can make sure that you get the right consultants to come in or experts on various things. But it will be a little confusing uh, if if you have voted once and then you're voting again. Uh, Stephanie and Bruce, do you have thoughts on that being the members? It sounds like we have flexibility I'll, in deciding. I'll just say again, and that I hope that we aren't at the point where we have an 11 member committee and we have a six to five vote on something and we just can't agree. But even if we did, 
and and that may happen. We may have, but the, this is what I want to say in a nutshell, if I can get this out. If we come to the point, which we may, on some issues that this committee has two different viewpoints and can't really quite reconcile those viewpoints as to what we what we want to bring back to council, then I think that a majority and a minority report or two different things like the Supreme Court does, you know, they, they say something, but then the minority will also write something and say, well, this is our thoughts and we didn't win the vote, but this is our thought on the thing. This is, I, I would imagine that the, that the deliberations of the committee that on a topic that was so difficult that the, the committee couldn't even come up with one single voice on it, we wouldn't lose the uh, lose that entire discussion by saying, well, we, we voted to only say this and no one will ever hear the other side of it. So I just, um, I'm, okay. I'm just not as concerned with the, with the actual numbers of the votes as I am with the committee being able to talk things through to where we can have some creativity come out of it and, and come up with solutions that can be. Um, but Bruce, I, I, but I need to know, I, I get that, but I need to know whether you think that you should be voting members or liaisons that function if, without if a vote. Seems like the way my, my experience in all the committees I've served on has been that the council member has been a voting member. And now I'm a council member on CAC and I'm a voting member, but we've never had to vote. So it just doesn't matter. I would say no, that's fine. Let's say no, we don't vote. Um, that would be fine. If that seems like an appearance issue, then I'm perfectly fine with saying I won't have a vote. And then I have another question. And then who, who is able to chair the committee? Are, li are the liaisons able to chair the committee? Well, Usually on no. time, that's been the case that we haven't been able to. I, I was chairing the committee and then when uh, and, and, and not now because I'm the council liaison. So um, I would I would say we actually have a unique situation here that we have a facilitator. And so that's kind of part of a facilitator's role is to. Yeah, but that's not going to be necessarily a long term gig. I don't feel comfortable funding mm -hmm. that for you know, perpetuity, you know, okay. I don't, I don't want to. The committee would have to discuss a chair once. Yeah. I would say if there's not a facilitator in any case, there certainly should be a chair. And so if we end up that we don't have a facilitator after a certain point in time, the committee should elect a chair. Okay. okay. The committees so, generally so elect their own chair in my experience. Right. I'm not really tracking what the what the optics are. Honestly, I would I would prefer to go with the original structure and have voting. That's fine too. Yeah, I would recommend for what it's worth that the liaison position because then you would really be, you know, informative to the rest of the committee but not trying to, you know, run the committee with any particular, I mean, you're, you're not voting on what they're voting on. I mean, basically you're hearing what they're saying and you're, you're relaying information from mm -hmm. the town. Um, you, you mean non-voting then? Li by liaison, correct. you mean the correct. I mean, that, I, I did much the same as Barbara did. I attended uh, pretty much all the volunteer board meetings for the last, uh, I don't know, decade and uh you know i i don't vote on any of their things uh, why should i vote it's it's their board and they're deciding what to do and, you know and okay so i'm hearing i'm hearing very different things you guys yeah. I, i'm hearing stephanie say that she's like the original which is that it's a vote you be, become a voting member it's not just sort of a liaison you know bringing voices back and forth I, is that true because we, we do need to make a decision here um stephanie What's your preference here? Because I know you I have stated my preference, the original structure to have Bruce and I be voting members. Okay, that's how we uh, do it on CAC today. It's not unprecedented. Okay, good. No one's raised it as an optics top. You know, no one's raised it before. I think we're fine. All right. So um, I think I think we've come down to. Let me just see if I can summarize and uh, let me know if I'm off. So we're looking at 11 members, including the two council members. 
Uh, we're looking at scheduling a regular meeting with, you know, opportunities for special meetings if uh, if we choose if the if the committee chooses. Uh, we're looking at uh, some flexibility in terms of the categories, but uh, looking for as much uh, diversity as possible. I don't think we're nailing down the actual categories or the numbers in each. That's what I got. And um, we are going to release the questions for the interview process uh, prior, and we're gonna have a translator available should any of the applicants ask or you know, respond yes, they would like one. Uh, did I cover everything? Garrett, is there something else you need to bring us back a resolution? So just to clarify. I think the mission, I think we kind of decided that we weren't going to write the mission that we would let. Uh, I heard that from, I think, yes. all of us, yeah. that we, the rest of you should do that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What were you saying? So I was just going to add, uh, Councilmember Hellman had mentioned something about sector categories. Was was that something you, you wanted to clarify, or is it something you want to allow the two well, council think, members to further I refine? It, I think it. I think it falls under the diversity and the professional or just background mix that we are looking for. You know, I don't know that I want to provide a sector you know, matrix and make sure we check a box in every, um, you know. Okay. So it's not something you want to ask the applicants uh, ahead of time. If you wanted them to, whatever, offer information on those categories. No, it would just organically okay. come out of the. Okay. Um, okay. So then really the interview process, we talked about randomly appointing 10 minute slots, five minute breaks every hour not make start the meeting at, uh, did we say when we start the meeting at five o'clock or did we say? I would like to propose five. Yeah. Okay, so uh, five o'clock, um, you do the interviews and then you wouldn't make any appointments till your September meeting. We give advanced questions to people. Um, we'll let people know their time slots and we'll try to revise any conflicts ahead of time. And if for some reason we can't, then we'll accept, accept written comments to the questions from the applicants that cannot appear before the council for interviews. Can I ask one question? I, I think it's a, uh, it sounds good. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about is we're going to have this meeting on August 12th, and then we're going to wait till September 2nd, I believe, to make the appointments. I hope that during that time, um, we're not going to be lobbied by certain people to pick them. Um, I guess that can happen, but I hope that we're going to go from that meeting and take our thoughts and bring them to the September meeting kind of clean rather than getting a bunch of lobbying in between. Well, that's where we talked about, we were suggesting rather at the, on the 12th, we suggested people actually wanted to voice their support for a candidate, they could just do it electronically, send it to us, you would get it anyway, we just put it as part of the packet. And that's the easiest way to do it in case yeah. a large number of people that wanted to comment. But, and, um, and pe people are always, I mean, people are always welcome to, to email us if they have feelings or, or like to express support for people. Um, we can't stop that from happening, but I understand the spirit of what you're saying. So, uh, Madam Mayor, may awesome. I ask a question? Yes. So when do you anticipate taking a vote on the membership of this committee? Um, on September 2nd, we'll probably start the meeting early, um, say 6 p.m. And so you'll actually do the voting at that meeting. I'm, I'm hoping that you're not suggesting you would send in a, a vote or send in your choices to the manager via email before that no okay i thought that's what i thought that's what i heard okay so you would actually vote at the september 2nd meeting exactly okay thank you yes in open session um 
All right, so um, would someone like to make a motion? <laughs> summarizing is summarizing everything. I'll, I'll go ahead if you want. Okay. I know I'm going to volunteer, but I did take notes. Unless Stephanie would like to. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll defer to you, Barbara. Okay. Barbara, you go. Well, I did take notes, so let's hope I got it right. Okay. Um, and it may not be in the order you like. So I'd like to make a motion on the following policy items. Well, first, let's say this. The meeting will be on August 12th. The start time would be 5 p.m. There will be 10-minute slots for each applicant with a five-minute break at each hour. We will not make the appointments at the, that meeting. The appointments will be made at the September 2nd meeting. There would be 11 members. There's a decision that there would be a regular meeting established, but not by us, that would be determined by the ResJ, and special meetings if the opportunity is needed. Um, there would be, um, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I think I have it. Um, the mission, we would not be deciding that. The uh, ResJ committee would decide that in their first or second meeting, even if it's just a draft. And uh, we would want to have the flexibility within trying to get as much as possible within those sectors that we're potentially interested in. But the goal is also to have as much diversity as possible in the makeup of the committee. And we will also release the questions to the applicants uh, probably, I'm hoping, very soon within at least give them a week before the meeting to do so. And then if it's determined that translation is needed, we would have a translator there. I hope I captured all that. So that's the motion. Okay. I think uh, if I would, may yeah, add, a, add a couple things. Flex, uh, so you want friendly amendments? Friendly yeah. amendments. Go ahead, Stephanie, and then I'll add. So the council, uh, the committee will be predominant, will be composed predominantly BIPOC members, and that Bruce and I will be voting members. Okay, I did say um, that you would be voting members, and I also said as much diversity as possible. Yeah, in prior meetings, we made it clear that it would be predominantly BIPOC, and I just want to reiterate that because I know it's important to most of us working on this. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I'm going to throw a whole other thing in that we have not, that we have not captured. And that is, um, it should be in the resolution that uh, a subcommittee will be formed as part of the ResJ to address policy issues. And uh, it, it, it's been written better than I'm going to say it right now, but that the subcommittee, what the subcommittee's purpose is, and that it will be appointed by the larger um, Res J. Exploring public safety alternatives. And other policy issues around, you know, so yeah. we, ha we, we have to write that because it okay. needs to capture all of those pieces. Okay, so I would say this. I think you wanted to, rather than say public safety, which is broader and includes fire, I think you wanted to look at police practices and policies in the subcommittee. Is that correct? And other and other uh, policies around um, the, the, around equity, because we need to leave it open to things like talking about housing. I, I think that's. I don't want to, I'm not, not trying just to argue, but that's I not the subcommittee, Renee. That's that's oh, the main committee. So you want the subcommittee to look at police practices and policies. The larger committee will be looking at the broader policy issues. Exactly. Okay. 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 So Thank you. That was the most awkward motion, but I think we're there. <laughs> I knew that would, would happen. Someone, Stephanie, please second it so we can move on. Well. I, I second. Uh, I Michelle. think we're, we're making friendly amendments, so I will spend it with the friendly amendments. 
Okay. Stephanie already second to. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion, Kohler, um, and we have a second to Hellman. Uh, sorry about this, Michelle. Um, but, uh, and I'll go ahead and do a roll call, Vice Mayor Ackerman. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Hellman. Aye. Council Member Kohler. Aye. And myself, aye. All right. Okay, Garrett, are you, are, you, are you good? I would like to propose that we take a, uh, if we could take a almost maybe a 10 minute break. Um, it would be good. Madam Mayor, before the council goes, um, I have staff waiting on the budget. I had the police chief waiting. Uh, he does start at like six in the morning or something like that. I'm just wondering, oh. the next item, that takes a while. Should I just, just have the police chief not be available? Because it's, by the time we get to it, you know, it's going to be whatever. But I forget what time is it now, but it's, yeah. it's 10 20. Be, We're not going to get to it till after 11. Would it be possible to move Measure F committee to after the budget? Or is that not possible? Um, I think at this point, uh, you know, I, I would be fine with that. What, what, That's what we'll see all thing. Can we just. So if everyone agrees with that concept, could we move the Measure F oversight committee to after the budget? Because I think there are going to be a lot of issues and we may need the police chief here for. Okay. Answer some of those questions. Is everyone in agreement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Great. So we'll take, uh, let's just go five minutes then. So, or actually, why don't we come back at exactly 11? I mean, 1030. <laughs> Sorry. Mayor, I, I apologize again, but I think I made that motion. I think we have to make the motion to move Measure F Oversight Committee after. I think okay. we need, I think we I need that. that. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Good, so you've made the motion. Is there a second? Yes, second. Great, so motion Kohler, second Reed, council member Hellman. Aye. Council member Reed. Aye. Council member Kohler. Aye. Vice mayor Ackerman. Aye. And myself, aye. Okay, we'll see everyone back at 10.30. And uh, Michelle, can you put the, uh, the info up on the screen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. See you soon. All right, everyone. So uh, coming back together, we, we need to uh, review the agenda uh, to see if we are going to be able to cover everything that's on there before us. So we're going to, we're going to uh, consider the budget. And then we're coming back to con to uh, take up item number nine that was pulled from consent. And uh, we, sorry. The business then, recovery. The business recovery and also the GAN, uh, the GAN initiative. So let's start with the budget. Let's see how far we get. That would be my proposal. And so that we can reorganize after that. So do we, are we good with that and just moving forward? Okay. Yes. Let's, let's go ahead. So um, item number uh, 12 is to adopt a resolution adopting the operating and capital improvement budgets for fiscal year July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 and providing for the appropriation of expenditures in said budgets and repealing all resolutions in conflict herewith. Um, so I'm gonna turn that over to Garrett and Michael Vivret, the finance director. Okay, so I'll start. We have a brief uh, PowerPoint that I'll point to. I'll share my screen in a couple of seconds. But you recall back in May, you conducted your budget workshop and then you conducted your public hearing on June 17. And so I'm just gonna share one slide for the budget, which is this one. Hang on, let me, uh, where's the, sorry. Uh, and 
hard to find all the things. Oh, here we go. Okay, there we go. So for your fiscal year 2021 budget, it's approximately 13.4 13 million, 11.1 million, our general fund appropriations, 1.3 million for your CIP, that's your capital improvement program, million for debt service special funds, totals out the 13.4 million. Uh, what you're doing this year, at least the recommendation is you're using your general fund reserves to offset the shortfall in revenue. You have some new revenue, but you have a shortfall. And so you're going to dip into your general fund reserves by about $390,000. Now, what we reported previously to the council at your public hearing and at your budget workshop is this is really a baseline budget in which we're saying it's really, we don't have a lot of financial data on the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, but what we recommend is a budget that really takes into account retirement and health, MOU changes, trying to eliminate one-time expenditures, um, come up with something that will get us through to around October, November, where then we recommend we do a mid-year review earlier than usual to try to take a look at revenues and expenditures, see where we're at. Now, we're also proposing that we do another mid-year review, the regular one in March, so you'll have another check at that time. Now. Typically for the budget adoption, we don't do a, provide as much information just because we've already had a budget workshop, we've already had a public hearing. This time around, just because of the level of concern and scrutiny, what we did was we attached all the summary of the revenues, expenditures, reserves, information on the police budget, all to the staff report. And so at the public hearing, budget public hearing, you recall that the council heard uh, plenty of comments, 48 comments from the uh, attendees wishing to speak. A lot of those comments had to do about the police services budget. Um, in recognition of those comments and with the council's desire to form the Racial Equity and Social Justice Committee, the ResJ, um, what we did was in talking with the police chief, and it was actually his idea, we actually reallocated $100,000 from the police budget to be used to assist the Res J committee and its activities. Because we know the Res J is gonna to have to have a facilitator, it's gonna be a cost. Maybe there's some type of studies or research or analysis that has to be done. Maybe that takes some money. And then perhaps if it comes up ultimately with programmatic, pro programmatic costs, then you have some money there. And this is kind of one-time money from the police budget. And how that works is that $100,000 consists of about 25,000 from reducing professional services, most of that is from the recent dissolution of the Major Crimes Task Force. Uh, that was about 25,000 a year. It's gonna, it may reconstitute itself, but really right now it's in the process of uh, dissolving. And part of that was all the agencies, especially the larger ones had budgetary concerns. Um, and with that, it triggered the dissolution of the Major Crimes Task Force. The 75,000 comes from police overtime budget. Now we should note that overtime budget typically depends on staff vacancies and extended leaves. And so assuming we don't have vacancies and extended leaves or natural disasters that require a lot more police overtime, we think this is, this is doable. Um, what we anticipate is when you review the budget in March of next year, you'll, you'll take a look at that. Just for historical purposes, you may recall March of this year, we actually added to the overtime budget because of extended leaves and, and extended vacancies. But in previous years, police actually had a surplus, um, in which case that added to fund balance. So that's just something to keep in mind what we've done. Now, other budget adjustments that we did, uh, what we did under disaster prep and EOC, um, council talked about the part-time neighborhood resource, resource group coordinator, sorry, NRG, um, what we've done there is that we actually included that in the budget. Um, you should probably note, as Councilmember Kohler indicated, that our original budget, budget included $5,000 to print, mail out these evacuation maps. I think to print the evacuation maps. However, the Marin Wildlife Prevention Authority has indicated, wildfire, sorry, Wildfire Prevention Authority has indicated that they'll pay for the maps. So what we've done is we substituted funding for the NRG in lieu of the maps. And then we added another $2,500 to the budget in case we need to prepare more disaster preparedness materials. Uh, with regard to town building improvements, you may recall Vice Mayor Ackerman talked about $15,000 for a battery backup storage system for the pavilion. 
talked about how there's a new concept. It'd really be more like 25,000. So we've modified the town building improvements budget to be $25,000. Now it should be noted that Vice Mayor Ackerman also indicated that he believed that there's a grant or you see some level of grant funding for this project. And so we're anticipating that once that grant money comes in, our actual contribution would be much lower and that would free up funds to be used for maybe other miscellaneous building improvements that have to happen during the course of the year. And earlier this evening, you approved the Measure A Parks Work Plan. That has also been incorporated into the budget. And some things to uh, take a look at, sorry, I need to move this off to the side, um, is that within this, um, just this kind of shows where your, your money's coming from. You could see it's property tax is almost 60% and your sales tax is another 11. And you could see how Measure F represents a fairly large portion of the pie. I think uh, one of the things in, in going through this and I go to the next slide is how you're using the money. I believe there's comments that police represents 35% of our operating budget. And that seems unnaturally high. Actually, it's the opposite. For communities this small, typically your public safety, which is fire and police, represents a large portion of budget, usually more like 60%, if not more. Part of that is because, one, your police department is half your town staff. So if you have 33 FTE, full-time equivalency, PD represents 17 FTE. So that's going to be half your staff. So obviously a lot of your money is going to go to police. Fire, same thing, except something to keep in mind is both fire and police are what we refer to as 24 seven operations. Someone is always there to respond to your calls. We have dispatch. So we always have a dispatch on du dispatcher on duty. And we have two police officers on duty with the exception of the early morning hours. So that's your service level that you're paying for. Now, subset of that um, is with regard to measure F, there was talk and that's the item later on in the agenda that that's the oversight committee and shouldn't your oversight committee meet before you talk about your measure F allocation. I, I just want to clarify that the role of the oversight committee has always been monitoring, monitoring to make sure the funds are used in accordance with what was approved by the voters. It's not to recommend what the allocation should be. Allocation determinations are determined by the council. It's fund 20 in the budget. Every year we show the precise allocation. We also show some historical data and actually last year, you may recall, back in May, before you decided to put the renewal of Measure F on the ballot, we actually even provided more historical data of really how you allocated your Measure F funding. Um, in terms of expenditures, you could see most of our town expenditures are all really in salaries. Contract services, that's mainly from fire. Again, fire contract represents about two thirds of your costs. An attorney, that's by contract. Um, Non-departmental, that actually includes that 100000 we said reallocated from police services. We actually allocated that to the miscellaneous line for the ResJ committee. Um, I think some other things to keep in mind is in, in talking to police chief, what we really looked at, at doing was taking a look at it, what makes sense in terms of reallocation of resources. And we believe the 100000 number is fairly reasonable and we'll have a chance to review that in March. However, I will say if what I've read from some emails, some people have indicated they wanted a 5% reduction. Well, typically if you do an arbitrary reduction like that, before you even do that, there's usually some level analysis of what that does, does to your service level. Because what we've done is we evaluated the service level based on a $100,000 reduction. I believe we could still make that same service level. Uh, you would have to have that analysis. Be we would recommend you would do that analysis because you just need to see what that does. You just can't arbitrarily cut it because if you said maintain the service level and cut it, what would happen is you would have your mid-year review in March and you would have to do budget adjustments because that was an unrealistic cut. Something to keep in mind for the community and um, how this all works is council made a conscious decision not to do furloughs, layoffs, um, another cut to services in order to solve the gap between revenues and expenditures. If the council had decided otherwise, like similar communities, we would have gone through and done a service level analysis so you knew exactly 
what that would mean. So you would know exactly what happens with a budget cut. And so I just provide that as, as background because I know there was this one email that was sent to council regarding just cutting the police, police budget a, a certain amount. I think that takes a lot of analysis and, and thought about what that does to service levels. Because again, your budget pays for certain service levels. Um, that's how it works. And if you want to change a service level or program, then you would evaluate that. And at that time, you can make any adjustments. That being said, with anything, the council can any time make any a budget adjustment at a meeting. That's, that's a given. You can always do that at any time. So approving the budget is important for many different reasons, as we stated in the staff report. One is we're only operating a budget authority from your previous fiscal year. Uh, the budgets don't really match per se. So at some point, it's really going to get out of whack. We may be spending outside of authority. Uh, and really to move forward, we really need that in place. Plus, we're putting in a new financial system. We really need to put those numbers in there so we can start tracking things better. And more importantly, at some point, we keep on doing changes and we could just never keep up with these changes. And that's all we're going to be doing. But with that, that's the staff report. Um, I don't know if Michael, our finance director, would like to add anything. And I don't know if the police chief would add. I'd like to add any comments either. Okay. I think what I would like to add to it or whatever is every city's different in the way that it's allocating its expenses, depending on what kind of services it's providing. At uh, Clear Lake, the agency I worked at before this, uh, the police was 61% of the budget up there. And, but it was much more important to have a much larger police department because of the crime in the area. And uh, in other places where I've worked, uh, I've seen a much smaller allocation because they had other programs, uh, uh, swimming pools, things like that, that, uh, you know, as a percentage of budget uh, allocated more. So, so going by the percentage that we're spending on uh, police or public safety is uh, misses the point. You have to compare it to what other cities who have a similar spread of expenses would, would be, would have. Okay. Um, thank you guys very much. I wondered if the chief wanted to make some kind of a statement or comment. Um, actually, uh, I think Garrett, the town manager, hit on all the points. He, he explained it very well. I'm available for any questions, but I wouldn't have anything to add. I, I, and I couldn't do any better than he just explained. Okay. Nice to see you. Um, then we're going to go ahead and bring it uh, to council for questions of staff or Chief Morin. Um, and just keeping it at questions for now, please. Would anyone like to ask a question? I I have a couple of questions. Okay, go for it. Um, Garrett, on um, some of the public have raised, you know, Measure F funds and um, the police being funded by Measure F. Can you quantify what percentage of uh, the police budget is? sourced by Measure F? Yeah, it's about, this year we're posing 378, 278,000. The police budget is, I think, 3 million 600 and something. So it's a little more than 10%. I'll say, wait, three, seven, no, it's a little more. So it's about, I would say 12% off the top of my head. So 12% of the police budget is sourced from Measure F. Uh, yes. Okay. Saying. Thank you. And then um, I'm I'm looking at the um, well, it does yes, the staff report, um, page three on the um, proposed revision to the police budget. Mm. And I recall when we went through this, whenever it was, a couple of months ago, the draft, and you and I talked about this, I guess it was earlier today or yesterday, Garrett, 
And I just want to state for the community that how I understand it from our conversation and how you just explained it is that it's really the current state, the p police budget presents current favorability at, and so I, I just really want to make sure that we're not defunding the police. We're not, that's not what we're doing. And I do want to thank the chief because I think it's pretty remarkable that we've surfaced a hundred thousand dollars and we're able to fund the res J and I'm deeply grateful for that because it's going to enable us right off the bat to do some really important work, including likely to do a study and survey. And I don't know, I don't want to say anything because that needs to come out of the committee. But um, is that right? Did I qualify that accurately? Uh, yes, yes, you have. And I just did the percentage. It's 10.2% your J represents of the police budget. Okay. It's 10.2%. Okay, so I just want to state for the record that it's current favorability uh, coming out of the police budget. Can you Thank tell you. me what that means, current favorability? Well, there was overtime that they, at the current rate, right, if things remain consistent as they are now, that they were not going to spend what they had in the budget. And so it, it creates budget favorability, funds that they weren't going to use. And so I just want to make it clear that they, you know, that we, we're not defunding the police and 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 I don't want to create anything out in the community that Res J defunded the police because that's not what's happening here. At the same time, I do want to thank the, the police chief because there is a collaboration and cooperation happening here that I very much appreciate. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions of staff for the chief? Yeah, I have more questions about the budget. Oh, yeah, keep going. <laughs> I'm not done. Keep going. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> Garrett, we exchanged earlier about the, um, is it California state funding offering $95,000 for COVID? I was just wondering where that shows up. Oh, we don't, we didn't have that. We don't have that in the budget because that's going to, I mean, well, it would require a adding and changing and it would have changed a bunch of pages, but we could put that in the mid year if you like. It'd be 95,000 reimbursing for a certain level of spend since we occurred. It's, same, it's the same thing with the FEMA money. FEMA money is gonna come in and, and uh, reimburse certain expenses, but we didn't put it in the budget you'll adopt. Um, typically we went for those type of revenues that come in at, at the last minute, but we can account for it during the mid year. Okay. I think the other thing just to say, you know, I've been following this through the legislative committee is that um, because of COVID and the COVID outbreaks in the legislature, the current plan is that because property taxes will be coming in more like August 15th to the state, um, they're going to revise the budget in August. So even though they said they were going to give us that 95,000, just be careful that I think the advice about waiting till the mid-year review or, or a review is better just in case we never know what they're going to do. Oh, you mean it's not, it's not committed? Right now it is, but they're going to do a budget uh, revision at the end of August when they see what the property taxes come in like. So, I mean, I, I kind of pushed staff to apply for that right away and they did like within a couple of hours, but I just think we better be careful because we just never know what's going to happen at the state level. Right, Garrett? Oh, yeah. She never know what's going to happen at the state level. I think that's a fact. Yes. <laughs> Okay. That's the, that one fact is the reliable part about state finance is that you don't know. I, I think I'm. I think I'm good. Thank you. Uh, any other 
Questions from council members? Bruce? Well, this isn't a question, but I just want to say one quick thing just to, to uh, clarify what one of the things that Garrett said in the staff report. The, uh, the <coughs> pavilion project, which we were hoping that we, it kind of came up a month or so ago that we might be able to get funding for it through MCE. And that's, it's complicated. And so I cannot guarantee that we're going to get that funding. So we're working very hard on it and hopefully we will, but I just wanna make it clear to everybody that it's possible that we won't. There's two sources of funding actually, there's MCE and there's SGIP, but they're, they're both um, related. So it's a complicated thing, but we're keeping within the 25,000 budget in any case, just a, a clarification. And I, I'll have more comments later on, but you want to stay with questions now, so I'm done. Okay, Barbara? Just, uh, well, I already asked my questions earlier, but I have one question of the chief. At least what I understand of that 100,000 is you looked really hard to find a way to provide some funding. It wasn't that you had, if, is I'm, am I correct that it wasn't that you had fluff in the budget, is you're just looking at ratcheting back on overtime which potentially we could need if somebody leaves or somebody goes out sick. Is that right? Am I wrong? No, no I, I think that that's correct. What I, what I tried to look at uh, in consultation with the town manager was ways to, to, to come up with some money uh, for a variety of reasons, including the deficit. And uh, when the task force, as the manager explained, dissolved, you know, obviously that was an instant 25,000 that, that there's no point in keeping that in my budget. We can, you know, put that back to other uses. And then looking at the overtime, if, um, and again, it's, it's all always fluid, but if we can maintain our staffing and we can uh, keep people healthy, you know, we can, we can, I'm hoping we can uh, come in at, at the new revised budget, the overtime budget, as the town manager mentioned, in uh, this current the fiscal year we just ended, we had to ask for an allocation, an extra allocation in overtime, and that was due to vacancies and a long-term injury absence. Um, if that doesn't materialize again in this fiscal year, we can probably uh, ac accommodate that. So that's what I was looking at: is ways to to um, to to find ways to reduce the budget and 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 give money back for other purposes. Okay, and just one quick follow-up. Um, it was my understanding that the twenty-five or twenty-six thousand for the major crimes task force actually is reduced to eighteen thousand because we have to pay for the first quarter before they completely dismantle it. Is that correct, Garrett? Did I lose Garrett? You're still muted. I know. You know what? It automatically meets me. It's probably a good thing. Okay, so yes, that is correct. For the first quarter, we have to pay the first, whatever it is, 6,000. So we say, it's, but the chief's gonna find the I rest. I think it was about 8,000 from the note you sent us that we had, we we're gonna get 18,000 out of that and we have to pay something like 8,000 for that first quarter. I, is that correct, chief? I, I think it's actually the, I, I spoke with the, uh, the uh, finance at the sheriff's office. And actually we did get the bill. It was revised down to about 4,000, just on, I think around 4,500. Um, but we're, we can absorb that. Uh, that's why we're just going to go ahead and, and allocate the 25 grand uh, from the, the initial budgeted task force money, along with 75,000 from the overtime to, to give a hundred back. We'll absorb the 4,000 uh, within the same budget. We, I think I can, I think I can still accomplish that. Okay, thank you. If that makes sense. No, it makes but sense. But yes, the, 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 the first, I'm, I'm sorry, the first quarter that we do have to pay the task force will be roughly 4500 And I think we've already got the bill, which I've submitted to Michael Favret. Okay, thank you both Garrett and the chief. Okay, any other questions? Um, I just had a couple uh, quick questions, Garrett. Um, what is the total amount that we're getting from the um, MWPA? It's it's in the staff report in attachment A. It says one hundred ninety-two thousand. 
Yeah. Yes. For for this year, what it is is uh, if you call for MWPA, you have the local share of twenty percent, and that would come to us normally, and that's ninety six thousand. However, because this is the first year of the MWPA, that regional portion that actually goes toward uh, vegetation management, defensible space inspections, and so on, that kind of stuff, that's actually just rolling through the town and going back to Ross Valley Fire. In the future, that $96,000 will not go to the town. It's only for the first year because the administration and everything really hasn't been set up yet. Okay. All right, thanks. And then um, if you could go to, I'm ju I've just been a little bit confused about the numbers on page 55 of the budget under building maintenance. Um, so I was looking down at the allocation of building maintenance uh, to the different departments. And I was just trying to figure out why the police budget has 11,375. That's uh, the previous year. So okay. maybe, I think I know what your question is. Public works has none. Yeah, the, that's because building maintenance really is, you could call it an internal service fund. What happens is we have all these charges for janitorial so on. And what we do is we allocate it to departments. So it shows up in the departmental budget, but this shows you what it is we're allocating to the departments. And the reason it's roughly twice as much is because of COVID-19 disinfecting and cleaning procedures. Plus we're now cleaning all facilities five days a week, as opposed to three, plus we're disinfecting. So that doubled the cost of janitorial and public works actually cleans their own bathroom. Okay, so we're talking about this as the police department building. Yes, they're all buildings. There's all of this building. But maintenance. Obviously, in the manager and clerk, we share this building, so that's our proportionate share right. for, in essence, janitorial services. Uh, okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, and then I just had one other question about the on the staff report on page six, the summary of general fund expenditures. So if we were getting all the money we get from SB2 and the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, um, and in the second bullet point, approximately 291,000 for professional service costs. I, why are these expenditures, if we're getting all of these, all of these revenues through, that, um, Am I making sense? We're getting revenue through SB2 and MWPA, but then but we've got expenditures. Because you have to spend it. So, so to answer your question, SB2 is a $160,000 grant, but you have to spend the whole 160,000 on professional services. So that's an expenditure side that actually goes off to offset it. Same with MWPA for the 96, you actually have to spend that it just goes over to Ross Valley Fire. Okay. So what it's trying to say is it shows that we're spending more, but it's offset by revenue, but we have to show it as an expense. Got it. That was exactly my question. Um, and then I don't know, but I know Ben is obviously not on this call, but I just had a couple questions about the uh, accomplishments in the uh, planning department. Do, do you want to look at that? I I mean, sure. I can ask him separately. It doesn't necessarily affect the numbers in the budget. But do you want me to wait? I just, uh, I, I thought it was important to point out I, in terms of our permitting um, and uh, it sounds like we only permitted one uh, junior, junior accessory dwelling unit. And I don't see anywhere where it says that we permitted any ADUs. Uh, it's six ADUs. Six ADUs, but I could ask Ben to check some um, point in time. But yeah, see, it would say six ADUs and one junior ADU. Okay, I'm not even finding my page that I was on, but I, I just want to make sure that's correct. Because yeah, he, we'll we'll double check. I'm pretty what, sure it's correct, but what page is the uh, planning accomplishments on? Page 26. 26. But sure. Before the final version, we'll make sure these numbers are all correct. 
Oh, I see the six. Okay. All right. Well, one, yeah, let's just check. That sounds good. So I don't have any other questions. And so I think if uh, everyone's good, we'll just go out to the public. Uh, so yes, let's open up the public comment. Okay. Um, so we have one hand up, but maybe it'll take a minute. The first person with a hand up is Jackie Bloom. Okay. So you're unmuted. Hi, this is, uh, this is actually Joe McGarry. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, to say a few things to get started that, um, cause it looks like the, the measure F piece won't be uh, spoken about tonight. And we were told it would be addressed before the budget. So I'm going to dive right into that. And I, before I do it, I just want to acknowledge that the, the Res J committee was formed directly in the response to the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police. And we should not forget that, that, uh, and I'll say it one more time. Res J was formed in response to the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police. And now I'd like to speak to um, the item that was on the consent calendar to amend the membership of the Measure Up Oversight Committee uh, to add two citizen members. I'm very supportive of this uh, amendment to include citizens on this committee. Um, but it's deeply problematic that this item is uh, being pushed after the budget um, discussion tonight on the agenda. Um, uh, no oversight committee meeting has yet taken place to provide oversight of Measure F, and that hasn't been done for five years um, from what we can tell. Um, and it has so no monitoring of Measure F or J distribution of funds since 2014. So an oversight committee was theoretically formed in 2019 um, from members of other committees and council members. This committee has yet to meet uh, to provide the oversight required by law in passing of Measure F. Over the course of the past two months, many citizen demands for a reduced police budget and allocation have been met with retorts citing the passage of Measure F and the inclusion therein of an action to keep our local police station open 24 seven. To be clear, the language of Measure F clearly lists 24 seven police department as being only one of five action items the measure would fund and enact. The other four being maintenance, um, enhance local fire, uh, maintain and enhance local fire services and wildfire prevention efforts, fund public works and safety projects, maintain youth and senior programs, and uh, as an equal, continue the Citizens Oversight Committee. We strongly affirm that the other four areas of this measure are just as important, if not more so, to the citizens of Fairfax who approved this measure. The police aspect of the measure cannot be placed on a pedestal above the other four areas. The lack of citizen oversight over this fund allocation for many years, and this year in particular, is highly problematic. Passing a budget without the intended and required oversight is grossly negligent and possibly illegal. Whether this lack of oversight was intentional or simply a bureaucratic mistake, it has now been made public and must be addressed. Um, we do not see value in drawing out the passage of the town's budget indefinitely, but the town must work to rectify this gross mistake made over the last half decade. And in light of this blatant flouting of Measure F's language, we highly recommend that certain council members stop citing the measure as a mono monolithic testament of our town's appetite for unchecked police power. And lastly, that we can't redefine what oversight is, what an oversight committee is, and in, in turning it into words of monitor and using past references in the town um, a citizen oversight, I, I, you know, an oversight committee is uh, appointed to supervise and inspect government operations, especially, especially the funding, uh, the spending of government funds. And that's what needs to happen. We can't just say that we decide that this is what monitoring of funds is for the town of Fairfax. There's a clear definition of what oversight is and what that reach is. And we need to have the group meet 
and oversee the funds of Measure F before the budget can be passed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, do we have other public comment? Yes, we do. That um, we have next is Ryland Morgan, followed by Naomi Schultz. Hey guys, I'm back. So I just wanted to, um, I wanted to thank you for funding the Res J Committee. I think that's awesome. Uh, I think that a hundred thousand dollars, you know, taken from the police budget. I think that's a sign. That's a, it's a good sign. It's a good first step, but it's kind of like a baby first step. It, it doesn't nearly go as far as I'd like to see. I'd like to, town of Fairfax, I'd like to see the town of Fairfax commit to specific reductions in bloated police spending over a certain amount of time. And I'd like to see a commitment of that, you know, like we, the town of Fairfax, we don't need the level of service that the police provide currently with what's going on. It doesn't, it's not a good representation of our town and what, and what the town of Fairfax needs to have. So you know, I would like to see X amount taken away and reallocated towards these other services over Y amount of years. And then how do we get there? How, how do we do these things? And I think if we put a firm commitment down, I think that that will go a long way to quelling a lot of open-ended questions as to what's going on with Fairfax and the police budget. And I just, I frankly disagree that uh, we need this level of service that we have with seven violent crimes a year in Fairfax, you know, over 55% of uh, police interactions are police initiated, <clears throat> stuff like that. Like we just look at the numbers, the numbers speak for themselves. We frankly don't need it. I yield my time. Thanks, you guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Naomi Schultz, followed by Veronica Goretz. Hi there, can you all hear me? Yep, hi Naomi. Hi, um, I appreciate this reallocation of $100,000 coming from the police department to fund the Res J committee that will be very much needed in order to fund facilitation, study surveys and more. However, I am very concerned about the resolution that was just formed regarding the Res J. I am seriously disappointed. The police practices and public safety alternative subcommittee has been neutered so that now the subcommittee is apparently only examining police policy. There was no language included in the resolution you just approved about looking into public safety alternatives. Your town has asked for you to look at public, public safety alternatives in every town council meeting for the past few months. Your removal of the public safety alternatives aspect of this subcommittee is unacceptable. The town manager dismiss, dismisses our calls to reallocate 5% from the police budget to fund Res J and, and the subcommittee. Um, saying that you need analysis in order to make serious cuts to services. But the analysis of potential cuts to services and funding of other types of services would come from a proper police practices and public safety alternative subcommittee, which you have just neglected to give us. As for Measure F, we want citizen oversight of how these funds are allocated, as the language of Measure F clearly describes. It describes that as clearly as it describes the 24-7 police department. The town manager's characterization of this as over, as just monitoring the way that funds are that funds are spent in the way that town council wants may be the historic use of this committee, but that's not true citizen oversight of the funds. This $100,000 is a great step to get ResJ started, but you all need to know that public safety alternatives are the future. We're not going to stop pushing for reallocation of funds to anti-racist alternatives that don't have a brutal history with people of color and removing those public safety alternatives from the foundation of this subcommittee will not stop us from calling for, for that. Thank you. Okay, a point of clarification. Um, we did not uh, approve an, a resolution. Uh, tonight, just for point of clarification, um, Stephanie wanted to add something, but I want well, to- I, sa first. I said public safety alternatives. I did say that. Yes. and. That the resolution has not been crafted and we haven't considered the resolution yet. So yeah, that language can go in. My comment as well to that as the other council representative of the Res J. Public safety alternatives is definitely on the table. I'm sorry if the language wasn't clear, but that's what was intended. When we talk about looking at police, we're talking about looking at the whole 
concept and rethinking. So that's what it's about, yes. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, uh, next speaker, please. Next is Veronica Goretz, followed by Jackie Bloom, probably not Joe McGarry this time, uh, followed by Dee Lee. Thanks Veronica, you're yourself. unmuted. Oh, thank you. Hi again, everybody. I'm just gonna take a big breath in. I know you're doing so much. I encourage you to take a big breath in with me. And I am really relieved to hear the feedback that you just gave in response to Naomi's concern that there wasn't an emphasis on leaning into reimagining what we might be creating as alternatives to public safety that allow BIPOC to feel very much able to thrive and be centered in the way that we consider uh, community and public safety. So thank you for that clarification. And also I'm so stoked that there is $100,000 already being uh, funneled to the ResJ committee. That feels like really, you know, obviously putting your money where your mouth is instead of creating a committee that's empty in terms of its capacity. Um, actually saying, no, we, we value this enough that we're going to start it off with a huge um, allowance. It's, it's, yeah, really grateful for that and commend that. And do want to make sure to state it again. I, it can't be stated enough right now that Marin has the worst racial disparity gap in the state. As we continue to have these conversations, to remember that and to realize that in order to rectify that, we have to do uncomfortable things. Things have, it, it can't just be an easy uh, rollover to addressing the fact that white people in this county have more advantages to economic wealth, to housing security, to job advancement than our, our BIPOC siblings. And some of that uncomfortable work is deeply rooted in policing. There is no question about it. It is a national clear request of black movement leaders. And we cannot, we can no longer say that doesn't apply to us. And I, I am really hoping we continue to stop using that excuse to say that, well, not in Fairfax, though our police force has so many things that I believe we can be proud of. We can't then ignore and pretend like we, we don't have to continue to look at ways that we can reallocate funds toward public safety models and to realize that part of those reallocations, where we source them from naturally would be coming from policing. So I do urge us to consider not just that $100,000 but to lean even broader, and I don't have the wisdom myself, and I respect the work you have to do to think of that, but that we lean into even considering more that we ways in which we could reallocate funds from the police towards alternative public safety models that are anti-racist at their core. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Jackie Bloom, followed by... Deborah Benson, followed by Mike Gerengeli. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. We can Hi, this is Jackie this time. Um, and I will be speaking for Rethink Police. Uh, members of the council, uh, we thank you for your work so far this summer in working towards a more anti-racist Fairfax. But of course, those were just first steps. And now we must continue to take decisive action to ensure that the real work of racial equity and social justice takes root. This week, the town has proposed that $100,000 be reallocated away from the police budget to fund the, the Res J committee. And um, this is an essential action and we are encouraged by this, but um, moving forward with the previously proposed budget would have undermined the town's anti-racist efforts thus far. So it really was, a, it had to happen. You know, we don't need to, 
This reallocation is indicative that the town is beginning to understand that racial justice must become a tangible political and fiscal priority. That said, we don't feel that this reallocation goes far enough. We assert that 5% of the previously proposed police budget should be reallocated to the Res J committee to fund immediate substantive racial equity work and the development of anti-racist public safety alternatives. Such funding would allow the, the committee to pay a stipend to BIPOC committee members for consultants and facilitators, commissions and to implement studies, conduct surveys, develop and fund nascent programs, partner with other townships and to truly begin to do the work of building an anti-racist town with accompanying anti-racist public safety alternatives. Nowhere is this work more appropriate than here in Marin County. And as Veronica just reminded us all, has the worst racial disparity gap in the state. Policing is certainly not the only racially problematic aspect of Marin culture, but it certainly contributes to upholding this dire state of affairs. And though the Fairfax Police Department is frequently lauded for its relative transparency, its quote unquote community policing model, and its perfunctory adherence to some reforms, it still has the most bloated budget of any town in the county. With only seven violent crimes per year in Fairfax, the allotment of approximately a third of the town's general fund to policing is indefensible. No other Marin town approaches that percentage. None are above 30%. With a dearth of violent crimes to attend to here in town, our police department instead spends its ample resources in other ways. Some actions are oriented to helping residents, for example, the emergency operation plan and evacuation protocol while others are all about preempting or manufacturing law breaking. Racially disproportionate traffic stops, bicycle stings, pedestrian stings, vehicle abatement programs, teen alcohol and tobacco enforcement operations, including shoulder tap operations. Most current police activities would quite simply be better resolved by unarmed traffic personnel, non-police affiliated dispatchers, mental health experts, and other crisis responded when they are needed at all. It's time that we stop basing our town's public safety system on an underlying threat of force that puts our most vulnerable citizens at risk and instead to set about creating and funding anti-racist public safety, safety alternatives that reflect the values of our town in the 21st century, anti-racist values. Perhaps this means combining our fire and police departments as Sunnyvale has done so that armed first responders show up to most calls Perhaps our dispatchers needn't be paid out of the police budget. And instead, these, this, these dispatchers could be well-educated about public safety alternatives, routing calls to the appropriate local mental health resources, substance abuse specialists, health crisis units, or fire department. Perhaps a new anti-racist, anti-classist traffic unit could be formed that is separate from the police department, as Berkeley has done. This kind of rethinking and redesigning is happening in towns and cities all over the Bay Area and all over the country. And Fairfax must not be left behind to perpetuate this country's abysmal racial equity record. We must get started now by reallocating at least 5% of the police budget immediately. And that, yes, means cutting services. We don't want the police service to, services to be as bloated as they are. We will be watching closely as the Res J and the public, the police practices and public safety alternatives subcommittee is staffed, does its research and makes its recommendations to this council. And we will expect additional adjustments to be made to the budget in accordance with these findings at forthcoming budget review sessions and at any time that they're needed in order that Fairfax continues to move towards becoming a truly anti-racist town. We are heartened that this Council has been listening, responding, and taking action these past, past two months. But now is the moment for our town to truly become a beacon of hope for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx, and other people of color in Fairfax, Marin, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. And next speaker, please. Next is Deborah Benson, followed by Mike Garangeli and Richard Applebaum. Hello, Deborah Benson, Fairfax. Um, I am, first of all, very much in favor and very heartened by the movement across the country and across the world to uh, change these abhorrent 
uh, police practices that have been targeting uh, people of color in, in terrible ways. However, I have lived in Fairfax for 30 years and I have not seen that kind of behavior by our police in the time that I've lived here. I have seen uh, a worse police force than we have now. I think we have a great team and I see them being targeted by uh, some distillation of this national movement to uh, broad, broad stroke uh, all, of the, all of the police across the country. Our police should be held up as a, a, a beacon, an example of the, the, the right way to behave and the right thing to do. Uh, one of the speakers said that our town has asked for reallocation of funds um, away from our police department. I have not asked for a reallocation of funds, and I believe that there is a large segment of our town who is in full support of our police operating in the way that they do. Um, there seems to be no room for uh, a, a different voice in, in this local movement. Um, I think it's very generous of the chief to try to figure out how to push uh, 75,000 or more of his budget into, uh, into this committee. Um, but I think there needs to be a little, a little softening of the lines here. Um, I, 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 I fully support our police. I am so glad they're there 24 seven. I have lived in places where I felt in danger of my life for my life. I lived in Tampa, Florida, where you heard gunshots all night long. I grew up in Baltimore. Uh, you did not go out in the street at night after a certain hour. Whenever I have needed the police, they have been there. And I myself have never seen them treat a person with racist uh, intent. Yeah, if I'm driving down the road in a police car, pulls up behind me, I get scared because ooh, they're the police and you know I might get in trouble. Um, I just think we need to soften the lines here. And I just wanna say again, I fully support our Fairfax police and I, I really resent that these this movement is locally targeting them for uh, actions of wrong actions that are happening in different locales. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Next is Mike Garangelli, followed by Richard A., followed by Brian Poindexter. Unmute. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, again. Um, so it's been said tonight that this isn't about defunding the police, but it really is in reality. That's what it is reallocation, whatever you want to call it. And um, I've had the uh, experience of having to deal with the police for mental health issues for people that I know. And um, I thought they actually did a pretty good job in that area. And sometimes those situations can get violent as well. So I don't know how prudent it is to be having people that are experts at, let's say, mental health, and they're going to be not equipped to deal with any kind of violent actions by that particular person um, who's mentally ill. So I see both sides of it, but I think the police are doing a, a pretty good job. Um, Secondly, I think that this is obvious that, I mean, what's this? I heard this has been going on for two months. When I was on the town council, we discussed things for sometimes two years, one year. If we want to place a house on top of the hill, that could be a three year ordeal. So, why are we rushing this so much? I think this should go on the ballot. You guys should, with the other side who's proposing this, everybody come up with their arguments for and against keep the police department the way it is now um don't defund it or present the new idea 
and let our people vote on it. I mean, that's kind of how this is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be rammed down a public who right now is just dealing with COVID. It's kind of not even principled the way it's happening. So um, I think that uh, the best way to handle it is fair and square. Put something on the ballot at some point and let the public decide. They just decided a year ago, and I understand there's more than just the police, but believe me, when they when they run these campaigns, it's always about police and fire. They don't say, oh, by the way, there's going to be a little more recreation for the kids. It might be in the language, but it's always they're always pumping and pushing for upgrading the police service to 24-7 um, dispatch and all that. Also keep in mind the dispatch brings in money because they service other towns too. So there is some income coming in at the dispatch level. But anyway, um, by the way, you're talking to someone who 20 years ago was interested in merging police departments. I proposed 20 years ago. Um, Mike, your time is... Okay, well, I'm going to wrap it up. So bottom line is this, is that put it on the ballot again and be very clear as to what people are voting for and see where the chips fall. I'm for what the public wants, but not what just one group wants. I want to see what the whole town thinks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Richard, followed by Brian Poindexter, and after that, Mimi Newton. Richard, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm disappointed to hear what's borderline reactionary perspectives tonight. Um, uh, you know, if we're going to just uh, call things out and say let's put it to a vote, let's put everything to a vote. We don't have to have a council then to decide things for us. Let's bring every major issue and put it on the ballot. I got many, many things that I got strong opinions about that I'm not getting to vote on. So I'm sorry that it's uncomfortable for a lot of people who've been in this town a long time. Uh, some that I know, some that I'm friends with that I'm hearing tonight uh, that are having this kind of uh, what feels to me like a reactionary reaction about any ability to have a new way of thinking, to understand the historical moment, to somehow think that Fairfax is exonerated, that uh, we're, we're not a problem case, uh, uh, we're, we're not the harsh inner city with KKK members running our police. That's not what's the conversation is and something is being missed here and uh, I'm not formally a member of rethink but you know they've been uh, they've, they've sent a, a very well thought out and reasoned document to the council they've been speaking from it and reading from it tonight and they brought up some really really powerful and very interesting uh, points about you know what our needs are and so the the conversation is about new ways of thinking there's a word alternative now public safety alternative and no one's saying let's just uh, end police or end uh, the needs of the town. They're saying maybe it's time to look at it from some new lenses and some new perspectives and to shift some things. And it's not an unreasonable thing to say if we have the highest percentage of budget for our police in a town where we only have, if it's really true that we only have seven violent episodes a year on average, uh, these are reasonable things to bring up. And it's an election year. Three of you are running again. You know, really think about this because this this is a critical moment in this town and uh, people are paying attention to this. And so they're recommending 5%. I don't know what's right, but um, I'm very concerned. Joe brought a lot of things up in the beginning about um, the Measure F stuff, the Oversight Committee not being there. And it's just, it's just troubling. And so maybe it's time to, uh, I understand you need to get things done, but I don't know, think really carefully. And I really hope you'll really think long and hard and deliberate on this tonight about what, what you should be voting on tonight and uh, and how to move forwards. And everyone's thanking you for the progress and taking it seriously. And you are, I thank you as well. But um, uh, many of Rethink's uh, analysis and recommendations are resonating. And um, uh, I think it's an extremely important topic. And uh, uh, we have to, we, we can't just keep going along as usual. I don't think that that's, that's acceptable. And if if some citizens want to challenge it and say, well, maybe that's a small percentage of the town and you put it to a vote, then let's put everything to a vote. Because I got, I, I, I think there's a lot of things around here that would benefit from a vote. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Next is Brian Poindexter, followed by Mimi Newton. Hello, Town Council. 
And thank you, Richard. Really loved your comments. I just want to respond very briefly to one of the comments earlier that encouraged the activists here in Fairfax to soften the lines. They repeated a story that's become also pretty common on these calls, which is that we have an excellent police department. And by many measures, I think that's absolutely true. What is equally true for any citizens that are actually attending things like the listening uh, council that we had recently is that people of color feel threatened by our police department, which means that even an excellent police department does not create a sensation of safety for people of color. I think that's the truth that we have to proceed from. And so when I look at the allocation of Measure F and 400,000 of it, I'm rounding up, goes to police and 40,000 goes to public works and public safety allocations. And you have a 10 to one split of just those resources to a police force that tends to make white people feel safe versus one part to programs that might actually help us to address the racial disparity of this town. That's what we're really dealing with. And if you think about the proposed budget in that contest, uh, it just doesn't seem like very much of a rethink based on what we're hearing so far. Uh, the personnel levels stay the same. The service levels stay the same. And if the service levels and personnel levels stay the same, where are we going to get funds to move public safety efforts outside of the purview of police? Where are we going to get funds to pay for non-armed and differently trained professionals to be responding to uh, issues that arise in the community. So I think that we need much more of a rethink on the budget issues. We need to put service levels on the table and we need to put staffing levels on the table before I as a citizen of this town feel comfortable moving forward with the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, next speaker is Mimi Newton, followed by Elias Karkabi. Hi, Council. Um, Hi, Mimi. Uh, speaking as a resident this evening, and I uh, don't want to repeat a lot of the things that I've said at other Council meetings. Um, <clears throat> I echo much of what uh, Deborah Benson said earlier. Um, and I'm encouraging you all to differentiate uh, the reality and the nuance of our budget for our police from the hyperbole uh, that I hear from some people tonight. Um, I don't think it's fair to compare our budget to the budgets of other uh, towns or jurisdictions in Marin County, given uh, the fact that we have our own police force. And I trust that uh, you all have the ability to uh, parse through those distinctions and make comparisons uh, that make sense as opposed to broad brushstrokes. Um, my impression is that many people of color in our town actually feel more threatened by our citizenry and some of the um, you know, attitudes of the white and entitled residents of this county more so than the police um, here in Fairfax. And I also do believe that, uh, you know, from a big picture perspective, we need to focus on addressing 
issues that we are currently relying on the police to address. But I think we can't put the cart before the horse. We need to first look at what's realistic and reasonable in terms of addressing mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, homelessness, the lack of affordable housing, the lack of housing for our workforce, all these issues before we start peeling funds away from the police department who we are now relying on to address many of those concerns. Um, and I think that we can be creative and come up with ways that aren't necessarily putting professional uh, you know, mental health professionals in harm's way by asking them to respond uh, to domestic violence situations or uh, drug and alcohol related um, scenarios. And those can be very dangerous. And so I really encourage us not to uh, do things out of order. Thanks. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, next speaker, please. Next is Elias Karkabi, and that's the last speaker. Okay. Hi, good evening. Um, I would like to first address the, uh, the issue of the Measure F Oversight Committee. Um, I'm a little taken aback that it would be possible to um, pass budget issues that were supposed to be overseen by the Measure F Oversight Committee um, without having the uh, Oversight Committee convene and deliberate on that. Uh, so I wanna support uh, the, the comments made by uh, Rethink Police um, that we really need to see oversight um, for how Measure F is spent and any budgeting issues related to that. I'm also um, pretty dismayed about what I've been hearing um, with regard to using Measure F to uh, argue that Fairfax uh, strongly supports the police department um, because 80% of the Fairfax population or 80% of the voters in Fairfax voted for Measure F. Um, Measure F was about a lot of things and police was only one of them. I think that was uh, stated quite elegantly by uh, Joe McGarry. There were five issues um, in Measure F that were to be funded, including the fire department. So people voting for Measure F were not voting strictly to fund the police. Um, I would like to see 5% of the police budget go to fund the Res J committee. I think that $100,000 um, just simply is tokenistic. We're looking at making a big change um, to our town, and that involves bringing in consultants to um, help determine how we can improve our social, social services, um, all kinds of stuff. We need stipends for people to be on the, uh, on the Res J committee. Uh, as one town council member said earlier this evening, you know, people join uh, committees because they really care about issues. Well, that might be true if you're middle class, but it's not true if you're working class. Because if you're working class, you don't have an extra two hours every day or even once a month to go and, you know, work on something, you know, and you probably have to prepare for, for, for that meeting. But you can't because you're driving Uber, you're picking your kids up from school, okay? So stipends mean participation, and they mean participation for mainly BIPOC people. Right, so if we give people money to come to the to come and sit on the Res J committee, that means that we can support voices in Fairfax that have been marginalized because they don't have an extra two hours, even you know, once a month. Now, I I also want to. Um, make a statement on 
a, a lot of voices that I've heard from Fairfax saying they've never seen the Fairfax police act, act racistly. I'm hearing a lot of people who don't identify as people of color saying that they've never observed the police act racistly. I would really strongly urge those people to talk to a cross section of the people of color who work in Fairfax and can't afford to live here and get their opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, next speaker. Next is Chance Cutrano, followed by uh, Jackie Bloom, who, who's already spoken, but maybe it's somebody else on her line. Okay. So, Chance? Yes, uh, good evening, Council. Um, thank you again for uh, you know, taking the time to, to really think through this. And thank you to, to Garrett and also uh, Chief Morin for putting your heads together through consultation and trying to come up with some dollars for this Res J committee and that, uh, what I'm calling the, that PIPSA subcommittee. Um, yeah, I, you know, uh, I recognize there's a lot of uncertainty right now. You know, this is, a uh, trying to keep the budget, uh, similar, uh, as we're moving forward and not rock the boat too much. I actually, tend to agree with Mike insofar as I believe that there are systems in place in government like these budget workshops and these check-ins in October and March, et cetera, that allow us to pivot and, and continue to see how the pandemic plays out and allows us to figure out how we're going to shift do dollars around moving forward and, and figure out what's the most efficient budget and, you know, looking at at this with your uh, fiduciary responsibility you all have for managing our tax dollars. Uh, and I hope everybody continues to participate in that. I hope Deborah participates and Mike and council, everyone. I hope everybody's there for those discussions because all of your voices matter in that. Uh, one thing that I'm troubled with right now is Joe mentioning this oversight committee has not met for so long. I think there's a an unfortunate correlation between when the police budget in, in 2015 was, you know, around 2.8 million and it slowly moved up in this proposed budget to uh, almost an additional million dollars. I recognize things get more expensive, but um, I think there's that that's the value that comes with an oversight committee that's functioning, right? It not only creates clear duties and improves effectiveness, but it also engages with policy and, and definitely critiques the budget proposals and the use of those measure F funds or those other municipal funds in order to improve service outcomes in, in the most efficient way with those dollars. And I think without that oversight committee functioning, you know, you could see how a business as usual budget moves forward and things just kind of happen the same way that they happen without any question for what Brian's pointing out, where you have a 10 to one differential between youth and, uh, you know, age friendly services compared to policing services. I'm not saying that's the, that's a, you know, the wrong split, but I'm saying if there's no oversight committee, uh, there's no way to question why that split is the way it is. Uh, I recognize that staff probably produces a report, but I think the point still stands. And so uh, I would love clarification from, from staff on that as well. I, my understanding is they don't need to have that oversight committee, but I think there should be some real transparency around why that committee hasn't been formed because it weighs heavy on the increase in the police budget and it weighs heavy on the public clearly that is so concerned. Yes, things can't move quickly or, you know, th everything can't move as quickly as we want it to, but when there are these cries for justice, uh, I think we, it's, you know, we are really responsible uh, as community members and community leaders to step up and hear those, those calls for justice and, and make the changes that we need to make as swiftly as possible. So thank you all. Thank you, Chance. Uh, do we have any more speakers? I do not see any more speakers. Okay, 
Um, so Garrett, did you have something to say? You just popped in. Yeah, I was just going to indicate if the speakers are done, I'd like to ask if you have any more questions for the chief, because I really like to let him get some sleep before he has to report to work at whatever, six or seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, counsel. I'm good. Yeah, chief, thank you. Thank you very much for being on here all night. Thanks for being available. And uh, I hope you get <clears throat> I hope you get some sleep. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, good night. Uh, so bringing it back to council, um, we have heard so, so much. And I wonder if anyone would like to begin to uh, move us toward, uh, you know, our, where we need to move tonight and would like to share some thoughts or raise some issues. We need to start this discussion. Well, I, I have a few thoughts. Okay. Unless someone wants to go first. No, go um, for it. Well, one thought, just I wanted to put out that the measure F, um, my, my understanding, maybe this is a question for Garrett, but um, tell me if this is more or less accurate that when we say that Measure F, one of the things that Measure F did was to fund police. What it was basically doing was funding the difference between what it would cost Fairfax to not have its own police department and have something like CMPA, Central Marin Police, um, versus having our own police, our own dispatch, and a 24-7, you can walk in there anytime, day or night, and talk with the dispatcher what we've got in Fairfax, which the Fairfax has chosen that for many, many, many years to, to have that, but it costs more. So is Measure F roughly funding that difference for that choice, that we're paying for that choice? Is right. that so uh, Measure F does clearly, we know that. Right, so Measure F does clearly, you know, it, it pays for, I'm reading off of Measure F that, 24/7 staffing of police in the fire department. Yeah. So it clearly it clearly does that enables it so that obviously you can afford to do that. I don't know if you could say it specifically funds that gap, but it clearly is a large portion of that funding. And if we did talk about the Measure F Oversight Committee, you know, right now it's just looking at the data for how much we actually funded for police and you know, it, it ranges from in fiscal year 15, 16 was 384. This year we're saying 378. Last year was 310. And, and I would say that the funding for Measure F for PD of how we allocate it always depends on that revenue projection for that year. So in, in certain years when we anticipate uh, revenues will max expenditures and there may be revenues will exceed expenditures, then we can alloc we allocate more Azure F to other projects and programs because we other have other sources to fund police and fire and other operations. So it just varies somewhat year to year. When you look at the data though, you could see how it how it varies. But the reality is it's it's roughly about your 10% of your police budget. It doesn't really equate to increases of PD over time. Um, the increases in PD over time, a lot of that are related to retirement costs. Mm -hmm. This doesn't keep up with that because you may remember your measure, measure F, measure J, were all set at a certain level. It was only recently where um, we actually, the voters voted for the $5 increase per unit per year. But previously it was set at a lower amount, 125, and then it went to 195 because it included the general, the general, uh, whatever that called, general municipal tax. We wrapped that into it, it had a slight increase. So you go through it historically, you could just see that how the numbers match up. And that's, you know, people want to really do that, then obviously we, we can. Mm -hmm. Oops, yeah. sorry, okay. we can do that. Sorry, I got cut off again. Thanks. Can I well, just add the, something before you? That. That. Can, I, can I just add something? So mm -hmm. I ran the Measure F campaign, and I also ran the Measure J campaign with Larry Bragman for his last year on the council. Um, 
it's a special purpose tax. So it required more than 62 thirds to pass. And it was very clear up front that the big chunk of that, even though we never said X amount versus Y amount, the big chunk of that would be for public safety, which would be pub, uh, police and fire. And we always committed to that. And we did add the other items, um, which were never, we never discussed when we talked to the public about the, the um, expenditures as being, you know, a huge amount, but it would fund some of that. And, and the measure only brings in about 775000 a year, and we don't know what it'll be when property taxes go down. But I also want to say it did pass last time at nearly 81%. The previous time, I think it was 74%. And I will say for folks who feel very strongly that maybe they voted for fire, they didn't vote for police, that may very well be true, but I will tell you, it wouldn't have passed. If people were very much not supportive of the police, it wouldn't have passed at 81%. It certainly probably wouldn't have passed at all. So just, you know, I have walked the walk on this for a few years. I also ran the Measure C for the sales tax. And so I have a little bit more knowledge of kind of the ins and outs. But Garrett's absolutely correct. It doesn't fund that gap. It just, it helps us to be able to be open 24-7. The only police department that you can walk into 24-7 of any place in Marin County. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll uh, I just I'll make a general comment here that, and then that's this is all I have to say on this on this uh, on this item. But I think that we it's we've taken a hunt and I really appreciate, and it sounds like many of the listeners, many of the, the people who've commented really appreciate the efforts on the part of, of Garrett and Chief Morin to find a way to put substantial funding into the ResJ to get the ResJ off to a really good start. I, the Climate Action Committee has, has never had $100,000. Um, this is a good thing to be able to start this committee off with a budget and a facilitator and staff support and the ability to actually do some surveys or whatever. This is a good thing. The That doesn't mean we're done. The committee is, we're just still trying to form the committee. We're still working on that level. Once the committee has had some time to meet, Hopefully the committee will come up with some ideas and that's where we start talking about what, how we implement those ideas. So I think what we need to do, this is my opinion right now, what we need to do is to pass the budget that we have before us, which we've already made the, the we've already made it possible to fund the ResJ to start with. And I think that it's important to keep the town, this is a well-managed town, and I just want to point out that we are in better shape than many of the other towns in, in our area with, in the situation that we're in right now, where we're really in, in a bad economic situation, but our town is, is doing fairly well through it. And that is because we've got a well-managed town. We've got a we've we've made intelligent decisions all the way along. We have you know, thanks a great deal to Garrett and to Michael and to the the uh, the staff of this town, but thanks also to this council and the citizens that we have made intelligent decisions all the way through the years. And we've got we we're getting through this period with less pain than some of the other towns around our area. That has a lot to do with the fact that we have a, we are, what Garrett needs in order to do his work is to have stability, a budget, some sort of idea of where he's going. 
And that's what he's asking for, that we not put off for the better part of a year, giving him a budget that allows him to operate for the year. It, he said in the staff report that we've, we've recently changed financial systems. So we now have this software that we need to enter the budget into. This is how we keep track of things. This is how staff knows what they're doing and manages to do it right. And that's, I think we owe them that to do it. So I think what we should do is pass the budget so that we're, because what we're doing, it's not like the town ends when we don't have the budget. This isn't Newt Gingrich on the, on the national level saying we're going to hold the whole country hostage by refusing to pass a bill. What happens in reality is life goes on. Fairfax continues to happen. All the expenditures keep happening, but Garrett and the staff are operating on last year's budget, which isn't really what we've decided to do. And in fact, under the present financial conditions, we can't continue to do it. And so it just is taking away their ability to have a, an orderly way of keeping track of things. So let's do that. And let's understand that going forward, and this year we're going to have reviews sooner than we normally do in any case, but going forward, the discussion is only beginning now on the ResJ and in this community about rethinking whatever we want to rethink. And as we rethink it, if we come up with things that seem like they really make sense, then that's where they'll go into the budget. But to arbitrarily say, let's cut the budget when we haven't yet figured out how we're going to cut the budget, certainly haven't figured it out in a collective way. Maybe somebody has it in their mind, but in a collective way, we def definitely have not decided what we're going to do to change how policing happens or anything else in town. Let's take the $100,000 that we've got to begin that discussion and begin that discussion. And meanwhile, let's have the budget that we actually we're having anyway, but let's put it down on paper, put it into the computer and be able to actually orderly operate in an orderly fashion as a town and continue to support our staff in, in continuing to manage this town well. So that's, I, I just don't, I think it's, it makes no sense to say that we should continue to not have a budget. It, we do have a budget. It just is chaotic and there's no reason for it to be chaotic. Let's do it right. So that's my comment, if it makes any sense. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. John? Yeah. Um, that is what this agenda item is, is passing the budget and, and <clears throat> looking at Measure F oversight or whatever. Um, so a lot of people, I mean, the public comments started going that way and people have addressed that. Um, I also, yeah, I, I think it's very important to pass this budget, um, you know, and it's basically, uh, you know, a set of guide. that's what our budget is, is a set of guidelines so that town staff knows which way we're going and we can behave accordingly. And, you know, since we don't know what our revenues are going to be looking like with the, as a result of COVID, you know, that's why, you know, it's great to come circle back around in, in uh, the mid-year review in March. Um, you know, I think it's excellent to, that we've been able to fund this committee, um, you know, with, with this 100,000 from now, which I think is, you know, it says good things about our police chief and Garrett looking to see where they can get that money from. Um, and who knows? I mean, there's been years that we have, you know, as the chief said, you know, there, we, there's been years that where we had to, you know, just roll with whatever punches come along. We don't know whether somebody's going to get sick or hurt. And, you know, that involves overtime costs that we, we don't know whether that'll happen. Some years they have, some years they don't. But um, as long as so many comments have been made around Measure F and things like that, I mean, I was around when Measure L, which was the first time that this tax was going, and I worked in support of that and it failed. It was limited just to filling the budget gap with police and fire, and that was it. Uh, that was the what it was stated on the ballot measure, and it got 
a majority. I think he got 58% or something like that, but that wasn't two thirds because it was a special purpose tax. Um, and it, it wasn't that there was a big discussion then. And Mike Garangelli was, um, where I see he's here listening, you know, he's a big proponent of, uh, outsourcing our, uh, you know, going with, well, at that point it was combining with San Anselmo. Uh, but you know, it's kind of the, the, approach that San Anselmo ended up taking is basically jobbing out their police force. What you lose when you do that is oversight on your police force. I mean, when you are one of many different towns that all share the services of a police department, you become very small in terms of what you can say, and they have a lot of a lot more to say. And, and our community policing model would not exist if we were to job out that. And I was a big proponent of keeping our police here and 24 seven as we have. Um, and, you know, I'm glad about it because I think we have a good community policing model, um, you know, and there's always room for improvement in any situation, but I think we've got a pretty good place to start. And, um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, the, the model that a lot of other cities are looking to emulate probably looks a lot like Fairfax, to be honest, um, where we have a diverse police force and, you know, a, a truly kind of human approach. Um, and I'll, let me just say one more thing. And, and like a lot of the things that, that until I move back, just totally under the budget thing, um, just looking at the types of services that are needed that the police do um, and mentally, you know, and when people talk about reallocating money towards different things that are mental health is one of the things that comes up quite a bit. Um, a mental health professional is not going to show up in a violent, potentially violent situation unless it's checked out by somebody who has the wherewithal to quell that situation or make sure that it's safe. And, uh, you know, maybe they're accompanied by a police officer, you know, or maybe that police officer is there first. Um, you don't know, but basically that's one of the things that is going to get worked through with the, the committee, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but in terms of the budget here, I think this is a good placeholder budget I, as a way for us to go forward and, you know, know where we are right now. And I think it funds uh, the uh, initiating this committee, which is what a lot of people are asking for. And I think it's, it's a really good thing that we need to do right now. Um, so I am for this budget item, passing it as it is. So thanks. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, who wants to go next? If anyone has anything to say. Stephanie, no? Barbara? I already no. shared my comments. You shared your comments. Um, okay. So you'd be ready for an emotion? You don't want to say anything prior to the emotion to the motion? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I'm just going to, to add first, I, I think uh, a budget process like we've been through, which I think has been careful and very, um, very detailed and, uh, and has taken a lot of um, public input deeply to heart, at least I know myself as a council member. Um, it has also required a lot of hard work from staff. So before we even do anything, I really think that staff, we owe staff a huge debt of uh, gratitude for all the work. And if you look at the descriptions of their, of their work and their accomplishments and their goals for the coming year, their duties um, and responsibilities continue to grow. And they continue to, um, to uh, meet those goals um, and accomplish what in many situations, in many towns would not be accomplishable with the numbers um, and they're working long hours and 
I really, I paused, I started writing something for each staff member based on the pages in this budget that really describe what they do. So I, I, uh, I, I want to deeply, deeply uh, thank you all for the work that goes into making a town work like this. And the budget is its, is its roadmap. Um, it's skeleton where it gets filled in, where the muscles come and, and how things connect. And so um, what I see in the conversation being about what's happening with, um, with this, this social justice revolution, this movement, this, this new energy, this new power that's come that requires a place, it requires to be heard and it requires a seat at the table, which is uh, why we've spent so much time um, talking it's it's an it's it's a it's a door that has opened has opened uh wide and at this point um the ideas are just are just uh are just you know they're pouring and we've heard and established the res j and very much want to express gratitude to the chief for taking this seriously and for garrett for really driving it really understanding what's needed and being part of the world as it is today and not saying Fairfax isn't part of that world and we don't have to do this because we're all set. It, it has been very much, uh, um, uh, this Res J money is testament to, uh, to Garrett and the Chief's hard work to find it with a lot of push. But um, this is where we start. And the idea of taking money um, in any of the sums that I've heard people asking for, um, uh, it, it, it needs a process behind it. And it needs a really good hard look and study from a group such as what we are putting together in the Res J and in the, um, in the subcommittee to look at um, rethinking public safety. So prior to that, taking money from somewhere without having done the homework and the really careful research that needs to happen and with the public process, as Mike Garangeli said, you know, we need to know from the people, from all the people, before we make any types of big decisions about taking money that changes service levels that we have historically had and that has historically served us, understanding not all of us. But my point is, is that this budget represents an excellent start. Um, I see the work of the committee as finding what is needed and then finding out how we're going to pay for what is needed and, um, and doing the work that it might take to get it. So um, at this point in time, I, I, I concur with what Bruce said, really well said, that, um, that this is going to allow this town to keep being managed um, in the careful way that it has been and has gotten us to the point where we're in pretty good shape and that's not to say that the work that's been brought forth by this um, movement um, is, uh, it, 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 to, to me, it's, it, it's out in front, it's guiding, it's the guiding light, but we have to do it carefully and we have to find the money when we know where we want to, uh, to use it. So anyway, I, um, I just wanted to express my gratitude and to the public for continuing to show up. This is a process. This is a transactional piece that will lead to something transformational. And I really do, do believe this. Um, so thank you all for participating. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Mayor? Yes. I would like to move adoption of the resolution adopting the operating and capital improvement budgets for fiscal year July 1st, 2020 through July, June 30th, 2021, which is fiscal year 2020-21, and providing for the appropriation expenditures in said budgets and repealing all resolutions in conflict herewith. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so um, we have a motion, Reed, and a second, Ackerman. Uh, Council Member Kohler? Aye. Council Member Hellman? Council Member Hellman? You're I muted. said aye, I said aye, sorry. Uh, Council Member Reed? Aye. Vice Mayor Ackerman? 
Aye. Uh, and myself, I uh, I say aye. Uh, so the motion carries. All right. This is so what time is it? We have now uh, passed eleven thirty in a big way. So oh, it's yeah. twelve fifteen, and um, I think we have the eleven thirty rule. Um, just a question I have, and. I think we have the GAN initiative that I think we need the finance manager here for. Is that at all? That was supposed to be, that yeah. I, I mean, we, you know, we have promised to get to, um, to number nine, which we continued around Measure F. Um, I, I don't think number nine is going to take us that long. We've already covered off on a lot of it. Let's just get through it. Okay. okay. Can, can we possibly move after item nine, item 13, and then do the uh, item 11, just so that Mike Devret at some point could go to bed? We already did 11. So we're just going to do nine at this point, and then we're going to no, do number. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the business recovery thing. I've got my papers mixed up. Yeah, we'll keep that till the end. We're, we're going to do number nine now, and then we'll do the GAN initiative, and then we'll we'll close with uh, number 16. Okay, um, I'll make a motion to that effect. Okay. Sounds good. Somebody want to second that? I don't think it sounds good yeah. as a second. Second. Okay, do we need this motion, no. Garrett? Janet? Okay. Uh, so we have motion Kohler and a second read. Uh, uh, Council Member Hellman. Aye. Council Member Kohler. Aye. Council Member. Oh, I forgot who I asked. Uh, Vice Mayor Ackerman. Aye. And myself. Aye. John, did I ask you? Aye. Yeah. I'll move okay. on. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, you're anyway. so let's continue. Um, and uh, we're gonna. We're going to take up number nine, which is to amend the membership of Measure F, uh, which is the special municipal tax. Um, so this, I'm sorry, the, the membership of Measure F Oversight Committee to add two citizen members. Uh, Garrett. Sure, right. I think, as you indicated, we did talk about a lot of this during the budget, but right. as you measure special municipal tax of $195 per residential a commercial unit, it was just uh, passed, the renewal was passed in 2019. Uh, the measure did con continue to contain the original measure from 2005, which is that it maintained the Citizen Oversight Committee. The report actually quotes what it actually says, and it says uh, that the passage measure very asked for the purpose of monitoring the use of the special tax revenues in accordance with the section. In our mind, monitoring means you're monitoring that the uses are made in accordance to what the regulations allowed, not so much on the allocations. That's a town council um, a discussion. But that being said, originally an oversight committee consisted of seven citizens, two council members. As, as we had indicated previously, uh, we found when we tried to call a meeting, you know, the citizen reps weren't interested, they couldn't make it or uh, just didn't show up. So really it's just the council members. We tried to meet again, and really it was just the council members and maybe the treasurer one time. And then what I recall, we tried to actually fill the positions. Uh, there really was no interest. So the suggestion was in August of 2019, last year, prior to renewal, was that perhaps the council to ensure the oversight committee could continue to meet despite the lack of interest at that time, that we reconstitute the membership. And so you have the two council members, elected treasurer, the past treasurer, two members of committees. And the thought pattern was, we can get all those people to attend the meeting if we wanted to for the oversight committee. But our take was when we looked at historically the data, it's always in the budget in fund 20, how we allocate the money, it shows previous allocations. And like I said, last year, we actually showed a discussion with the council in May over how it was all allocated. And a quick look at the numbers shows, typically between police and fire, that's between 75 and 80% measure F, measure J, and pre precursors to that have always gone to police and fire. Now, so probably because we have all that data historically, probably wasn't much interest in having the oversight committee meet. However, 
Councilmember Hellman indicated that now perhaps there are people interested in applying. And so we thought it'd be good. Go ahead and add two citizen members. If you do that, ultimately, then your committee will become eight. Previous committee was nine, so it's about the same. Uh, you would just go through your normal application process. They would apply, you interview them, and you would appoint people to this committee. So that's the staff report. Okay, great. Any questions for Garrett? Well, I, I just want to clarify that. So you, this month you had members of the open space and the volunteer board appointed, is that right? A volunteer board appointed someone, Park will appoint someone, I think their meeting's next week, so it'll be next week. Okay. And then what we're voting on now is to open it up to two additional community members. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any, what, it, what, which is how it looked before, but we just weren't getting the interest. Sure. Pre, yes. If you count other than the council members, everyone else being resident, yes, you would be close. Eight versus nine total. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a quick question. Um, so the question of what an oversight committee does, which came up in one of the comments, I'm just wondering, is it, is it, and forgive me for not knowing this, but is it codified what the, what it is that the oversight count, what the oversight committees do, the citizens oversight committee? Is that something that we, I understand it's not this discussion, but is that something that can be uh, brought to council to discuss what it is that an oversight committee does in, in, in the, you know, in, in our local context? The ordinance or what was voted in the ordinance just says the oversight committee uh, will monitor the use of the special tax revenues. It just uses the word monitor. It doesn't do anything else. If the council wanted to create an oversight committee and give it more purpose or responsibility, that's strictly up to the council. Uh, um, Garrett, any if I may. Case, oh, sorry, go ahead. It needs to stay in keeping with the ballot language. The ballot, the ballot language didn't have anything on there about it. It had the fact that there would be an oversight committee. Yeah, but it didn't say specifically what the role and scope of the committee <laughs> is. I believe we read it monitor, not yes. it monitor. So that is different than something broader than that. So my question is, can it be added to. I understand what we're doing that right you now. I want to know if we're uh, talking about the Measure J Oversight Committee, is it stuck in just monitor or can it be a discussion, uh, a council discussion going forward if we would like our oversight committees to have more responsibility than monitoring? Or It needs to stay in keeping with the ballot language. Having said that, um, you can clarify, I suppose, but it needs to stay within the plain reading of the ballot language because that's what the people voted on. Okay, the, the ballot language just said that there would be a citizens oversight committee. That's what I'm getting confused about. No, it said Garrett, it would monitor. monitor. Yeah, so Garrett read the language. Monitoring, yeah. So it, it's to monitor. The question okay. is, what does monitor mean? My suggestion and what Janet is saying is typically when you have a committee, they could monitor. If that committee wants to make a suggestion to the council, hey, we'd like you to allocate it this way. There is no rule that they can't say something to the council. Um, but ultimately, it's the council decision on how you allocate right. that funding. I mean, that's, that's, correct. that's pretty clear. And the reality is it, it's not a lot. It's 10% of the PD budget historically, maybe even, you know, you'd have to look between police and fire. It's usually 75, 80%. Um, what you need to keep in mind is if you believe police services should be maintained at a certain level, like the current level, then what would happen is if you reallocated your measure F, measure J, to other 
activities that are eligible, that would be fine. But if you want to maintain police services, you would have to reallocate other resources to make up that funding gap. Yeah, I'm sorry. Darren, I want to interrupt. You know, I'm it, sorry. I really disagree with that. We committed to the voters up front. Police and fire were up front. Those other things were peripheral. And I strongly believe, and Barbara Petty and I ran that last time, I strongly believe that if you want to change that and fill that hole with some other money, you need to go back to the voters. I mean, I made a commitment when I ran that campaign. And I would also say this, last year when I asked to reconstitute this committee, because I've been on it, and I think we met once when it was Measure J or something, um, I, I talked to Barbara Petty, who'd been on it for some time. And she said, basically, they would meet in September and just make sure that the monies were allocated in accordance to what was committed to the voters. So I strongly disagree that you could say, oh, we're just going to spend $5,000 on the police budget or $20,000 or $100,000. I think that's a big leap from what we committed to the voters. But, but I... I Point well taken. I, I'm just, I, just to clarify, I really didn't mean that conversation to ensue from my question. I, I just wanted to know, uh, because in all of my time, I've wanted a more clarifying definition of what a citizen's oversight committee does, because I know we have one attached to all of our tax measures. So I'm wondering if there's room for us to flesh that out to further define it. Um, and I'm not asking for things to be changed around as has promised to the voters in Measure F. I, for whatever it's worth, I, my assumption, and I, I can't, certainly I'm no expert on this, and I didn't write this language, and I didn't oversee the campaign, but what I've always understood in hearing about the Oversight Committee and hearing people talk about it, like Gary Graham, I think, was on it a long time ago, and you know, that the basic idea was to just make sure that after we, the taxpayers, have voted to take money out of our pocket and use it for X, Y, and Z, that it gets used for X, Y, and Z. So that's it. It's not saying the details of how X, Y, and Z are done. It's just making sure that that money didn't get used for W or or. P or Q instead of X, Y, and Z, that it got used for the things that it was supposed yeah, to be used. It, I'm responding to the fact that, that people people have asked for more oversight. So I want to know how that can be right. uh, defined. That is another agenda item, which we could bring at a later time. Yeah. So for now, we, yeah, we're going to... Word let's oversight. Yeah, the word oversight can mean a whole lot of different things to a whole lot of different people. And I think in the context of Measure F, the tax measure says monitor, and it's basically, I think what Bruce just described is making sure the money goes towards what people voted for it to go towards. And when I earlier referred to Measure L, which just had police and fire, both had shortfalls in their budget, and that Measure L was the attempt to make up the difference. And it got 58% and, you know, failed at 58% because it needed 67 um, then we went back and added safe routes to schools, uh, you know, infrastructure projects for sidewalks, crosswalks, things like that, um, youth programs, and trails uh, going through the woods and, and in between streets. And that passed. And so that was, you know, I think it may have been called it was either Measure S or it was Save Fairfax. I think it was uh, the name of the the campaign. And I think it was Measure F at that time. I lose track of all the letters because it changes every every uh, time it's back up. But um, but that's basically what it was. It's like, okay, we need we have a budget shortfall. We need to make make these things whole, and we need to do it for what people want. And what people want was you know, carefully crafted in those, those campaign measures. And that's basically making, you know, public safety what got the lion's share of it. But part of public safety is kids walking to school, 
being able to, you know, walk through your neighborhoods with on the trails that are, are hopefully as functional as possible as you can do with that little money. And, uh, and I'm, I feel very fortunate and relieved that there's support from the council on doing that. So we've augmented that from different directions also. So I think that. Okay. That was great. If there, if there is support now from the public to, to, uh, be on this committee, that's great. So let's, let's expand it to these two seats. Mm -hmm. It does, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we get some good people on there. Uh, it's not an opportunity for the public to gut the police department. It's an oversight of measure F. So I should, I'd like to make that clear. And if we wanted to expand the responsibility, we would, we, Janet, did I hear you have to keep the language, but you can add language. You have to keep the monitoring language, mm -hmm. but. Janet? Yes, I, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, but as long as you, you keep have to, you have to keep in um, conformance with the ballot language with what the voters approved. And so uh, the interpretation of that, since it is such vague language, um, you'd have to make a determination that you're in keeping with the spirit and the the plain language, the plain meaning of the ballot language. Okay, thank you. All right, so we haven't gone out to the public. Oh dear, um, <laughs> sorry public. Already hands going up. There was a lot to understand. Okay, so um, please, uh, uh, Michelle, can we call on the public? And thank you for your patience. Yes, so I see two hands raised. First is Richard and then is Jackie Bloom. Hi, Council, uh, Richard here. So, um, you know, when I hear the attorneys speak, you know, you know, attorneys are sort of generally trying to stay risk averse and stay inside the lines. And I like the spirit of where the mayor was going, which was, could we get some clarification on what the spirit of oversight actually means? And I don't particularly care what it meant 10 years ago to previous people who were, who were there. I think we have an opportunity now to decide clearly with public calling in, clearly with uh, a lot of intense things happening in, in our town and in the world right now. Um, and, and let's not kid ourselves, there's been tension and acrimony between the public and the council over the last number of years. So a word like oversight is a, is a very fertile word. And I think that um, uh, where the mayor was kind of heading, which is could, could we maybe get some clarification? I think there's a way since the, town attorney has already said it's somewhat vague language that you guys have an opportunity here to qualify what an oversight committee actually could be about and what its purpose could be. It's far different than saying they're suddenly coming in to gut the police budget. That's not, nobody's suggesting that. So um, I would encourage you all to, to keep going in the direction that the mayor was, uh, was starting you off on and, and try to make this be a meaningful thing. To simply have a bunch of people show up and go, yeah, the money's gone where we said it's going to go, then why even have it? Because, I mean, that, that sounds pretty, pretty silly to me. So make it meaningful or don't, or don't bother with it and um, get some qualified people on there uh, from the public. And I think that's really important. I would also say that I heard a little bit of difference between Council Member Kohler and Council Member Reed's notion of how things evolved and whether it was just police centric and fire centric or whether it took other issues to get the public to get to the two thirds majority. So I think that's, that's worthy of note as well. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Jackie Bloom. Hi, um, this is Joe McGarry. Uh, Joe, one second, please. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Garrett, can I have the timer please? I just don't want to look at my phone. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I won't be long. So I, and just in looking at the language of the measure, you know, it, we're, we're defining what monitor is, that leaves us open to what is enhancing youth and senior programs. Enhancing the word to me means, you know, that there would be some growth there over the years. There's been no growth. Funding public works, what does that mean? 
What does even maintaining 24 hour service mean for the police department? So, you know, I, I, as, as, as Rich, Ricky just said, I think this is an opportunity to, to provide some transparency in an area that frankly hasn't had transparency for the last half decade or even longer. And while there may have been intent to, to, uh, for it to be, um, you know, for the fire and police, that might have been the intent, or I think the words were, that's what we gave to the public. Once again, it just let's revert back to what the measure says. And if, the, if, the, if that was the intent, then I think we would have broken it down by percentages within the measure that X percentage will go to police, X percentage will go to fire, X percentage will go to public safety works. But we didn't take those steps. So that's things have kind of been opened up a little bit. And I think that it's it's okay to have some citizens in there and take a look and ask some questions and ask why the, the Measure F funds grew at 10% rate this year. The police funds within Measure F grew at 10%, but the police funds or the, uh, the fire funds grew at 10%, but the police funds grew at 20%. And while the rest of the, uh, the services all remain stagnant, so those are things that deserve some uh, deserve some answers and that we should be entitled as citizens to ask questions about them because it doesn't really make sense to us. So um, I, I think it's an opportunity. Um, it's obvious that the, you know, the citizens feel that there hasn't been transparency there. So let's, let's turn it over and, and, and allow some questioning and allow, allow some citizens to take a look. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, do we have more speakers, Michelle? Yes. The next speaker is Chance Cutrano. Okay. Hi. Good morning, Council. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, I tend to uh, agree with um, Joe in in terms of the the questioning, but it's clear that I think Council's main objective uh, moving forward is to potentially add some folks, some members of the public to this committee. Uh, it sounds like for a time that there was an interest, perhaps this is a, a, a great opportunity uh, to get some, some new folks, some new energy onto this oversight committee to see how it functions. I serve on a, a subcommittee for another measure and it has been fantastic to see how all of that gets hashed out and how those discussions take place. And to not have a committee that is doing that for this particular measure, even if, it, even if monitoring just checks on, on the quality or the progress, or it examines, or it studies, or it notes things for council in its advisory capacity, I think those are really healthy things to do. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing it, if, members of the public do want to take on that responsibility. Because again, I think all of these things are great leadership opportunities for people who are moving into uh, more community engagement roles and more volunteer roles with the town, which is what we need. So uh, yeah, I, I'm in support of, the, of adding a couple citizens on it. And I'd, I'd really appreciate some clarification from council and staff on, on what monitoring could mean. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chance. Uh, next, next sorry. And the next speaker is Elias Karkabi, followed by Deborah Benson. Uh, hi, council members. Uh, thank you for staying up so late. Um, I just want to um, support what uh, Joe McGarry said before me and, and, uh, and Chance that uh, it's very important that we have uh, members of the public on the, or more members of the public on the oversight committee for measure F. Um, there's language there that we should have an oversight committee. Um, it's certainly necessary um, for us to be looking at how money is partitioned between fire and police department. You know, that's a, that's a, an issue of the current times. Um, I don't think, it's possible for anybody here on the city council to say that they know what was in the mind of the voters when they were voting on measure F, whether they were voting on it for the police or the fire department. And I don't think it really matters. Um, I think the language 
of measure F is broad enough to leave it open for necessary interpretation. I think it was um, written with broad language for just that purpose so that it could be to some extent malleable um, and we could we could change it within certain parameters to meet uh, the needs uh, of the future when it was when it was drafted at the time. Um, so I do think that uh, we should be adding committee members from the public to the Measure F Oversight Committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Next is Deborah Benson. Deborah? Hmm. Um. <clears throat> Deborah? Um. There, well. there is no other speaker after Deborah. I'm not okay, sure. Well Let's bring it back to council and uh, if Deborah pops in, then we'll, we'll take her comment. Uh, council, any, any, any words? No. So what we have before us is to, is to add the two members. That's, that's, that's all we have. Yeah. Right I, I think we should do it. Okay. Before anyone makes a motion, I just want to say it's a, uh, it, it, we've, it's an exciting time we're in that this much interest has arisen to come forward and really want to take part in the public process. I mean, we've been asking for this for a very long time. So this, mm -hmm. you know, that this is uncomfortable. These are those times. And so I'm, I'm just grateful and I'm excited because uh, this is, this is what it's going to take. So yeah, anyway, I don't know that it's uncomfortable. I think it's a really good thing. Well, it's just uncomfortable because we have to dig into stuff that maybe hasn't been so dug into and needs digging. So well, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Um, I think if we can try to make some adjustments to our committee application per all the feedback we've been getting, that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to take a look at it and make some tweaks with whoever on staff can do that. Mm -hmm. And actually, Michelle? Yes. I'm just curious if um, our application is, uh, we, we people can download it on the website, they can download it in whatever language they want to, correct? That is correct. Okay, so the forms are translatable. Okay, good. Yes. Um, so would anyone like to make a motion? Sure. I would uh, make a motion to approve an amendment to Measure F Special Municipal Tax Oversight Committee to add two citizen members. Is there a second? I'll I second. second. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephanie. I second. Okay, so uh, motion read and uh, second Hillman. Uh, Council Member Kohler? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hillman? Aye. Vice Mayor Ackerman? Aye. And myself? Aye. So the motion carries. Um, and uh, Garrett, what, when can people uh, expect to be able to apply? Are we going to work on the form, on the application form, or shall we just have people, should we open the application period? Uh, it's up to council. You want to modify the form, we can modify the form, and we can create one online. I don't think there's a pressing demand um, to get it on there by this Friday. But we'll get it on there, say, next week, online form. can modify based on we want to have council member Hellman offer some suggestions, and people could apply. and. We'll see when we schedule time for council interviews. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so as promised, we will go on to, Michael, are you still here? 
I'm sorry. I am um, here. Good morning, yes. Michael. Okay, good we're morning. Gonna get, we're going to get there, you guys. So it's <laughs> item number 13. And um, this is uh, to adopt a resolution making certain findings and determinations in compliance with Section uh, 13B of the California Constitution, GAM initiative, and setting the appropriation limit for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. So take it away, Michael. Well, uh, the GAM limit is uh, something that we've w been watching closely because when we passed our three quarter cent uh, sales tax, uh, it did impact our calculation. And last year we were under our calculation by $161,000, which is, is, it's getting pretty close when you're talking $6 million of, uh, of appropriations. Uh, this year, because sales tax is projected to go down with the COVID-19 effects, it actually increased our uh, limit, uh, increased that gap so that the uh, amount that we're under gives us a little bit more of a safety factor of 419,000. So uh, there's a little silver cloud to the, uh, to the uh, COVID, uh, if you wanna look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are many communities in the area that have uh, gone over the limit. Uh, I used to work with Yontville and we regularly, because of the sales tax and transient occupancy tax up in that area, we regularly were well over the limit. But uh, if we ever do reach that point where we have, uh, uh, ha have that limit, uh, we are faced with two alternatives. One is to refund the tax to the citizens or uh, put an initiative on the uh, ballot to actually increase the uh, ability of the town legalizing uh, a percentage or a dollar amount that the town can uh, exceed that by, but we're not at that point yet. Okay, um, is, that, is that the whole staff report? So, well, the what I wrote is the guts. I try not to repeat. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions of Michael? So what's before us now is just to to resolve that that what you said is true that we're below the limit. It basically is is it starts with the uh, numbers that the finance department sent us, which is basically defining the population that we have, which is. Uh, currently, according to their calculation, less than 7,400. Uh, and they give us the amount that the um, inflation or CPI went up, which they calculated being 3.73%. And then uh, we, we do the calculation based on those factors. We can modify it by certain other factors, like we we can use the county's population increase rather than the town's population increase. Or if we had building in town, we could increase uh, as an alternative to the uh, CPI, personal income increase. Uh, but basically, we, we use their numbers and come up with a calculation. And then uh, you, you approve it, but it also gets looked at by the auditors when they come in and do the audit. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Uh, seeing none, would any no. member of, nope, would any member of the public like to speak? Yes, there is one hand up. Okay. It is Deborah Benson. Oh, is it about this I item or the last? Ask to unmute. Deborah? Hmm. I see you're muted. I've unmuted you. Do you have a mute button on your phone? If you're, well, it doesn't look like you've called in. Let's see.
is um how can I help you? Hmm. Deborah, it looks like your own microphone is muted. If you sort of hover somewhere over the Zoom uh, screen, either the bottom frame or the top of the frame, and look for a microphone, <laughs> click on it. She's made multiple comments. Yes, I know. Something must have. Something's different. Huh. Um, well. Uh, do you want to try calling in on a telephone? If you do, <laughs> can I read the number out? Maybe? Yeah, go. Yeah, please do. Okay, um, Deborah, get a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, I have to find the phone number. Call in is one six six nine nine zero seven eight one two eight. I'll repeat it: six six nine nine zero zero. 9128, and then it will ask for the meeting ID, and that is 893-8141-2598. You can see all this on the agenda if you have it in front of you or if you look at it on the town website. So this is very individualized service. <laughs> <laughs> you. Well, you know. Okay. Your tax dollars at work. Good question. Yes, Stephanie. Um, I'm a little surprised at the population numbers. Yeah, me too. Where'd everybody go? Um, are you? I, are you I'm not a hundred percent sure on how the Department of Finance comes up with their numbers. I, I did notice that they ended off with a starting, they ended off last year with a population of 7,721. And then when they came out with their uh, uh, numbers this year, they started with a population that was almost 300 people less. So they have, uh, you know, uh, they, they use many sources to come up with what their population is, but that's what the uh, absent, the census that's what our official population is um, they use building data other sources to be able to come up with uh, what the starting numbers are but the um, I noticed that uh, all the cities in Marin uh, showed a decrease in population for the starting numbers interesting mm. okay all right looks, you all I um, think we should move mayor, on look, it looks yeah. like uh, it looks, excuse me, this is Michelle, the clerk. Uh, it looks like Deborah might be uh, unmuted. Okay. You there, Deborah? Hi, I am. So sorry for the confusion. I uh, unplugged. And and this is about the last thing we were talking about, about the, the committee on Measure F. Um, I'm all for public input in government, as you all know, I'm sure. And uh, for a committee on the on the uh, distribution of funds, but the branding on this, whatever the language was, the branding, as Barbara said, was to support police and fire. And a lot of us don't have time to read the fine print in the language. So I voted for this measure F based upon supporting police and fire. And I think a lot of people did. And um, that's all I have to say on that. Thanks for taking me into uh, uh, the, the, the queue here out of, out of sorts. No <laughs> problem. For all you do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we need to go ahead and if there's no more questions or or comment, we can I could entertain a motion. I'll make the motion if that's all right. Please. I'd like uh, to make a motion to adopt a resolution determining the proposition for GAN appropriation limit calculation for fiscal year 2020 
2021-21, the town's fiscal year 2021 appropriations are estimated to be four, I don't know why I can't do this, 419,784 419, under the limit based on the fiscal year 2020-21 adopted budget. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion Kohler and a second Ackerman. Uh, Council Member Hellman? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Kohler? Aye. Vice Mayor Ackerman? Aye. And myself, aye. Um, motion carries. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michael, for everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> All righty. So here we are at our last item of the evening, and it's very important. So um, this is item number 16 in the agenda, and uh, this is to receive a report on the town's business recovery programs and consider, discuss the establishment and funding for a residential rental assistance program. Uh, Garrett, would you please give us a staff report? You're muted. <laughs> Coming out. I'm sorry. Okay. With regard to the business recovery program, we've issued uh, five temporary use permits. It says which businesses on the staff report. Temporary encroachment permits, the staff report indicated six. We're actually up to eight. There's some more in the pipeline that we're working on. In terms of the actually small business recovery grants, we've done 20, totaling 20,000. There's five more in the pipeline to be reviewed. We are no longer accepting applications. So the council may recall you committed 42,500 to the grant program. We received 7,500 from the county Marin and matching funds, received a little less than $2,200 in business donations and administrative costs have been about $2,000. Uh, Mayor Goddard and Councilmember Hellman have requested the council perhaps consider reallocating some funds from the business recovery grants to a rental assistance program for residents. The purpose of the program would help residents obviously in need whose household incomes have been affected by COVID-19. Could be modeled after a program that Corte Madera does or the county does. Corte Madera, they actually donated about, they contributed $50,000, but they also have the Corte Madera Foundation. Community Foundation, they donated $25,000 uh, for about 75, maybe it was more with donations. Uh, the staff report says 50 grants, but actually I talked to their staff, it was 23 grants that they actually issued prior to the deadline because they aren't accepting applications anymore. Um, and I'll touch on that more as I go through the policy deliberations. Uh, with regard to available funding, you have about 23,000 available from the grant program if you were to stop that. And what that what that includes is the 20 you've already done, five in the pipeline, I'm assuming that they're eligible. We excluded any donations because those were given probably specifically for the business relief program. We deducted administrative costs out of the town share. And we also checked with the county and they're fine. We met their matching requirements. So we've already spent their 7,500 in our match. So that's not an issue. So you have about 23,000 available if you wanted to move that you could always add more funding if you wished now some of the key policy decisions obviously it's just something you want to do first question and if you do what should be an initial funding twenty three thousand should be more um should we limit the program lower income groups now the county did have different nonprofits administer the program according to madera they sort of followed the same guidelines in essence what they said was you can earn up to 80% of household income that's considered low, uh, adjusted for household size. And so they just had a table. Um, all the programs did require documentation to demonstrate the need for assistance. So for Corte Madera, it'd be something like you would show your pay stubs, you would show your tax returns, and then you would have a letter from your employer. They either said they laid you off or they cut back your hours because of COVID-19. That's what they use for their documentation that you were in need of one month's assistance. Now, um, what's interesting is obviously the county used nonprofits. I don't know, maybe it was five of them. I forget exactly how many. Um, Corte Madera actually decided to do it themselves. The reason for that, they told me, 
was that the Corte Madera Community Foundation was worried if they gave the money to a nonprofit, that nonprofit couldn't promise that the funds can only be used for Corte Madera residents. Whether or not that was true or don't really know. I think staff just cut to chase and just said, okay, we could do it ourselves. And that's what they did. They uh, administered the program themselves. They had a deadline for the applications. Turns out that they were able to fund everyone's request except for one who was determined to be ineligible. And in terms of the amount of the rental assistance, Corner Madeira was thinking of a limit to start with and ultimately did not have a limit. What they did was they just based it on what was the need for that one month. So they also made it open to Section 8 tenants. And so if somebody with a Section 8 voucher, their share or their rent was more than the voucher of, say it was $700, they did a check directly to the landlord for $700 based on documentation. Um, if your rent was three or $4,000, I think they had one situation where they actually contributed $4,000 to offset that rent. But at the end of the day, they had enough money to fund, I believe, 23 and what's important to note within those 23, I believe, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I believe two or three of those people were actually homeowners with assistance for their mortgage based on uh, impacts of COVID-19. So those are some important policy considerations to consider. If we're going to move forward with such a program. And then the last part of this report is has to do with public spaces. Obviously, we're still working with the chamber on how to handle a mono lot and some of the other requests of the chamber. Um, we are working on those public spaces on Linus Road. We did receive a quick build grant from TAM, help do some of these improvements. Uh, and really, everything's a work in progress. Everything's changing. Um, we're just trying to do the best we can and try to go back and clean things up as we move through. But all the businesses pretty much now are all trying to move outside. They're building their platforms, whether they're telling that us that or not up front. That's a different issue. but. I think we're working through it all, but more importantly, I think on this is, do you want to create a residential uh, rental assistance program? And if it's so, what are the key policies for it and what do you want to fund it at? Great, thank you, Garrett. Uh, Barbara, questions for Garrett, please. I wanted to add some information that I have that may be helpful for the policy decisions, if you don't mind. Please. So, um, I've been communicating with the county and Marine Community Foundation on their program. And so a couple things about their program. The income qualifications are 30% area median income or lower, and they have to be at risk of homelessness due to income loss from COVID-19. And those are done on a first come, first serve basis. Now, you probably know that that money came from Marin Community Foundation as well as the county. And the community foundation also got a lot of extra donations. So I think it's over 2 million. They're, they used all the money and uh, they have a waiting list. So I did ask them how many people from Fairfax are on their waiting list. And the answer was 23. But the way their program works is that they don't make those decisions as to whether people meet those qualifications. Um, what they do is they work with what they call the CBOs, the nonprofits, and they, they make sure that people meet those qualifications. And then when they do, the nonprofits specifically pay um, pay the rent. So it isn't money that you give to the person. You're sure it's going for the rent. The other piece of it is I, um, I sit on a committee with a fellow from the Marin Community Foundation who is the liaison as far as how this money is being spent. And the Community Foundation meets with the, C they're called community benefit organizations or nonprofits. Mm -hmm. They meet with them a couple of times or once a week and they met yesterday and since Alan knew that I was asking these questions, he asked if any of those nonprofits would be willing to 
handle our program for us. So basically we would donate the money to those and two of them raised their hand, which is Ritter House and St. Vincent. And they did say they would be willing to do it for Fairfax. Now there is one caveat that I haven't gotten the answer to yet. And that is um, that there's a question as to whether or not by specifically targeting Fairfax, would you be in violation of fair housing laws? And when Alan and I talked about it, neither one of us are experts for sure, but we do sit on this assessment of fair housing committee. And he said, it's, it's not like Victory Village where you're opening new housing. So remember those questions that came up with Victory Village about you can't target. So this would be keeping people in their housing. So there's that piece. There's also another very unfortunate piece, which is some of you may have followed that President Trump suspended the affirmatively fair housing rule last week. So it's gone. In 2018, they tried to kind of slow roll it and turn it into a volunteer program, but now he has completely suspended the rule. And so that may not be an issue, but I, Alan suggested that I call Liz Darby, who is the social equity, racial equity program coordinator for the county that we both work with, and check with her on that piece. And I did call Liz this morning, and, I'm, and Liz has, has been a disaster service worker, so she was in Marin City uh, doing COVID testing. And she said she would call me as soon as she could, uh, I think probably tomorrow. But there is that one piece. So my thoughts are this. Um, as far as the policy, I like the idea of staying within the construct of the way the county is doing it, which is looking at uh, the 30% area me median income or lower and potential be on the verge of homelessness. We don't want anybody to be homeless out of this. And I also like the idea, if it's possible, to work with Ritter and St. Vincent's who do such wonderful things for the county and you know, can really work this through and make our work on it much less. But I just wanted to share that information for consideration um anyway thank you barbara what can you clarify what you see the role i i'm very familiar with ritter house and saint vincent but can you clarify what you see their role is here so what they do for the county's program the rental assistance program is they make sure that people meet the qualifications and then they actually pay the rent directly for that person so if they were to do it for us, we would, and the good news is there's already a list of 23 people that are waiting in Fairfax if we chose to go with their list. And they could, we could give them each half of the money and then they could check those people that are already on the waiting list and they could give the money directly to pay the rent. So they would do the same thing that they're doing for the rental assistance program that basically, I think they gave out, it was, it was more than 2 million. I think it was 2.5 million in about, well, it was, it was less than six weeks or two months. So Barbara, that helps? Barbara, yeah. question. Um, so I'm assuming then that if these Fairfax uh, folks are on the wait list for these organizations, then they, that the money's run out. Oh, it's no, the, it's been closed. The money's been run out a month ago. Okay, there's so no those more people are, they're just sitting there on a wait list. And there's no guarantee there'll be any more money. Okay. All right. Thank you for all that hard work. Really appreciate it. Does anyone else just want to have a question? Because I'd like to go to the public before we, um, before we go, go on. Any other questions? No. Okay. So um, let's uh, well, see. 
Oh, John. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm curious what the average need of various renters that you talked about. I mean, is this? I mean, I, I'm concerned. You know, if two million dollars is going in six weeks, granted that's the county. Um, we've got twenty three thousand and twenty three residents, and it's just oh. where we are right now. I mean, there aren't businesses. This was created as a business fund and and you know I, I mean basically we don't want anybody homeless here either but, so uh, what i asked alan at the community foundation this morning because we only talked this morning is i asked him i said if we were able to give out i mean give each twenty three thousand. so if we added to it um is there a cap because somebody at the county said something like three thousand and I assumed that was a cap. And he said, no, it, 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 there, there isn't a cap. But he said they've averaged more like 1,500 or less, 1,750. And I said, if, if we did, if this all worked out and if the count, I said, I'm only one council member. I'm just throwing things out there. I said, if we said give each 23,000, could they make that work? And I think also, if you consider maybe it's 1500 a piece, we usually can work out. And if some of those people are section eight people, it, it goes further for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's, let's let go out to public comment and then we'll bring it back. So um, Michelle, who's, who's, who's there? Uh, Richard Applebaum. Okay. And Chance after him. Okay. Hey, uh, Richard again. So um, I don't know what the original intention for this money was. If it was more for small business. Um, my guess is that that's not enough money to really make too much of a difference for several small businesses. And so if you're not considering a pivot to citizens in need, um, I don't, I couldn't quite be clear whether it was 23,000 or 46,000 or whatever, but it goes quickly. And I, I actually don't favor going through a St. Vincent's or uh, other organizations and just doing something local and maybe just coming up with a $500 stipend that could be, you know, very, you know, simple um, uh, qualification system um, just so happens inadvertently. I've helped about 35 people apply for EDD and try to navigate that labyrinth. And so I've been, become very intimately aware of a lot of people's personal situations. Uh, many of them are here in town. Uh, they're artists and yoginis and former retail workers and and people have had a terrible time. Not everybody's been able to get in there. The CARES Act stuff just ran out. And I could imagine that there's a hundred people that, you know, are struggling right now. Maybe that's your criteria. You know, they have some EDD situation that just ran out or isn't enough. And you just find a hundred people locally and give them five hundred dollars, and don't even have to call it pay their rent or whatever. If you don't, if you're not in a situation to cover somebody's rent for one, two, three months, maybe it's better to just give a little bit of help to a few more people, and um, and that are you know that just need it, and let it let them. They know what to do with the money. They know whether they need to pay their phone bill or get some food or partial rent or what they're working out. I mean, I, I helped a neighbor of mine negotiate with their landlord to lower their rent by 500 bucks. So, um, you know, I don't know what the total pool of money is, but if it's not the 2 million that the county had or some larger foundation was putting into play and we just have a modest amount, maybe there's a way to spread that out and actually touch a number enough people's lives. Maybe it's something we can just do here locally. So um, I would just uh, put some of that into suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, next speaker. Next is Chance. Hi, Council. Uh, first, I just wanted to give a huge kudos to Garrett and staff and Council, particularly, again, uh, Council Member Hellman, Mayor Goddard, on the work they're doing to create more space downtown. I know it's been in the works for months now, and there's been a lot of discussion around it, but I'm really excited about it. It does feel a lot safer. People are spreading out, and uh, the style is also aesthetically pleasing. Even though it's temporary, it's all ADA accessible. It's fantastic. Um, I also wanted to thank you all for... Um, 
continuing to work on the mono lot. It seems like that's already being uh, sort of taken over <laughs> on really busy days. So it's already happening, um, but it'll be good to have some more infrastructure out there, some benches or whatever you plan to put out there during certain periods. Uh, as far as the rental assistance program, um, you know, Earlier, we talked about youth and age-friendly services, and I can't think of a better way to support low-income families and our community members that are aging in place than making sure we, we help the folks that are most in need at this critical moment to make it through this pandemic and make it through this, this immediate moment with a little less stress. Uh, so I say we definitely go for it. Uh, I, I really like what Barbara brought up as far as there, the fact that there are systems in place that they're, they're already vetting services in place. I recognize that there's a lot on staff's plate already. So it's nice that there are institutions in the community that, that can help with facilitation and lighten the load on staff. It's also convenient that there are already presumably vetted uh, households that are already on some waiting list in need. So that's really helpful. Uh, but I do recognize what uh, Richard had also brought up as far as uh, making it more community oriented and, and not making it feel like it's sort of this parental, like, well, you know, you don't get to choose how you use the money. If you really need it for certain things, like we just want to, we're going to pay your bills for you or something. I understand the, the touchiness around that, but I, you know, the other flip side of it is how much time does staff have to go through applications and vet things. And then also as far as a council in a town, how do we want to keep track of, the either the impact that we're making with with these dollars in order to try to you know leverage more dollars in the future and make sure they're being used for specific things so uh, if if you did decide to move in a different direction with and it wasn't specifically rental assistance it's just i think could be a good idea for a small grant program but just yeah changing the name making sure that's very clear to the public on what exactly those that that program is going towards thank you Thank you, Chance. Uh, any more speakers? Uh, yes, Mallory. So, hi. Um, I really would like to know who sets up the order of these agendas every uh, every meeting. Who's in charge of that? Can somebody tell me? I've asked this before. Yeah. It's the it's the mayor and the town manager. Well. Madam Mayor and Town Manager, why do we have, it's now one, it started at one o'clock, little five after one, when we have people who I think are really in need and it's a very personal item. And when we've had personal items where people in the town, um, rather than the, the uh, adopt a resolution for something and something else, where we have people in the town who really need help or who really are passionate about an issue and we don't have to put it till the end of the meeting i mean i appreciate you guys work really hard and stay long but you also i would like you to appreciate that people can't stay up so late when they want to hear something that's really personal and that would help them and would help the town and i would like for you to start taking that more into account and put the personal items or the passionate items in front. The fire is important, but I think um, some of the more general things on this agenda could have waited till now. And when people I think who are in need, they're probably not gonna wanna stay up till one o'clock if some of them are even working. So I want you to just consider making the agenda more personal for the people in Fairfax. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mallory. Um, is that it, Michelle? That is it, Madam Mayor. Okay, so um, bringing it back, um, you know, this is a lot of different pieces for 1.15 in the morning. So um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna go down the, uh, the list of questions and we'll see if we can get anywhere. So uh, do we want to offer such a program? Raise your hands if you think we should pursue a program. 
I don't see everybody's hands or not. John, do you have something you want to say? They were up they went down. I think okay. we all raised them. All right. So we're interested in pursuing this. Yeah. Um, you know, mm. so in terms of the initial funding, right now we have $23,000 to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to figure out, you know, there's a lot of pieces around that. I, I, I'm personally feeling like this is a really important thing for us to figure out, and I think it's too late to do it. Personally. I agree. And I would just throw one thing out there. What about if we consider something for whenever we take this up next, which would be adding 23000 to it to make it 46000 I'm just throwing it out there, but we don't have to agree on it or discuss it. That sounds like a reasonable amount. The 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 thing that I think the is, the issue is, as Renee says, it's just late and it's working out the details. But I really appreciate Barbara the investigation that you did, and I think it makes a lot of sense to if it if it does work and if people agree that there's not a problem with it to utilize a resource like that that might be able to take care of the details for the reasons actually that that chance i believe said yeah that uh, staff it, it just doesn't make sense for staff to develop all of that locally when there's an opportunity to have somebody do it who already has it set up okay stephanie did you have something to keep it simple i would agree yeah, I appreciate the research and the um, concepts that uh, of using, you know, Ritter House and St. Vincent's. The only thing that occurred to me is, you know, there might be some shame involved if I weren't able to pay my rent and then suddenly... I'm having a third party pay my rent. It doesn't feel very good. So um, I'm a little sensitive to that experience. Um, and I understand why it's set up that way, but I just... I also like what Richard presented is we could keep it really simple, you know, in smaller increments and just recognize that a lot of people are suffering right now. Um, but I know that it's a lot on staff. So um, I just would prefer if we could settle something this evening because we're not going to meet for another month. And when I look at the statistics, it's getting worse. The economy is getting worse and so is the suffering. So I would really prefer that we can decide on something this evening. Um, that would be my preference. Um, I, oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, do we know that, I, I mean, there's a lot of money that the county has been coming up with this, and of course it's gone. Um, there's a lot of money that this has the potential of needing. And, you know, I, I think we would be foolish to think that we as a town could float it. So I, I just, you know, I mean, I think it's good to help and it's, it's, um, it's important to help and it's good, especially in our community. Um, I don't want to preclude you know, if if the county is going to pull another rabbit out of a hat and, you know, come up with some money, they have a lot deeper pockets than we do. Um, I don't want to preclude that happening. But, um, you know, I also very much support the approach that Barbara had um, of, of utilizing people who are used to doing with it. I mean, the people, in, in terms of the shame involved, I think that... The, the 23 people on the list have dealt with that issue and they've applied. Um, you know, I, I think if there were no, there, that shame involved, probably that list would be longer. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and the other thought that I had, is there no more need among businesses in Fairfax? Um, can I respond? Because basically we're taking money and shifting it from one program to another and leaving that, that program. Done. John? Yes. So if I can respond to that. So one, we have uh, extended the application period twice over the original and uh, we have not received any more. Um, okay. So that, that that's done in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. but um, if we want to move something right away, um, I see the only option being using the, the model that Barbara brought forth. Um, I love Richard's idea, but the amount of administration that would take to actually see, meet with, know the needs, oh, qualifications yeah. to hand out mini grants. I love the idea, but I just don't think we have it in, in, in us. But if we, we want might to still have staff go out and find other jobs and work overtime, and just give the money yeah. <laughs> might be cheaper. <laughs> I think one piece to remember is, um, you know, this rental assistance program that the county and MCF put together was huge. They are completely out of money. Now, will they at some point find some more money? Possibly, but, but they haven't done it and it's been closed for quite a while. I think the piece about being concerned that people may be ashamed um, is valid, but I would also say we want to make sure that that rent is paid. The idea that I have in my mind is preventing someone from being homeless. Yeah. There are people that do need money for other things, and if they got $1,500, they might spend it on those other things, which are totally valid, and then be out on the street, which brings with it you know, 20 years shorter lifespan, those kinds of things. So if this can work, and I, I need to, mm. you know, fine tune that last piece, making sure that there wouldn't be anything about violation of fair housing laws. And if Ritter Center and St. Vincent's would do that work and the 23 people on the waiting list, they would, they look at the qualifications and they pay the rent, and that hasn't been done yet because they're still on the waiting list. But if that's the case, then if we can prevent somebody from going homeless, to me, that's, that's, that's really important. So, you know, I need to fine tune that last piece. And if it can work out, that would be, in my mind, it would be a good thing. And if we make it 46,000 and potentially, those 23 people, not all of them are eligible, or even if they are, even if you just think it's 2,000 a piece, you know, that would that would cover that group. Can we just clarify, you keep referring to those 23 people, but we would open it up to our town though too, correct? It's not just we're targeting those, that list of the MCF people, right? Well, I'm sure we could, but they've already opened the list up. So that list has been open in the county for everyone in the entire county. So is there a need to open it up again? Absolutely. I don't know that our town is completely aware of that opportunity. I, I mean, I feel pretty strongly that we need to bring awareness to. But we're talking about, just, just real quickly, we're talking about people from Fairfax who are on that list, on that waiting list. Correct. Yeah, but that Correct. waiting that late that waiting list is how old now, right? Right. It's probably about a month old or three weeks old. Anyway, um, I I was just looking for a good way to do it with somebody with groups that really know how to work. Yeah. And so that's why I looked into it. I still need to talk to Liz Darby. And I think she'll call me tomorrow. Well, what if we were to do that research and figure out if this is possible 
And if so, if we agree right now that if it is possible, we go ahead and use the 23,000 that we have now toward that, and then we could address at, at the next meeting or whatever, adding any more to that. But it gets it started and it gets the, the, the part of it that takes the time is, is figuring that out. But Adding some yeah. money to it is is a is a decision that maybe we can make without it taking us too long. Right. So it's working. So obviously it's really late. Um, it sounds like there's interest in the program. You need some details, and if you don't want to wait till September second, it would be we come back at a, your special meeting on August nineteenth and come up with how we think this would work, assuming. If we could use a nonprofit to administer it, then you do have the issue of they have some people on the wait list. How would that work? Do they have to reapply? And ties? But 46,000 in my mind, and if you get more than 23, you're not going to have enough money, depending on how you're doing it, to, to mm -hmm. support everyone unless you just do a portion. It will run out. Yeah. But that being said, what would be helpful is if it sounds like you'd like to do some kind of program. That seems pretty clear. Uh, the amounts, not so clear, but if you just said 46, we could at least come back with that. We can talk to the nonprofits, then we could see how it can work. If you're saying we'd like those 23 people on the waiting list for Fairfax people to um, have to reapply, then we have an issue we all bring it up to everybody, and most likely you'll have to do a lottery, but those are things we can come back with to um, to, to figure to figure out if you want to do something sooner rather than later, and it sounds like you I like do. the idea of the 46,000, just double what we have, and then if, if we need to, which we probably will have to further discuss it to a certain extent, let's deal with it on the 19th after we deal with the financing authority. Okay, and can I, can I uh, just uh, clarify, Garrett, that the, the 23 already has the 5,000, uh, you've already included the 5,000 that's in the pipe. Yes. Of and the that small business. That. Right, okay. 23, would, would, would you would have roughly net available to transfer over. Okay, so shall we shall we proceed that way? That Barbara, you'll do the continue doing the homework, and well, no. on, and on the nineteenth we'll bring it back. Stephanie, I know you won't be here. I think she was going to try to call in. Oh, that's why she was asking about the time, right, Stephanie? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I think that's a that's a good way to do it. Do you okay, need so no action now except to just say continue? Can we, can we agree to double the 23,000 and make it 46,000, please? I would support that. that. Okay. And then, um, you know, it's possible I'll get something back that there's a violation of fair housing laws, but hopefully I won't. And um, we can finish this up on the 19th. Can I ask a clarifying question? What's the what's the question of the fair housing law that you're trying to clarify? So what happens with fair housing laws, so what happened with Victory Village, for example, there were people that wanted to only allow people from Fairfax to live there. Right. And what that does, so to affirmatively further fair housing, you, you're not allowed to do that. You have to reach out to all other areas to get people of different diversity, people <clears throat> of color, etc. But the difference here is that we're not opening new housing. We're allowing people to stay in their houses. So that probably will not be an issue that we need to find out. And the other piece of it is because President Trump just suspended the federal law for affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is a terrible thing for civil rights, etc. 
but it may also mean that it's kind of a non-issue right now. Got it. Uh, that will be challenged, I'm sure, by many ACLU and others. Right. So right now, so let me see what I can find out, and if it if it works, great. Did that help? Yes, thank you. All right. So, um, do we need to we need we need to have some kind of a motion made around doubling that no, money? Just, no, direction. I'll just come back to you on the nineteenth. I I have direction. You could always change your mind on the 19th, but I think it's fine. You don't, I don't think you need any motions. I have enough direction on what needs to be done. And it sounds like uh, council member Kohler's. Do yeah, something. That's, that's what it sounds something. Like. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you the very action much. will actually be taken on the 19th. Yes. Correct. And Garrett, if I, if I find out we're at a, uh, an obstacle point on that issue, I will get back to you much sooner so we can look at, um, if you need to provide other options or if there's some legal analysis we can do. But I'll get back to you as soon as I know. Okay. All right. Well, thank so you. So we've, um, we've come to the adjournment and I do um, I <coughs> to adjourn in memory of, um, of Joseph Odom, who is a very beloved community member, many people's yeah. friends, a brilliant acupuncturist, who uh, volunteered for absolutely everything, and um, and he, he he is dearly missed. So our 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 hearts, our love goes out to his family, and um, he is missed. And I'd also like to adjourn in memory of Huey Johnson, um, who passed away on uh, in July, July twelfth, I believe, and uh, Huey was the founder of the Trust for Public Land, the Grand Canyon Trust. Um, he protected the Marin Headlands from Marincello and, uh, you know, as the Marin Headlands um, eventually became the GGNRA. Um, and he is a great, a great um, hero of, of many um, and all. In fact, he protected more land than John Muir, or, oh darn, I was reading about him. I can't remember, but he protected a lot of land and a lot of the precious land here in Marin County. I know Chance is on the call. He was, he was a mentor of Chance's. And uh, um, anyway, he will be, he will be dearly uh, remembered and honored throughout time. So um, with that, our meeting is over. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> And uh, and we'll see you on the twelfth. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.